Sonic Adventure was Sonic's first 3D game, released in 1998 for the Sega Dreamcast. It was later re-released on the GameCube in 2003 as Sonic Adventure DX, the version that most people played, and apparently that's a good enough excuse for reviewers to judge it by 2003 standards instead of 1998 standards. We've all heard it at this point, Sonic had a rough transition into 3D. This sentence is vague enough to where if you say it's wrong, people can point out Sonic 3D Blast in Extreme and claim that it's actually right. I personally don't think it's hard to tell that this famous sentence is clearly talking about Sonic Adventure, but I guess some people have an insatiable need to play devil's advocate. I, on the other hand, firmly believe that Sonic Adventure was the best transition to 3D we could have ever reasonably hoped for, and we'll get into that, rest assured. In this review, I'll analyze the story, presentation, and gameplay, and discuss other significant subjects related to this game. So, without further ado, here's my review of Sonic Adventure. Being the series jump to 3D on the Dreamcast, Sonic Adventure was able to realize a lot more of Sonic Team's ambitions than the previous games on the Genesis. One of these ambitions was a grand, high-stakes story told from multiple characters' perspectives. The underlying plot is straightforward. Eggman has awakened an ancient monster called Chaos, which is made of water and can shapeshift every time it's fed a Chaos Emerald. Therefore, Eggman wants to gather the Chaos Emeralds to transform Chaos into its ultimate form and destroy the city of Station Square and build his dream city on its ruins. Sonic and friends set out to stop him. What sets this game apart from other games at the time is that it has multiple playable characters who all have their own perspective of the story. This is great for many reasons, some of which I'll have to save for later, but what I will say right now is that I love how this not only fleshes out the plot itself, but also allows for all of these characters to get a lot of focus and development. Tails, who was previously not much more than a player too, now has his own arc about overcoming his dependency on Sonic and saving Station Square all by himself. Gamma has a moving story about rejecting Eggman's orders and sacrificing himself to save the innocent that was being forced to power him. Sonic Adventure is full of character study, and it's a really underrated aspect of this game. That said, when a game has a story, there must be cutscenes, and Sonic Adventure has no shortage of them. These unfortunately have not aged very well, and have become one of the biggest laughing stocks of the Sonic series. If you ask me though, I think this is unfair. First of all, it's important to remember that this game came out in 1998, so it should be compared to the standards of the time. And from this perspective, Sonic Adventure's cutscenes are actually pretty revolutionary for a platformer. Facial animation was not a common thing back then, as most games just painted a static texture on the characters' faces and called it a day. With this in mind, for all of his shortcomings, Sonic Adventure did an alright job at facial animation for the time. People like to meme on all of these exaggerated expressions, but I feel like that was kind of the point? Like, yeah, it's a high-stakes story, but this is still a game about cartoon animals fighting a man shaped like an egg, so I can see why they went with these expressive, exaggerated facial animations, even if they got a bit unhinged at times. Another strange argument I hear against these cutscenes is the voice acting, which I also feel is ignoring the era that this game released in. First of all, the voice acting isn't even that bad for a majority of the game. Ryan Drummond remains iconic to this day as a great voice for Sonic, and Dean Bristow did a good intimidating voice for Eggman. The majority of playable characters have good voice acting, and while I think Takal's delivery is a bit monotone, it's still not below par for the time. If you want an idea of how good Sonic Adventure's voice acting was for the time, just look at Resident Evil. Are you really going to tell me that this? Stop it! Don't open that door! What is it? Is better than this? I'll find that Eggman and put him out of commission! In general, the presentation in this game is quite good, taking advantage of the powerful Dreamcast hardware. We've got dynamic lighting, high-resolution textures, and some stellar in-game character animation. The soundtrack is also excellent, featuring a large variety of genres and even vocal tracks for every playable character. If I could critique one thing about Sonic Adventure's presentation, it would definitely be the sound mixing. A grand majority of sound effects used are excellently designed and placed, but that doesn't really matter if I can't hear them. When I home in on an enemy and it explodes, I don't really get proper feedback because the explosion sound is so quiet that it removes the impact it would have otherwise had. This is also the one criticism of the cutscenes I can absolutely understand. Why is the music so loud? If it weren't for the subtitles, the story would be basically impossible to follow. And now for the main event, 
gameplay. There's a lot to unpack here, but before I get into the individual characters and their gameplay styles, I want to go over some general design that carries over to every campaign. Regardless of which character you're playing, you'll always be in one of four types of areas. Adventure fields, action stages, sub-games, and chow gardens. I will not be talking about the chow gardens in this video because, quite frankly, I am sick of people drooling over the virtual pet minigame and ignoring the value of the actual game itself. Okay? Okay. Adventure fields are this game's hub worlds, and what's cool about these is that they're all connected in one way or another. Station Square is connected to Mystic Ruins by a railroad bridge, and later on in the game the egg carrier crashes and you can reach it via boat from Station Square. The coolest connection, however, is easily the fact that Angel Island is actually part of the Mystic Ruins. This automatically makes Sonic Adventure's hub worlds an expanded, fleshed out version of the area seen in Sonic 3 and Knuckles, a connection that's even more obvious when you see some of the stage names. As for the actual gameplay of these adventure fields, I do unfortunately feel it's a bit lacking. The most you'll be doing here is looking for upgrades and action stages, and maybe hunting for the optional emblems if you're the completionist type. There's not much required exploration, so it unfortunately boils down to just grabbing the thing you need and then walking to the next stage entrance. Despite this, I still really like the adventure fields, the main reason being the surprisingly abundant NPCs. All of these people not only have unique dialogue, but that dialogue will change as you progress through the story. People will react and have feelings and opinions about what's happening around them, and even have their own side stories that you can keep up with if you so choose. This is the kind of depth that I just don't see anymore in Sonic games, and it's crazy that they were able to do this with such limited hardware and time. As much as they don't serve the gameplay, I think the Adventure Fields were a harmless addition that brought some extra world building to the table, and that's why they hold value in my opinion. In these Adventure Fields, you'll find adventure stages and sub-games. These are the meat of every character's campaign. Action stages are the main levels that utilize the core gameplay of whichever character you're playing as, and sub-games are diversions from the core gameplay that range in quality. We'll get to that in due time. Anyway, it's just about time to get into the characters' campaigns. For these gameplay styles, I'm going to refer to my checklist of what an ideal Sonic gameplay style should look like. These are the three things I'm looking for. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These includes rings, strings, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, the character's central attributes should be important. This is the most paramount of these requirements, and one that I see neglected by most reviewers. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Now with all of this in mind, let's finally get into the character stories. I'm just going to say this right out of the gate, Sonic Adventure is the best translation of Sonic's gameplay to 3D that we have ever had. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the best he's ever controlled in 3D, but it does mean that Sonic Team were very faithful to his roots, and I think that was the best course of action they could have possibly taken. Let's hold Adventure's Sonic to our three-point checklist. Right off the bat, in Sonic's first action stage, Emerald Coast, all the staples of the classic games are here and accounted for. Rings, springs, robotic enemies, item boxes, power-ups, and pretty much everything else you can think of are all present. Notably, there's no special stages, but with this game's story, I don't think those would work too well anyway. Next, let's talk replayability. The majority of Sonic's levels are built perfectly for this, taking a page from the classic games by occasionally splitting the stage into different paths, with the more difficult path being the faster one. We can easily see this in stages like Emerald Coast, Speed Highway, and Red Mountain. There are a couple levels that I don't think do this quite as well, those being Casinopolis and Final Egg. Casinopolis is pretty much just a mini-game collection, but you can enter a more sonic -y area by losing at Pinball. Final Egg is a straight shot to the goal, with any branching paths only leading to item boxes. However, those are only two levels out of ten, and even those are still fun despite not being quite as replayable. Now for our third requirement. Is Sonic's central attribute, rolling into a ball, important to the gameplay? Thankfully, this is a resounding yes. Sonic Adventure employs a physics system that harkens back to the Genesis games, where Sonic is able to run up walls or ceilings if he has enough momentum. It's not just a simple momentum system like Super Mario 64 or the modern Sonic games, this is a full-on recreation of how Sonic controlled in 2D, but brought into the third dimension. New to this game is the homing attack, which might just be the most genius thing Sonic Team has ever come up with. In the classic games, you often had to jump on enemies to defeat them, which made perfect sense. However, landing jumps on moving objects in 3D is significantly harder, so Sonic Adventure now allows you to press the jump button in the air, which will make Sonic lock onto and dash towards nearby objects in ball form. Chaining this attack is one of the most satisfying things about 3D Sonic, and one of the few staples that has remained in every game ever since Adventure. Returning from the previous games is the Spin Dash, a move that when held down will launch Sonic forward in ball form, allowing him to roll down slopes and damage any enemies.
enemies in his way. My only issue with the spin dash in Sonic Adventure is the fact that you can use it while moving. As fun as it is to spam it to gain speed, I wish tapping the button while in motion would instead put Sonic into a normal rolling state like how the classic games did. Even with that said though, this is still a great transition into 3D for Sonic, and the best that I think anyone could have reasonably hoped for back then. As I mentioned before though, action stages aren't the only levels in Sonic Adventure. We also have sub-games, and in Sonic's case these are on-rail shooting levels where you pilot the tornado. I don't hate these levels, and I definitely think it's good to break up the pace every so often, especially since this game doesn't have special stages. However, I just find these levels kind of boring. There's not a lot to them, all you do is move the plane around sometimes and spam the shoot button. I just think they could have done a better job with these, that's all. Story-wise, Sonic's campaign is pretty straightforward, having him chase down Eggman with Tails by his side, and defeating him at the end of it. Sonic doesn't undergo any kind of development like the other characters, but honestly I think that's for the best. Sonic is a static protagonist that's more focused on lifting others up, a light in the darkness that motivates change in others, and I think that's a strength of his characterization in these early 3D games. Overall, Sonic's campaign is a perfect example of how to make a Sonic gameplay style in 3D, and its straightforward story makes it a simple and fun time. Why did they give the roll button to Tails has a similar base moveset to Sonic, but his game-changing gimmick is of course his ability to use his butt copter to fly. Tails once again follows the three rules for a good Sonic gameplay style, with the iconic set dressings here and full force, replayable levels galore, and his Tails being utilized as a core mechanic. A majority of his levels are altered segments of Sonic stages, adding big rings to fly through to take shortcuts and beat Sonic to the goal. Since these stages follow the same design philosophy as Sonic's, it stands to reason that they're of the same quality. Good simple fun, with the added bonus of being able to fly. My biggest gripe with Tails' campaign is the fact that it reuses both of the Sky Chase levels from Sonic's story. Since I played the campaigns back to back for this video, I was pretty tired of sitting through basically the same boring shoot 'em up stage four times. It wasn't fun the first time, and since there's virtually no skill ceiling whatsoever in these, it sure as heck wasn't fun the fourth time. Since this game's whole shtick is different perspectives on the same story, I think they should have just had the first Sky Chase level be in Sonic's story and the second one be in Tails' story, just putting cutscenes to bridge the events together and you're all set. Modders, you can take this one for free. In fact, please do. Thankfully, Tails does get his own sub-game, that being Sand Hill, which has him snowboarding down a, well, a sand hill. It's a pretty short level, but it's good fun, and makes me wish we got more snow- snow- snowboard <laughs> and makes me wish we got more snowboarding sections in this game. Anyway, Tails' side of the plot follows Sonic pretty closely for the first half, but towards the second half the two get separated and Tails has to man up and face Eggman by himself. It's a short but sweet character arc that would carry over into Sonic Adventure 2, and it's really cool to look back on. Definitely one of my favorite stories in this game. Sorry to get tangential, but I've always found Knuckles to be kind of a strange character design case. He's an echidna, but nothing about that ever really translated to his abilities in the games. He can glide and climb, neither of which an echidna can do, so... I don't know, I guess his knuckle claws kind of reflect the claws that Kenna's have? Not really sure, maybe his species was a just-because situation. Whatever the case, let's get back to Sonic Adventure. Much like Sonic and Tails, Knuckles' moveset is pretty faithful to his Genesis counterpart, but how well do his levels stack up against the three-point test? It's probably redundant to mention the first Criterion at this point, so this will be the last time I mention it for now. Yes, Knuckles collects rings, bounces off springs, and pops open bandits like the rest of them. Everything you'd expect in a Sonic game is here. Knuckles' stages are sent around exploration, using your radar to find pieces of the Master Emerald that scattered around the world after Chaos destroyed it. These levels are pretty fun. They're more open-ended stages that utilize Knuckles' abilities such as gliding and climbing, checking off the third point of our criteria. I can't say the same for the second point, though. In Sonic and Tails' levels, the optional missions were simple tasks like holding onto 50 rings by the end of the stage or beating the level under a specific time threshold, which I think were good ways to encourage mastering them. On the other hand, Knuckles' stages have missions like beating the level without using any hints, which is just plain annoying since the hints aren't removed from the stage so you're likely to accidentally run into one and have to restart. It's not fun to replay at all in my opinion. Knuckles' moveset is similar to how it was in Sonic 3 and Knuckles, but now with the ability to punch when the roll button is pressed. This gives Knuckles a more melee focused combat system as opposed to Sonic's homing attack, which I think makes sense for the character. But yes, unfortunately Knuckles does not ace the Sonic gameplay test, but hey, he still gets a passing grade. His abilities are utilized well and his levels, while not as replayable as some others, are still perfectly enjoyable. As for the story, this is where the game diverges from Sonic's path quite a bit. Instead, Knuckles sees a lot more of Eggman, giving us more insight into what he's planning. This story also by far has the most exposition and lore about Chaos and his relation to the Akenda tribe, which allows us to connect with Knuckles even more. To sum it up, while not as strongly connected to Sonic's roots as the previous two campaigns, Knuckles still has a lot going for him in this game. 
Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles all had previous games to base their gameplay, but Amy Rose on the other hand had her playable debut in this game, so Sonic Team had to come up with something new. In Amy's levels, you're supposed to beat the stage before the big evil robot can catch you. Despite seeming like a fast-paced concept, these are some of the more slow-paced levels in this game due to a few factors. First of all, Amy's movement speed is significantly slower than any of the previous characters, with her absolute maximum speed being her running hammer attack, which to its credit is pretty fun to pull off. The second factor is that these stages are more puzzle-oriented than the others, giving them a much more casual pace. I don't particularly mind this, but I do find it strange considering that this robot is on your abs for the whole level. You'd think this would bring an element of challenge, but I can't recall a single time I've ever actually been caught by this thing. If it ever gets too close, you can hit it with Amy's hammer and stun it, so there's no real difficulty here. When it comes to the test, I unfortunately can't give this gameplay style a pass. It does satisfy Qualification 3, since Amy's central design trait in this game is her hammer, but replaying these levels really isn't very fun at all. Even playing them normally, I just want them to end. They employ too many slow, repetitive mechanics like turning these cranks over and over, or picking up these switches and putting them in these holes. They're not awful levels, but they definitely feel padded out at times. I should also mention Amy's sub-game, Hedgehog Hammer. There's not much for me to discuss as far as gameplay goes, it's literally just whack-a-mole, but I just find the context of which it's placed to be amusing. You're in Eggman's base, he literally catches you, but then he lets you in anyway if you beat his high score at whack-a-mole, it's freaking hilarious. What? I can't believe this is happening! Amy fares a bit better story-wise. She finds this Flicky, decides to help it find its family, and eventually ends up crossing paths with Gamma, bringing closure to both of their stories. It's a short but sweet campaign. Oh no, not you. I am not exaggerating when I say that Big the Cat's campaign is one of the worst things I've ever had to endure in a video game. In this story, Big's pet frog, Froggy, eats a Chaos Emerald and goes crazy for some reason, and Big has to chase after him and get him back. And how do we get him back? It's simple, really. We just have to fish for him with the most unintuitive controls ever conceived by mankind. Not only are the controls for this thing cumbersome as all heck, they're not even properly explained. I had to look up a guide just to get an idea of how you're supposed to catch Froggy, and I honestly still am not sure what I did to make it work, because all of these levels just felt like trial and error. I think I'm doing it right, but then Froggy just escapes for seemingly no reason, so I have to start over from square one. Apparently, this part of the the game was going to use the fishing rod controller from Sega Bass Fishing, but for whatever reason they cut that functionality and had to adapt the controls to the standard gamepad instead. That at least gives a little context as to why this control scheme is so ambiguous, but it certainly doesn't excuse it from being one of the most egregious things I've ever played. It won't surprise anyone then that Big's campaign performs the worst on my Sonic gameplay test. There is nothing about these stages that makes me want to revisit them, and while classic staples like rings are present, they hardly serve anything to the gameplay. The best thing I can say about Big is that his mechanics are designed around his defining character traits, but I hardly care about that when they suck so much. Big the Cat is a massive blemish on an otherwise good game, and one of the few things I have no problem agreeing with review outlets on. After enduring Big's fishing adventure, Gamma's campaign was such a breath of fresh air. Like in most of the other playstyles, his primary goal is getting to the end of the stage, but what sets Gamma apart is the fact that he can shoot, and it's a surprisingly well-implemented mechanic in this game. Holding the attack button will start targeting shootable objects, and releasing it will release a volley of bullets that hit them all at once. It's a satisfying mechanic that's made even better by the pacing of these levels. While a bit on the short side, the pace is a good balance between Sonic's high-speed stages and Amy's casual ones. Gamma's normal walking speed is slow, but walk for long enough and he'll change to a hover mode that feels good to control. It reminds me a bit of how sprinting feels in the old Doom games. This gameplay passes the test with flying colors. The optional objectives are more akin to Sonic and Tails' missions, making them satisfying to replay and master, and Gamma's robotic design is utilized flawlessly by his unique moveset that sets him apart from the rest of the cast. And we can't forget the story here, which is one of my favorites in this whole game. Gamma starts out as a drone created by Eggman that obeys his every command. However, he begins to have a change of heart when he sees how Amy cares for the lost Flicky, and this culminates into one of the most emotionally driven endings in the whole series. 
Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. After beating all of the other stories in the game, you unlock the Supersonic Campaign. Chaos has reached his final form, using up all of the negative energy of the Emeralds. All hope seems lost, but Sonic is able to use the remaining positive energy to become Supersonic and save what remains of Station Square from perfect chaos. This boss fight makes such a good lasting impression. It's one of those final bosses that isn't hard, but it delivers such an awesome spectacle that it'd be dampened if you had to die and retry try it over and over, so it's absolutely warranted. Everything from the cinematic camera angles to Supersonic's blazing speeds to this game's main theme open your heart playing in the background make Perfect Chaos one of the most iconic boss fights in all of Sonic history. At the end of the fight, Sonic knocks some sense into Chaos and he returns to the afterlife with Takal. Eggman narrowly escapes with Sonic right on his tail, and the credits roll. You know, for the seventh unskippable time. To say Sonic Adventure is a perfect masterpiece would be a flat-out lie. There's plenty of minor sound mixing issues, not all of the playstyles perfectly match what should be expected out of a Sonic game, and Big the Cat's campaign is an outright dumpster fire. But to say these things ruin Sonic Adventure and make it a bad game would be an even bigger lie. There is so much good here that I feel like the modern games refuse to learn from. Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles transitioned excellently to 3D, retaining the momentum-based gameplay while introducing new mechanics that naturally fit into a 3D space. And while the cutscenes may seem dated by today's standards, just the fact that they tried shows the commitment that Sonic Team had to their ambition. Sonic Adventure is many things, but above all, I firmly believe that despite its flaws, it is still, overall, an excellent transition into 3D. Subject A. Good Hedgehog. Subject B. Evil Hedgehog. Introducing Shadow from Sonic Adventure 2. Now you can choose to be Sonic, the good hedgehog, and try to save the world. Or Shadow, the evil hedgehog, and conquer it. What kind of hedgehog are you? <laughs> Rated E for everyone, only on Dreamcast. Sonic Adventure 2 is the sequel to Sonic Adventure, released in 2001 on the Sega Dreamcast to critical acclaim. Nowadays though, the consensus seems to be constantly shifting. I've heard countless people say that this game is not a worthy successor to Sonic Adventure, and that this is where the Sonic series start to falter. Having replayed all of the main stories with an open mind for this review, I don't quite agree with this ever-growing hatred for Sonic Adventure 2. In fact, I think this is the best Sonic has ever been in 3D, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. As always, in this review, I'll analyze the story, presentation, presentation, and gameplay, and discuss other significant subjects related to this game. So, without further ado, this is my review of Sonic Adventure 2. Like the first game, Sonic Adventure 2 offers different perspectives on the same story in the form of multiple single-player campaigns. However, what sets this game apart is how it presents these stories. In Sonic Adventure, there were six playable characters who all had their own playstyles and campaigns, and while the sequel does still have six playable characters, it's narrowed down the amount of playstyles to just three. These have two characters each, one for the hero side and one for the dark side. Thus, you'll be experiencing all of the gameplay styles the game has to offer regardless of which story you choose. In the hero story, you'll be playing as Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, all returning from Sonic Adventure, while the Dark story features newcomers Shadow and Rouge, as well as allowing you to play as the series antagonist, Dr. Eggman, for the very first time. We'll talk about these different playstyles in due time, but first let's go over the story. Sonic is running away from the military because they believe that he's stolen a Chaos Emerald from the bank. In reality, this was the work of Shadow the Hedgehog, an old government experiment that Eggman has awakened to do his bidding. His goal this time around is to hold the entire planet hostage by threatening to blow it up with the Eclipse Cannon another government experiment that was designed to be able to destroy entire planets. Sonic and friends set out to stop him once again. This plot is definitely a lot more ambitious and complicated than the previous game, but thankfully for the most part I think it's executed well. Much like Sonic Adventure, the sequel does a good job exploring the new characters and their motivations. There's a reason Shadow is such a fan favorite. He starts off being motivated by revenge, has a change of heart later on, and has a well-earned conclusion to his character arc at the end of the game. Now this alone wouldn't be all that groundbreaking for the series, but what sets Shadow apart from characters like Knuckles and Gamma is that his character development is much more gradual. You see him try to piece together his fragmented memories of his childhood friend Maria, who was killed, yes they killed a child in this game, right before Shadow was put into stasis. He's a very well developed character, and I think this is something that the game would have only been able to accomplish effectively through cutscenes and spoken dialogue. Without this, he could have very easily just been Knuckles all over again again. Rouge can easily be viewed as shallow when compared to Shadow, but despite Sonic Team clearly having certain 
priorities, Rouge is still decently characterized in this game. At first, she's suggested to be nothing more than a jewel thief archetype, but is later revealed to be a government spy researching Project Shadow. She gets a lot of good dialogue exchanges, especially with Eggman, Shadow, and of course Knuckles. As for the returning characters, any development they had in Sonic Adventure was carried over into this game. Tails is much more brave and ready at any moment to take action when Sonic needs him, and Knuckles has learned to be more wary about being tricked. Dr. Eggman as well as Sonic himself continue to be their static selves from the classics, and it works just as well here as it ever has. Eggman hits the perfect balance between Goofy and Sinister, and Sonic evens out his brash attitude with his compassion for others. When it comes to the plot itself, I must admit it does get a little convoluted toward the end, and I'm aware that this may alienate some players. Even with that said though, if you're able to keep up with the average Avengers movie, you shouldn't have much trouble here. Even if some of the details go over your head, the game still keeps its priorities straight and always places emphasis on context that is most important to the gameplay. The cutscenes are massively improved from Sonic Adventure, with better facial animation, more dynamic shock composition, faster pacing, and much better sound mixing. With that said, I do have my nitpicks. Firstly, these cutscenes seem to use motion capture for some reason. I'm not trying to completely write off mocap as a method of animation or anything, but I really don't think it suits these cartoonishly proportioned characters whatsoever. Sonic and company often look like they're in mascot costumes, and it's definitely something that takes some getting used to. This really makes their cutscenes more of a product of their time than anything, so I don't fully blame Sonic Team, but rather the animation industry for pushing mocap so hard in areas it really didn't belong. My other nitpick is that the quality seems to decline in the final story. Characters interrupt each other, there's weird awkward pauses, and the translation is just off sometimes. Many of these problems would be exacerbated in the GameCube port, but we'll talk about that in the Modern SD episode. Stay tuned. Generally, Sonic Adventure 2 is a very good looking game by 2001 standards, with unusually high resolution textures for the time, as well as character models that more accurately represent Yuji Uekawa's promotional artwork. The sound design is also much improved from its predecessor. The sound that enemies make when they explode is super satisfying now. Like the cutscenes though, I do still think there was room for improvement here. Some levels try to have ambient sounds, such as dripping water in aquatic mine, and jets flying by in Mission Street. While a cool idea, these sounds are way too loud, and don't seem to have any randomized pitch, so they just sound weird. Also, I'm not sure I like the lighting as much in this game. The environments are lively and well designed, but the characters are a lot less shiny than in their Adventure 1 counterparts. I suppose this comes down to taste, and you could even argue that this makes them look closer to their flat shaded 2D artwork, but personally I think I slightly prefer the more high contrast lighting from the first game. Despite all of these criticisms though, Sonic Adventure 2 still easily trounces its predecessor in terms of presentation. It's animated better for the most part, improves the sound design, and once again boasts a varied soundtrack that manages a good balance of vocal and instrument mental songs. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to talk about gameplay. Sonic Adventure 2 makes quite a lot of changes from the first game. The most striking one when first starting the game will probably be its lack of any adventure fields, the hub worlds that had a constant presence in Sonic Adventure. These are completely gone, and they will be sorely missed. This was part of Sonic Team's goal to make the sequel more of a streamlined, action-packed experience. Aside from the game booting you into the Chow Garden if you collect a Chow Key, most of your time spent in Sonic Adventure 2 will be playing action stage after action stage, with only cutscenes and boss to fill in the gaps. What prevents this from making the game repetitive and boring is the new way it structures its campaigns. As I alluded to earlier, Sonic Adventure 2 has you playing as different characters throughout each story, as opposed to the first game's approach which gave you the option of going through each character's campaign one at a time. Detractors of this game seem to believe that this makes the pacing worse than the first game, which I wholeheartedly disagree with. Instead of having you play as Sonic for several hours and then throwing a few less developed campaigns at you, Sonic Adventure 2 is always switching the gameplay styles around to keep you invested. My one big nitpick with this new system is that the pacing could have been a little better. Instead of playing as Sonic for one stage, Tails for the next, then Knuckles, then Sonic again, the game will sometimes make you play more than one stage in a row as a particular character before moving on to the next one. This is particularly annoying with Knuckles and Rouge's levels, but more on that later. Sonic Adventure 2 also brings back the upgrade system from the first game, and it works fairly well in a normal any percent playthrough. However, it falls apart pretty quickly if you try to partake in the game's mission system due to these upgrades being hidden in random levels without giving you
giving you any hints as to where they are. The system worked fine in Adventure 1 because these Metroidvania-esque mechanics are fit for a large interconnected hub world, but the second game is comprised entirely of linear action stages, making backtracking for the upgrades much more tedious. With all of that out of the way, it's time to talk about the individual character playstyles. For these, I will once again be employing my three staples of Sonic excellence. Let's quickly recap what I'm looking for in an ideal Sonic gameplay style. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic playstyle should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, 3. The character's central attributes should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. With these in mind, let's get into it. Sonic and Shadow's gameplay is very similar to Sonic from Adventure 1, albeit with some changes and improvements. As expected then, these fill the three requirements perfectly. Essential Sonic staples are present, the levels are replayable as ever with a satisfying moveset to master, and Sonic's ability to roll into a ball is properly utilized for the most part. Tragically, although Sonic Adventure 2 does add the roll to Sonic's moveset, it works nothing like how it does in the classic games. All of your momentum is halted when you use this move, and it's only used to roll under specific crevices. Thankfully, Hopefully the spin dash is still here, but I still would have liked to be able to put Sonic and Shadow into a ball state while running. Despite this, Sonic and Shadow still feel much better to play than in the first Sonic Adventure, and this is the result of a myriad of small tweaks and changes that add up to a more polished experience. The lightspeed dash, a move from the first game that would zip Sonic across trails of rings, returns in Sonic Adventure 2, but this time you can simply press the button without having to charge it up. There's also new upgrades, such as the bounce bracelet, which functions similarly to the butt bounce from Pac-Man World, pressing the action button dribbles Sonic like a basketball, helping you gain height to clear larger gaps or drop onto rails faster and more reliably. Now, all of these changes are fantastic, and I want to make it crystal clear that this is indeed the best 3D Sonic we've ever had in my opinion. With that said, I do still think there was room for improvement here. All of your special moves are mapped to the same button, meaning you might accidentally do the wrong move when trying to do the lightspeed dash. I had this issue constantly in Sonic's levels, though weirdly it didn't seem to happen nearly as often in Shadow stages? Speaking of Shadow, while I think he controls just as well as Sonic, I do wish he also had the bounce bracelet. It would have added so much more depth to his levels, especially ones like Radical Highway or Sky Rail that have a lot of rails to grind on. That's the big new thing in this game, rail grinding. Sonic played some Tony Hawk, thought it was cool, and decided to copy his moves. Surprisingly, this is one of the most satisfying mechanics to master in Sonic Adventure 2. It doesn't work like the modern Sonic games where you're constantly moving along the rail and only have to worry about switching lanes. Instead, you have to balance to keep Sonic or Shadow from falling off, and crouch on downward slopes to increase your momentum. Despite seeming like such a foreign concept to the Sonic series up to this point, rail grinding in Sonic Adventure 2 feels like a natural extension of the Sonic gameplay style, and I think this is due to its focus on maintaining momentum. It feels spiritually tied to the classic games, which also use momentum in a similar fashion. Rail grinding just puts a different spin on the exact same design philosophy, and that's really quite genius when you think about it. In general, I think the Sonic and Shadow levels feel like the logical next step for Sonic's gameplay. I've heard people argue that Sonic Adventure 2's stages are more linear, but I really don't think these detractors understand the actual meaning of the word linear. The more linear a level in a video game is, the less options you have to traverse through said level, forcing you into a straight line. Sonic Adventure 2 is not more linear than Sonic Adventure. It has just as many, if not more, branching paths and alternate routes through every stage. Of course, it's impossible to deny that this game's levels are more narrow and less spacious than its predecessor stages, but that doesn't mean that they're more linear, it just means that there's less empty space. Adventure 2 stages are more streamlined versions of what we got in the first game, nothing more. Overall, Sonic and Shadow's levels are a great example of how to expand and improve upon a Sonic gameplay style, while still retaining what made it great in the first place. Gamma and Sonic Adventure was an interesting idea backed up by a genuinely good story, and Sonic Adventure 2 expands on that idea with Tails and Eggman stages. These levels fill in requirements 1 and 2 perfectly, but what about number 3? Tails and Eggman are the only characters in this game that don't travel on foot, but rather inside big bulky mechs that can hover and shoot at objects and enemies. For Eggman, this makes perfect sense, due to his defining characteristic being that he's an evil genius who creates destructive machines. On the other hand, Tails is usually associated 
with his two tails that allow him to fly like a helicopter. This was utilized excellently in Sonic Adventure 1, but Sonic Adventure 2 puts Tails into a mech and never lets him get out, aside from the Chow Garden. When considering Tails for the three staples, I thought at first that this disqualified him from being a good Sonic gameplay style, but then I realized the genius at play here. Literally. Because think about it, besides his tails, what is Tails known for? His inventions, of course. He's always tinkering with his plane, the tornado, along with other things such as artificial chaos emeralds as seen in this game. With this in mind, it makes perfect sense for Tails to have a mech like Eggman. He's an inventor too! Also, if Tails played like how he did in the first game, it'd not only be redundant since Sonic and Shadow already cover our classical bases, it also mean we wouldn't have this clever parallel of two scientific geniuses. One good, one evil. With that small tangent covered, let's talk about the actual gameplay of these levels. Just like Gamma in the first game, Tails and Eggman can hold the action button to start targeting multiple enemies and release it to blast them all at once. It's just as satisfying as it was in Sonic Adventure, if not even more. Though, don't play these stages if you're waiting for something to cook in the microwave because the targeting sound will probably throw you off. <laughs> What sets these stages apart from Gamma is that they're a little more slower paced, but also more thoughtfully designed. While I did like Gamma stages in Adventure 1, not only were they woefully short, they also often reused sections of Sonic's levels. On the other hand, Tails and Eggman stages in Sonic Adventure 2 are not only longer, but much more mechanically interesting. The hover is utilized more, there's more intensive platforming to balance the action, and later on the game will introduce hazards that you actually want to avoid shooting, preventing the player from just spamming the action button for the whole level. Honestly, despite not finding as much intrinsic thrill in these stages as I do with Sonic's, it's hard for me to find anything substantial to criticize in these levels. At worst, there might be some less than favorable camera angles or a tricky platforming section that might take more tries than I'd like, but overall these stages are surprisingly well fleshed out, and I gotta give credit where it's due. Sonic Team took an idea that was already great in the first game, and aside from the occasional early 2000s jank, made it the best it could reasonably be. I wish I could say the same about Knuckles and Rouge's levels. Once again, Knuckles is hunting for the pieces of the Master Emerald, but this time Rouge is trying to get to them before he can. These stages are similar to how they were in Sonic Adventure, meaning they fit requirements 1 and 3, but yet again I feel like requirement 2 isn't quite reached here. The biggest reason for this is that, for some reason that I will never understand, the radar will only detect one of the three emeralds you need to find at a time. This practically forces you to use hints, especially in the large larger levels. My only guess as to why they did this is to make these stages last longer, but if that's the case, it's a terrible excuse. Even if Knuckles and Rouge had the radar from the first game, the sheer size and amount of levels would still make up a large portion of playtime. Ultimately, this just makes them more tedious than before. Despite this though, I don't think Knuckles and Rouge's levels are as bad as many seem to believe. While I will admit these stages are tedious at times, even with the less robust radar, they don't overstay their welcome as long as you use hints. The downside of this though is Sonic Adventure 2's brand new ranking system. This works wonders for replayability with Sonic, Shadow, Tails, and Eggman, but Knuckles and Rouge's levels fall apart here because the game will detract from your ranking if you use hints. This is downright criminal. Still, that's only if you're taking time to replay these levels. If you're just doing a regular any percent playthrough of Sonic Adventure 2, Knuckles and Rouge don't take too much playtime if you use hints, and despite the annoying radar system, hunting down the emerald shards is still decent fun if you can put up with Jank. Somehow, I completely forgot to talk about the bosses in my Sonic Adventure video, so here's a quick summary of my thoughts. They're not bad, but they're definitely too easy for the most part. I like that most of them follow the classic Sonic philosophy of landing as many hits as you can while the boss is vulnerable, but when most of these bosses only have a measly 3 hit points, that results in a laughably short battle. Sonic Adventure 2 remedies this problem, though not in the way I would have preferred. Instead of following up on the Genesis style bosses by giving them more hit points, Sonic Adventure Adventure 2 uses the more standardized approach of only allowing the player to hit the boss once when its weak point opens up. It's not a bad way of doing bosses, in fact some of the fights in this game such as the Egg Golem are really solid, but I do feel like it missed an opportunity to properly bring the classic boss design approach into 3D. Also returning from the first game are character battles where you fight another playable character from a different campaign. Much like the rest of the bosses, these were painfully easy in Adventure 1, but thankfully they amped up the difficulty a bit in Adventure 2, save for a few early battles. Generally, boss fights have never been a strong suit of the Sonic series, and unfortunately the adventure games are no exception. Despite this, I think Adventure 2 leans towards the better side of the spectrum, so it gets a passing grade here in my book. 
Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see them. After defeating the hero in Dark Stories, you unlock the final story, where the two campaigns converge and the game comes to an end. Like I mentioned before, the cutscenes in this campaign are a bit messy, at least in the English dub, but the actual story told here is still quite good. The Space Colony arc is on a crash course for Earth, and Sonic, Shadow, Eggman, and the others have to stop it. This leads us to the most grueling challenge in the entire game. Cannon's Core. This level has you playing as each and every character in the game, save for Shadow, with the mission of getting to the core of the Space Colony's Eclipse Cannon and destroying it. This is brutal. If you get a game over, you have to start over from the very beginning of a five segment stage, so make sure to farm lives before you attempt it. Anyway, after this level, Shadow has a change of heart when Amy inadvertently unlocks one of his memories, and he's convinced to help Sonic with overcoming the final obstacle preventing them from their goal, the Bio Lizard. Sonic and Shadow use the Chaos Emeralds to transform into Super Sonic and Super Shadow, leading to the Final Hazard boss fight. Much like Perfect Chaos from Sonic Adventure, Final Hazard isn't an especially difficult battle, instead focusing on cinematic spectacle, and this is a tradition that I absolutely love when it comes to early 3D Sonic games. Switching between Super Sonic and Super Shadow, hearing their dialogue, seeing them work together to destroy a common enemy, all while one of the best songs in the entire series is playing in the background, makes for a climactic final boss that rivals Perfect Perfect Chaos is one of the best in all of Sonic history. After defeating Final Hazard, Sonic and Shadow use Chaos Control to transport the Ark away from Earth. Shadow sacrifices himself in the process, fulfilling his promise to Maria as well as the entire world. The credits roll as all of the characters exchange dialogue reminiscing on the long adventure they just had. The end. Sonic Adventure 2 is an excellent sequel that blends together a variety of playstyles to make a memorable and fun experience, but more importantly in my opinion, it features the best 3D Sonic we have ever had. While we would get plenty of good video games featuring Sonic long after Adventure 2's Time in the Sun, Sonic Team still has yet to top what this game Sonic had to offer, a blend of classic conventions and 3D freedom, all experienced in tight, streamlined levels that are exhilarating to play and satisfying to master. And yet, even with all of this Said, Sonic Adventure 2 still had so much room for improvement. It still has some jank left over from its predecessor, the cutscenes could have been better, and while Sonic here is the best he's ever been in 3D, he still can't roll into a ball on command and he's still limited by 1998 hardware. All of this makes me sad that we never got a proper Sonic Adventure 3 that remedies these issues and adds even more interesting content and stories to enjoy. Despite this though, I am still very fond of Sonic Adventure 2. It's a memorable experience, an excellent sequel, and even with its future shortcomings, it still holds the title of my favorite Sonic game of all time. Heroes, the city is under attack. We need your help. It's time for some new heroes. Sonic Heroes. 12 heroes, 4 teams, 1 new game that never gets old. Premiering on Nintendo GameCube, rated E for everyone. Sega! Sonic Heroes was Sonic's first multi-platform game, released in 2003 for the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. Review outlets at the time were mostly positive about Sonic's first foray into the third-party realm, but as the years have gone on and games such as Shadow the Hedgehog and Sonic 06 have made their impact on the franchise, some have gone back to this game and declared that Heroes was the genesis of Sonic's many problems in the modern 3D games. Indeed, Sonic Heroes was a bit of a black sheep at the time of its release, with the focus being shifted from momentum-based platforming to team-based puzzle-solving mixed with more intensive combat. While we take Sonic's ever-changing design philosophy for granted now, this was pretty unprecedented in 2003. So, did Sonic Team's bold decision to shake up the Sonic formula pay off, or should this game have been Sonic Adventure 3 instead? Well, that's what I hope we'll find out by the end of this video. Before we get into the full review, I'd like to quickly apologize for the footage you're about to see. I have gotten loads of comments on my previous Sonic Heroes video lecturing me on how easy it is to set up the official PC port from 2004, but despite everything I've tried, I could not get it working on my machine whatsoever. So, for the sake of footage quality, I'm running this game with a widescreen patch and HD texture pack on the Dolphin emulator. While I think this mostly looks fine, the HUD is still optimized for a 4-3 aspect ratio, so if any time it looks like this, that's why. If you want more info as to why I had to jump through so many hoops just to get half-decent footage, I'd highly recommend my video talking all about the current state of Sonic Heroes, which I will link to at the end of this video. Now then, without further ado, this is my review of Sonic Heroes. 
Unlike Adventure 1 and 2 before it, the story in Sonic Heroes isn't very complex, nor is it all that present throughout the duration of the game. Eggman wants to conquer the world, Sonic friends it up to stop him, yada yada yada, you're in Seaside Hill now. We once again have multiple perspectives on the same events, this time in the form of four playable teams. Team Sonic, Team Dark, Team Rose, and Team Chaotix. All of these characters have different catalysts that lead them to the same goals. Team Sonic goes after Eggman because he sent them a letter saying that he's going to destroy the world. Team Dark goes after him because they just hate his guts. Team Rose goes after him because they think he stole Froggy and Chocula, and Team Chaotix are just trying to get bread. Respect. Unfortunately, these perspectives aren't very well developed or explored for reasons that we'll have to get into later, and not only does this end up hurting the story this game is trying to tell, it also makes the tone extremely inconsistent. I shall find the answer to who I really am. What an amazing flower! This flower is engineered like a helicopter. When it comes to cutscenes, Sonic Heroes definitely feels improved from Sonic Adventure 2 overall, though I think this is largely because of the sheer lack of them by comparison. The in-game cutscenes usually only amount to level and boss intros, and the pre-rendered cutscenes are so rare that they're pretty jarring when they happen. With that said though, while I don't think they've aged all that well, these CGI movies are decently animated for the time and lip-synced properly for once. As a whole, the graphics in this game are a sizable step up from its predecessors, which is impressive considering that we're still working with the same generation of hardware. I think this is at least partly due to the change in art direction from the adventure games. While I don't think there was anything inherently wrong with the more realistic environments, I have to give Sonic Heroes credit for striking a good balance between the vibrant colors of the Genesis games and the detailed textures from the Dreamcast games. This is just a flat out great art style, and one that would influence many future titles such as Generations. This might be a little more controversial, but I also quite like the new character models. Sonic and Friends are more shiny and colorful than ever before, and I I think they really nailed the proportions this time around. While I adore the chunky models from Adventure 1 and the lanky ones from Adventure 2, Heroes really cleans up around the edges and presents most of the characters quite nicely. Unfortunately, it's not all improvements when it comes to presentation. While the game looks good, it doesn't always sound good. The soundtrack has plenty of bangers, sure, but the audio has definitely taken a hit since Adventure 2. Enemies are back to making wimpy, barely audible explosions when they're killed, and the dialogue is still poorly translated. Considering this came out in 2000, 2003, when we've had multiple 3D Sonic games by this point, I really feel like these issues should have been ironed out. With that said though, there are things to like here in the sound department, the most notable of which, aside from the soundtrack, being the voice acting. Many of the iconic voices from the adventure games, such as Ryan Drummond, Dean Bristow, Scott Dreyer, and David Humphrey, all give their best performances yet as these characters. Ryan in particular really sounds comfortable in his role as Sonic, injecting loads of energy and excitement into nearly every sentence. That's the story and presentation mostly covered, so now it's time for everyone's favorite part. Gameplay. The overarching structure of Sonic Heroes is similar to that of Sonic Adventure 2, with a player completing the levels of each campaign in a linear order with occasional boss fights and character battles in between. Unlike the adventure games before it though, this game does have special stages, which we'll talk about in due time. Sonic Heroes attempts to innovate by introducing team mechanics, which are its main selling point. As opposed to controlling one character at a time in different levels, the player now takes simultaneous control of three characters, with each having their own type, speed, power, and flight. This necessitates changing to the core gameplay, which of course means that we need to hold it to our three staples of Sonic Excellence. For those who are new to the channel, which is probably most of you, let's quickly recap what I'm looking for in an ideal Sonic gameplay style. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, 3. The character's central attribute should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so its gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. I'll be using Team Sonic as my primary example when talking about the gameplay, but since every team has a nearly identical moveset, you can safely assume that my points will apply to all of them unless I say otherwise. With this in mind, let's get into it. To get the first point out of the way, Sonic Heroes is filled to the brim with staples of the Sonic franchise from start to finish. With rings, springs, robots, chaos emeralds, loop-de-loops, the works. With that said, let's go over the team gameplay. As mentioned earlier, Sonic Heroes at all times has you taking control of three characters with speed, power, and flight archetypes. Let's talk about speed first, using Sonic as our example. Sonic plays the most traditionally, with his momentum, jump, light speed dash, and homing attack all returning from the adventure games. Otherwise, his moveset is significantly different than before. The 
Spin Dash has been completely gutted and replaced with Rocket Excel, a move that has your other two team members launch Sonic while in motion for a small burst of speed. Additionally, the focus on combat in Sonic Heroes results in Sonic having some combat-focused moves in his arsenal, such as the Blue Tornado, which can stun enemies and be used to activate certain level gimmicks. Other speed characters have slight variations on this move, but it's still mostly used for the same purposes. Knuckles, our power character, is the most combat-specialized member of the team, with a three-hit combo and the ability to throw Sonic and Tails in ball format enemies. However, he also has the Triangle Dive, which is typically used to catch the upward draft from giant fans for platforming purposes. Tails is more platforming focused, but has some combat moves as well, such as Thundershoot, where he throws Sonic and Knuckles at enemies to stun them and defeat them if he's leveled up enough. Additionally, he can fly for a short period of time. The core gameplay of Sonic Heroes is to switch between the playable characters in your team and use the best one for whatever job the levels throw at you. For example, if there's a platform too high for the other characters to reach, you switch to Tails to fly everyone up there, and if there's a wall that needs to be broken, you need to use Knuckles to break it down. This same philosophy applies to combat, with different enemies being weak to different attacks. You may need to use Sonic's Blue Tornado to flip a turtle enemy upside down to destroy it, or Tails' Thundershoot to knock down flying enemies. For all of its faults, Sonic Heroes really squeezes a lot out of this team gameplay. Now, when I say all of its faults, I'm not kidding around, because unfortunately, Sonic Heroes is chock full of them. While the level design does take advantage of the team mechanics, I think Sonic Team may have been a little overzealous with the length, because most of these levels can take 10 minutes or more to beat, compared to the average 2-3 minute length of previous Sonic stages, whether 3D or not. Even then, in a more polished game, I could understand them wanting to improve and expand upon the levels, but polished this game is most certainly not. While Sonic's momentum is retained from the adventure games, they seem to have added an additional speed parameter that always travels in whichever direction the stick is pushed, and not necessarily where the character is facing. This means that the player is constantly dealing with two opposing forces of momentum, making this game feel much more slippery. This problem is exacerbated with some characters' moves combined with the level design. See, Sonic Heroes really likes to constantly throw enemy gauntlets at you while not putting up any barriers whatsoever. This, combined with Knuckles' punches launching him out of control means you are constantly at risk of falling to your death without it necessarily being your fault. Fun! And the slippery game feel isn't the only problem this game has going for it, not even close. Sonic Heroes retains a lot of jank from the adventure games as well. The light speed dash, while easier to recover from if it doesn't work, still shouldn't fail this often when the level design very frequently relies on it. And speaking of things not working, there's also these switches that you have to pull with your flight character, which often will not happen despite the prompt literally showing. There are so many of these issues that if I were to talk about them all, this would probably turn into one of those 5 hour video essays. I'm sure there will be some people commenting on this video accusing me of having a double standard since I excused the jank in Sonic Adventure and it's Sonic Adventure 2, but I'm not doing the same with Heroes. But the reason I gave those games a pass is because they were made during a time where this was the norm. On the other hand, by the time Heroes came out, not only were we expecting more out of AAA games, this is also just basic stuff that a sequel needs to do. Sonic Adventure 2 may not be the most polished game ever made, but at the very least it does fix a lot of glitches and quirks from its predecessor. Sonic Sonic Heroes, on the other hand, is so wrapped up in introducing new mechanics that it can't be bothered to do the very job of a sequel, to expand and improve upon what came before. If Sega had held off on taking Sonic in a new direction, and instead focused first on perfecting the winning formula they already had, then Sonic Heroes probably wouldn't have the mixed reputation that it does. <sighs> but I think I've made my point. I've talked enough about what I believe Sonic Heroes should have been, so now let's talk about what it is. To go back to our Sonic gameplay criteria, I will give Heroes a pass on the third point, but I refuse to give it any credit for replayability, and that's due to a huge sin of game design that this game commits. Padding. While four campaigns sounds like a decent amount of content, very little of it is actually unique. In reality, all four of these teams are going through the exact same levels in the exact same order with very minor changes. To kick things off, Team Sonic actually makes a fairly decent first impression. It has a pretty bare-bones story, sure, but hearing banter between Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles really sells the idea that these guys have been friends for a while, and it helps justify the downright insane coordination they must have to be able to perform some of the moves that they do. The level design is 
mostly okay, but a majority of the bosses boil down to just spamming Sonic's homing attack until they're down for the count. Egg Emperor, the last boss, is one of the few that requires using all three characters, but it relies so much on projectile spam that it quickly becomes frustrating. One aspect of the team gameplay that I have yet to touch on is Team Blast, which is basically the final smash before that was a thing. As your team engages in combat, this meter in the top right will gradually fill up, and when it's full, you can activate it to destroy all enemies within radius. This move has additional effects when playing as other teams, but Team Sonic's is as simple as that. Next is Team Dark, and... oh. Shadow's back. Yeah, so as it turns out, Shadow was such a fan favorite that Sonic Team decided to bring him back, rendering his sacrifice in Sonic Adventure 2 completely pointless. This tidbit kind of perfectly encapsulates the approach to story in this game. It shares continuity with the previous games, but it doesn't care about the spirit that those stories had. Sonic was outright mourning Shadow's death in Sonic Adventure 2, but when he's reintroduced in Heroes, Sonic acts like he just saw his old high school buddy in the grocery store, not someone who literally died before his eyes in the last game. Team Dark in general has a pretty dumb story. Rouge finds Shadow and a new robot character, Omega, in some random facility. Man, we dodged a bullet with this one. Could you imagine if they not only brought Shadow back, but Gamma too? This game would be a whole buffet of degraded character deaths. As far as gameplay goes, Team Dark starts off alright, with some tweaked level design to provide a somewhat fresh experience, but as it goes on, it gets more and more frustrating. Team Sonic had this enemy gauntlet after Mystic Mansion that was already pretty annoying as it was, but I swear this thing is borderline impossible on Team Dark. I ended up using an action replay code to spam Team Blast and get it the heck over with. Yes, this is totally a skill issue and not a problem with the game design. You can now brag in the comments about how you beat it with your eyes closed in the womb. We will all be very impressed. Finally, Team Dark's Team Blast has an interesting twist where it pauses time for a brief period after the move is performed, allowing you to pick up stray rings and level ups before engaging in combat again. I thought waiting for this to finish would get annoying, but I eventually discovered that you can resume time on command by pressing the Team Blast button again. Very nice. Next is Team Rose, which is apparently this game's easy mode, so why are these campaigns not sorted by difficulty? Uh, before I go on another rant, let's quickly go over this campaign. Honestly, while Team Rose is a bit too easy at times, I didn't really mind after Team Dark's story. Not only are these takes on the levels much more forgiving, they're also under half of the length, which meant spending significantly less time replaying levels that I had already played through twice, plus it made accessing the special stages much easier. With that said, there were times where the low difficulty felt a little insulting. The best example I can give is the Team Blast, which will not only obliterate any nearby enemies, but also give you invincibility afterwards, which is overkill even for a game overly stuffed with repetitive combat. The story in Team Rose doesn't seem to really know what it wants to be. It's constantly flip-flopping between Amy trying to marry Sonic and the whole team looking for their missing friends and or pets. Also, Cream's voice is insufferable. Finally, we have Team Chaotix. This is easily the worst campaign in the game. Unlike the other teams, which simply required you to get to the end, a majority of the Chaotix missions have you collecting a set amount of a specific item, defeating all the enemies in a level, etc. The problem, of course, is that you're having to do this in a linear level that was not built for this kind of exploration whatsoever. This is by far the most tedious gameplay in this whole game. Even in levels where you don't have to do any of this malarkey, the game still feels the need to put in random puzzle elements that don't fit the flow of the level design whatsoever, with Rail Canyon being one of the more egregious examples. I've heard some people say that Team Chaotix has the best story in this game, and even if I agreed, that's still a pitifully low bar to cross considering all the other campaigns. Basically, Vector, Charmy, and Espio from Knuckles Chaotix have a private detective agency now, and an anonymous client, who is totally not Dr. Eggman, gives them a job to do. Since these morons probably don't get a lot of money in this line of work, they of course accept, and shenanigans ensue. While this is certainly a cute setup, the story falls apart as the campaign goes on. We already know it's Eggman from the very beginning, but this game tries to convince us otherwise by having him seemingly try to stop the Chaotix in boss fights. But again, we already know that this is a robot and not the real Eggman because most people have already beaten all the other teams by this point. And even if this twist was a surprise, it still wouldn't justify the monotonous gameplay of this campaign. So in conclusion, the best thing about Team Chaotix is their Team Blast. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
And finally, before we talk about the last story, Sonic Heroes marks the return of special stages, which were a staple of the Genesis games and the only way to collect all seven Chaos Emeralds. Now, when it comes to those games, the special stages ranged wildly in quality, with some being genuinely fun and others being downright blood boiling. So, where do the stages in Sonic Heroes fall on the spectrum? Well, kind of everywhere, actually. Despite all of these using the exact same format, the range and difficulty is wide enough to give Big the Cat a run for his money. Some of these stages stages are over in literal seconds, while others I would swear are borderline impossible. What doesn't help is that the physics seem to be completely borked here. This is the only other part of the game that I used an action replay code to get around, not because of the special stages themselves, but rather the unnecessarily tedious way you're required to access them. First of all, whether a special stage even has a Chaos Emerald depends entirely on the level that it's in, which is already stupid when you compare it to the Genesis games, which would always give you a Chaos Emerald regardless of where you access the stage. Second, you can't replay special stages from the level select, which means you have to go back to the level it's in, collect a key, and go through the entire level without getting hit once, which is almost completely dependent on luck. Only then can you retry the special stage, and if you fail, you have to do all of that again. Even playing as Team Rose, that's still five or more minutes you have to waste before you can retry. And after several attempts at the hardest of these stages, I reached my breaking point. So in total, I used two action replay codes to beat Sonic Heroes. That's right everyone, I'm a fake gamer. All of these games? Fake. All these consoles? Fake. My very existence? Fake. You've all been hallucinating this whole time. <coughs> anyway, let's finally talk about the last story. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. Okay, so Metal Sonic is back for some reason, and he transforms into a giant robot monster thing in a seizure-inducing cutscene that I probably can't show here. How does he do this? Well, according to the dialogue in his boss fight, he used the power of chaos, which makes no sense whatsoever, but sure. Anyway, now that Sonic and friends have endured the same set of levels four times in a row and collected the Chaos Emeralds, Sonic can now use the power of friendship to turn into Super Sonic, while Tails and Knuckles just turn into balls. Okay, so no super tails or super knuckles, I guess. The final boss once again isn't terribly hard, but it is pretty boring. Unlike the adventure games where the final boss was easy for the sake of not ruining the spectacle, Neo Metal Sonic or Metal Overlord or whatever the heck he's called doesn't really have much spectacle. You just kind of follow him throughout a cloudy void and wail on him until the game decides you've done enough. The final cutscene has all of the characters barely giving a single dang about what just transpired, and the credits roll for the fifth unskippable time. According to the developers, Sonic Heroes was supposed to be a return to Sonic's roots, but I find it hard to understand what they actually mean by that. For all of the changes that Sonic Adventure and its sequel made, I would still argue that they're more faithful to Sonic's roots than even the best parts of Sonic Heroes. Is Sonic Heroes a bad game? No but I do think it's a bad sequel. Sequels are sequential. They're meant to expand and improve upon the foundation of their predecessors, not throw out what works in favor of something new. Looking at you, Paper Mario. But even with this said, I do admit that under better circumstances, Sonic Heroes could have been an amazing sequel. In a world where Sonic Adventure 3 happened and perfected the formula of previous titles, I don't think I'd complain about a change in formula, especially if it was able to carry over the polish of a hypothetical Sonic Adventure 3. Unfortunately though, while Sonic Heroes has a lot of interesting ideas, the padding, lack of polish, and questionable design decisions prevent it from reaching its full potential. And while I wouldn't call it an awful game, it certainly wasn't over for things to come. Rated E10 for ages 10 and up. A pleasure to meet you at last, Princess of Solian. never been faster. Racing through fantastic realms, battling awesome enemies, overcoming tremendous obstacles at blistering next-gen speeds. If you thought you knew Blue, 
It's time to think faster. All right, let's do it. Sonic the Hedgehog, redefined for the next generation. November 2006. Sonic the Hedgehog, commonly referred to as Sonic 06, released in 2006 for the Xbox 360 and in 2007 for the PlayStation 3. It was intended to be a soft reboot for the franchise and attempted to evolve the formula of the adventure games after the mixed critical reception of Sonic Heroes and Shadow the Hedgehog. We all know what happened next. The game was rushed, riddled with bugs, and universally panned by players and critics alike. Lately though, with the rise of a fan remake titled Project 06, some fans' perceptions of Sonic 06 have shifted, with many people defending the original game and claiming that it was actually an underrated masterpiece all this time. And as much as I appreciate Project 06 for many reasons, I feel obligated to at least try to stop the spread of this misinformation. Because listen, just because you've played a fan recreation does not mean that you've truly experienced this game. I, on the other hand, have. I suffered through the entirety of this game on PlayStation 3, waiting through every drawn out loading screen, listening to every IT'S NO USE from Silver, and completing all four episodes. And now, it's high time that I show you all the true nature of this game, and how it irreversibly affected our beloved franchise. Before I get into the video, I'd like to once again apologize for the quality of footage that you're about to see. I was originally planning to record my gameplay in 1080p using the Xenia emulator, but there were a myriad of graphical issues that I couldn't resolve. So we're sticking to original hardware for this one, 720p 60fps footage recorded directly from the PlayStation 3. With that out of the way, let's begin. This is my review of Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. Before anything else, it's imperative that we briefly go over the development history of Sonic 06 for proper context. If you already know what went on behind the scenes, feel free to skip to this timestamp. As for the rest of you, it's story time. Development on Sonic 06 began in 2004, with Sonic Team wanting to address the criticisms made towards Heroes in Shadow. Team lead Yuji Naka took inspiration from popular superhero movies at the time, such as Sam Raimi's Spider-Man and Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins, and suggested that the game should aim for a darker tone and feature more realistic environments. But after a reasonably successful preview at E3, things quickly started to head south. Sega demanded that Sonic Team finish the game before Holiday 2006 to commemorate the series' 15th anniversary. This alone was nothing new for them though, right? Other 3D Sonic games also took about two years to make. Well, it would have been, if not for the absolute cluster truck of additional problems that built up over the latter half of the game's development cycle. Midway through development, Yuji Naka left Sonic Team to found a company that would go on to make games that nobody has ever heard of, leading Shun Nakamura to pick up the pieces. But things only got worse from here. Originally, Sega was planning to release the game on all major platforms that would be released that year, but when they realized that Nintendo's revolution turned out to be a wee bit underpowered, they were forced to give up half of the development crew to make a separate game that would eventually become Secret Rings. This left the Sonic 06 team working under a strict deadline with only half of the development staff that they really needed, and this left no room for quality assurance. Before long, it was holiday 2006, and Sega shipped what they had had, resulting in the release of what we now know as Sonic 06. First, let's talk presentation. Sonic 06 tries to aim for a darker tone than previous mainline entries. No, Shadow the Hedgehog isn't mainline, get over it. This, apparently, necessitated redesigning the entire Sonic cast with taller proportions and marginally more realistic textures. Originally, they were going to give some characters realistic fur, which would have been an interesting idea, but considering how much Sonic Unleashed struggled trying to render that on the same hardware, I'm glad they didn't stick with it. On paper, these designs should more closely match Yuji Yokawa's artwork, but in practice, is they just kind of look wrong. Sonic is so lanky that he looks like he's going to collapse into a pile of blue spaghetti at any moment, and in game his quills are animated so limply that his iconic silhouette is completely lost. This brings us to the cutscenes, with some being gorgeous pre-rendered CG, others being in-engine, and a few being a weird middle ground between the two. When it comes to the in-game cutscenes, I feel that these are poorly done, even for 2006. Despite having released five years after Sonic Adventure 2, with two better animated games releasing in between, Sonic 06's cutscenes once again use most motion capture for their animation, and it's even more uncanny here with the lankier proportions and more realistic character designs, especially Eggman. With that said, there is one character that, to my surprise, is actually elevated by this approach, that being Mephiles. The weird, shaky movements combined with a completely static expression helps Mephiles succeed at being just plain creepy, especially when he's masquerading as Shadow. If Sonic Team had time to hand animate the rest of the characters, I think this could have made Mephiles stand out in this regard. Unfortunately, as it stands, all of the characters ended up falling 
of this uncanny valley, with their face rigs hardly ever being used save for some poor lip-syncing and occasional eyelid movement. We can't talk about cutscenes without also mentioning the voice cast, which was replaced after the success of the Sonic X anime. This unfortunately means that the GOAT, Ryan Drummond, is no longer voicing Sonic, instead being replaced by Jason Griffith. While I don't think Jason is an awful fit for the character, it's clear to me that he either wasn't comfortable with the role yet at this point, or just wasn't given very good direction. He delivers nearly every line with the exact same intonation, and it gets kind of annoying after a while. I have to hurry and save Elise! That tornado's carrying a car! Woohoo! What a view! Gotta be careful not to fall off here! Gotta be careful not to fall off here! Gotta be careful not to fall off here! Like my other videos, I won't be analyzing every single actor's performance, but there are a few more that I want to briefly go over. One of these is Knuckles, who is now voiced by Dan Green. I already didn't love Knuckles' voice direction in any of the previous 3D Sonic games, but if I had to choose between that and this version, I'd take the previous one any day. Knuckles sounds like a surfer dude bro in this game, and strangely still does, even in recent games such as Frontiers. On the more positive side of things is Dr. Eggman, now being voiced by Mike Pollock. While I loved Dean Bristow's performance in the previous entries, he is unfortunately no longer with us, so a recast was inevitable either way. Thankfully, Mike Pollock honors Bristow's legacy by giving Eggman a different but equally fitting voice. He absolutely kills it in nearly every piece of media that he's ever portrayed the character in, and it's no wonder that he's still being brought back to this day. As for the rest of the cast, I could take or leave them. Honestly, everyone just sounds like generic anime characters, which I suppose is fitting, for better or worse, but we'll get to that later. The overall presentation in Sonic 06 just feels off. It definitely has that uncanny early 7th generation look that plagued realistic titles like Skyrim and Heavy Rain, with poor attempts at realistic models, weird pixelated shadows, and a heavy-handed reliance on bloom effects. What I find most irritating about this game's approach to realism is that it often uses bland grays and browns to portray its environments. Previous games such as Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 went for a more realistic look too, but still retained the vibrant colors and fantastical landscapes of the Gen games. Meanwhile, many of the areas in Sonic 06 look like bad Gmod maps, and it's a slap in the face to the colorful and well-crafted level themes of previous entries. I'll probably get hate for this, but I also feel a similar way about the music. Don't get me wrong, there's several standout tracks such as His World, Kingdom Valley, and White Acropolis, but most of them feel kind of boring to me. Some seem outright derivative, like did anyone else notice how much Wave Ocean sounds like Take On Me? With the development history and presentation out of the way, it's finally time to get into the game proper. As was the norm with early 3D Sonic games, Sonic 06 once again features multiple campaigns offering a different perspective on the same story. This time, each of these revolve around one of three hedgehogs, Sonic, Shadow, and a new character, Silver. We'll go over these individually in due time, but first I'd better address the elephant in the room. Sonic 06 is an absolute mess. Even if you don't experience a single glitch throughout your playthrough, which I'm positive is impossible, you'll still be faced with sporadic bouts of slowdown along with egregiously long loading screens. Most games around this time tended to resort to low frame rates to keep their games chugging along at a reasonable speed on consoles. Meanwhile, Sonic 06 targets 60 FPS at all times, forcing the game to go in slow motion when too much is going on. That wouldn't even be so bad in your typical Sonic game, but Sonic Team must have been having a field day with the Havoc engine because you are not going one second without coming across a physics object in this game. Even things that had perfectly fine behaviors in previous games use Havoc physics now, and often to their detriment too. There were multiple times where I was trying to pick up my dropped rings only to end up pushing them away because the game was still running physics calculations. And you'd think that this over-reliance on physics objects would be the only major culprit of this slowdown, but Sonic 06 really just seems to like chugging when there's no good reason, with this area of Soliana Castletown being just one example. Moreover, the loading screens are some of the most abysmal I've ever experienced in a video game, and not just because of their length, but also their sheer quantity. Why in the name of Cheez-Its do I have to wait through a loading screen after talking to a guy only to realize that he's not even done talking, and then wait through another one before I can start the mission? It's even worse if you fail, because then you have to go through that whole ordeal twice before you can try again. All of this combined makes for an extremely patience-testing experience on its own, but I also want to stress that 
this alone is not the only factor that makes Sonic 06 such a travesty. Oh no, we're just getting started. So let's finally get into the individual campaigns. To preface, let's once again go over my three staples of Sonic excellence. For those of you who are new, these are the basic principles that I look for in a character's playstyle in a Sonic game. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, 3. The character's central attribute should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Note that these don't necessarily denote a good playstyle period, but rather a baseline that distincts a Sonic game from any other generic platformer. Now, with these in mind, let's get into it. When starting up Sonic's story, we're greeted to the opening cutscene in the fictional country of Soliana, where a new character named Princess Elise is doing some sort of ritual until Eggman shows up to kidnap her. But don't worry, Sonic is here, somehow, and he quickly saves her. We're then brought to an in-engine cutscene where Elise is kidnapped again, this time throwing a Chaos Emerald to Sonic before she's taken away. How did Elise have a Chaos Emerald when there's only seven and Soliana has never been relevant until now? Who knows? Anyway, after a not-so-brief loading screen, we're finally in the game, and... oh. Oh, this feels bad. Sonic's moveset has more or less been brought back to how it was in Sonic Adventure 2. We have the spin dash, homing attack, light speed dash, and bounce all accounted for, but there's one slight problem. None of these feel good at all. Unlike the adventure games and heroes, which had a momentum system reminiscent of the Genesis titles, Sonic 06 does not, and it's painfully obvious at times. The game tries to convince you that it's there with sequences where Sonic runs on walls and through loop-de-loops like old times, but uh, yeah, these are automated. Let go of the stick and you're either falling straight off or sticking to the ceiling. But 06 doesn't just fail at classic Sonic momentum, no, it just fails at basic platformer physics in general. The steering is super touchy, the slide and spin dash lock you into one direction, the air dash completely halts your momentum outright, and once again the light dash is still finicky as all heck. Nothing feels quite right here, not just from a Sonic standpoint, but from a general gameplay perspective as well. Hub worlds return in Sonic 06, though they're much more empty and boring than an adventure. In these hub worlds, you'll be searching for and completing action stages and doing these awful town missions. But as for the action stages, these are fine in theory, but they're so railroaded that they become pretty boring at times. And when they do let you take shortcuts, the physics are so unreliable that it's better to just take the main path 9 times out of 10. Moreover, Sonic 06 also brings back enemy gauntlets, both in town missions and in the action stages, and many of these are mandatory to open doors. Even worse, Sonic doesn't have very good combat in this game, with the homing attack and bounce being the only semi-reliable moves, so be prepared to get constantly interrupted with mindless enemy spam. At least Heroes had a decently complex combat system to excuse this. Worse still, these stages aren't seamless like previous games, being interrupted at least one or two times by a 15 second loading screen. Oh, you're telling me that 15 seconds isn't that bad? Alright, let's sit through one together. Something unique to this game is its implementation of other playable characters besides the three hedgehogs. In Sonic's case, you'll occasionally play as Tails, Knuckles, and sometimes Silver, but we'll get to him later. The way that this is handled is something that I actually have to give Sonic 06 credit for. Basically, every stage you'll mostly be playing as Sonic, but every once in a while you'll run into one of his friends and play a small intermission as that character. These don't overstay their welcome and are a nice change of pace from the usual gameplay, so hey, that's one point for Sonic 06. Unfortunately, the actual quality of gameplay for these characters is a bit of a different story. Tails can still fly, though it's really touchy, but his tail whip has been replaced altogether with this awful dummy ring bomb attack. I believe this was in Heroes as well, but that game had other means of fighting enemies, while in 06, Tails' combat relies solely on this move, and it sucks. 
Knuckles also sucks. You can glide and climb, same as before, but his drill attack won't stop when you hit the ground, sending him careening off the edge. His close quarters combat also doesn't help things, considering the awful hitboxes of most enemies. So, how well does Sonic perform under the three staples of Sonic excellence? Well, it's safe to say that the first requirement is met, seeing as rings, springs, loop-de-loops, robotic enemies, and all of that good stuff is here and accounted for. However, Sonic quickly begins to struggle when it comes to the other two. While replayability is suggested, with there being occasional shortcuts and alternate routes through stages, actually replaying these levels is something that I never want to do in my life, due to the horrible physics and mediocre level design. This version of Sonic just isn't fun to play as. Finally, while Sonic can spin dash, the rolling physics that made his gameplay iconic, and the very reason that he's even a hedgehog in the first place, are completely absent in favor of on rails level design that tries desperately to convince you that you're doing amazing things, when really all you're doing is going through the motions. With the gameplay covered, I should also briefly go over the story. While the other characters in 06 are involved in things that are actually relevant to the plot, Sonic is stuck in a wild goose chase against Eggman, who I swear only exists in this game as a formality. He's after Princess Elise because he wants to release the Flames of Disaster to take over the world, more on that later, but Mephiles ends up doing that later anyway, so yeah, they were definitely struggling to make this guy relevant. Also, there's this weird romance subplot going on between Sonic and Princess Elise. I know this is one of the main things people always criticize, but can you blame them? It's just weird, and the worst part is that it's not even played off as a joke. The developers were actually trying to create a serious romantic relationship between a realistic woman and a blue mother truck and hedgehog. <sighs> anyway, let's move on before my head explodes. You'll recall that Shadow was suggested to have died in Sonic Adventure 2, only to appear in Sonic Heroes to meet that game's playable character quota. Well, after his character was butchered to heck and back in his own game released in 2005, Shadow returns once again in Sonic 06, and his character is… back to status quo, I suppose. Before we get into that whole thing, let's talk gameplay. Shadow plays similarly to Sonic, with some key differences, one being the lack of a spin dash. Considering the air dash gives you no momentum in this game, the fact that Shadow can't even spin dash is definitely a major blow to his game feel. Additionally, Shadow's combat is a little different from Sonic's. Instead of bouncing off of enemies after a homing attack, he'll freeze in place and do this absolutely ridiculous animation every time you press the attack button until the enemy is dead. This is pretty tedious, but defeating enemies will fill up this gauge, which I should probably talk about. You may have also noticed this during Sonic's gameplay and wondered what the heck it was for. Well, originally, this was going to deplete when Sonic used special moves from these gems that you can buy from the shop. Unfortunately, at some point during development, this bar just broke, and now it doesn't deplete at all, meaning it's pretty easy to cheese some of Sonic's sections. For the rest of the characters, though, this bar works more or less as it should, and in Shadow's case, it allows him to go beast mode when it's all the way full. This will make his attack stronger, while also making it nigh impossible to do homing attack chains for some reason. Cool. This combat system isn't all that deep, but Sonic Team must have thought otherwise, because if you thought the enemy gauntlets in Sonic's story were bad, you are not ready for Shadow. In some cases, there are multiple of these in a row, with no checkpoints in between, making for a very tedious backtracking quest every time you die. But don't worry, his levels still get worse from here, because we also have vehicles, which, you guessed it, use the same awful Havoc physics as the rest of the objects in this game. There are some parts that at first glance seem to be optional, but you'll quickly realize that the game will straight up fail you if you're not using a vehicle during that section. Great game design, guys. Since he's so similar to Sonic and faces the same problems, Shadow does about as well with the three Sonic staples as you'd probably expect. Essential Sonic staples are present, but the level design doesn't beg any return visits unless you're a pathological completionist, and its iconic gameplay from Sonic Adventure 2 is butchered even more than Sonic's. So what about the other characters? Well, in Shadow's story, we have Rouge and Omega both returning from Sonic Heroes. Rouge is basically a better version of Knuckles, seeing as she can throw bombs and place mines, meaning she doesn't have to deal with the wonky hitboxes that resulted from Knuckles' mainly focused combat. As for Omega, he's the diet version of Gamma from Sonic Adventure, as he was always destined to be. I want to say that the mechanic of locking onto multiple enemies is still here, but there's no HUD elements that indicate what you're locking onto, making for some extremely clunky gameplay. With all of that mentioned, how does the story fare in this campaign? Well, it kinda starts to get messy here. It starts off with Shadow and Rouge doing random missions for Gun until Rouge get clumsy with this random artifact called the Scepter of Darkness and breaks it, which awakens an ancient... 
I don't know, ghost deity named Mephiles, who takes the form of Shadow and sends him to the future. Throughout the rest of the story, Shadow starts to put the pieces together of who Mephiles is, why he's here, and how he relates to Iblis, while also traveling through time way more often than any story besides Back to the Future ever should. At the end, Mephiles tries to convince Shadow to help him destroy the world, but Shadow manages to show some semblance of an actual character in this game and refuses, then proceeds to obliterate him. For now, anyway. Honestly, while playing Shadow's story, I didn't really understand what was even happening most of the time, and maybe I still don't completely, but Silver's story definitely ties some things together, so let's talk about him now. Silver, being a newcomer to the roster, is easily the most interesting playable character in this game. Like most Sonic characters, we don't know much about his actual origin, but what we are told is that he comes from a future that was destroyed by Iblis, aka the Flames of Disaster, long before he was born, which is a pretty compelling setup for a character. But before we get into the story, let's talk about his gameplay. Silver has psychic powers that allow him to manipulate objects and float in the air, which makes for an interesting idea for a playable Sonic character. However, when actually playing as Silver, it's a whole different story, unfortunately. While Sonic and Shadow's levels are speed-based with intermittent combat, Silver's are pretty much only combat in slow jank and slow, janky combat at that. Silver's combat is the Havoc physics engine. It just is. You hold down R1 to pick up random objects and throw them at enemies and watch them roll around in HD. It's a cool mechanic for the first five minutes, but you'll soon realize that the game doesn't do much with this. However, I discovered during this playthrough that you can actually stun certain enemies and then pick them up to throw at other enemies, which is an infinitely more interesting concept and one that I wish the game put more heavy focus on. Aside from one town mission that forced as you two, the game never speaks of this mechanic, which is a shame because with a little polish, this could have been a much more engaging combat system. Unfortunately, that's not how things turned out, and Silver turned out to be slow, boring, and tedious despite having the most gameplay potential. With that said though, he does perform better under the three staples than either of the other hedgehogs. Essential elements of the series are present, and Silver's abilities are important and utilized, even if not very well. Two out of three is approaching a passing grade, though I would never want to touch these levels again with a 10-foot pole, so take that as you will. Of course, we can't forget the other playable characters, which in Silver's case are Blaze and Amy. If you've played through the Sonic Rush games, you'll know that Blaze having come from the same future as Silver doesn't make any sense, but I'd better leave that be before I go on another long tangent and make this video two hours long. Amy plays like how she did in Sonic Adventure, but without the running hammer attack that made her decently fun to play in that game. In place of this is the new invisibility mechanic that is never explained and doesn't end up serving any functional purpose, so I have no idea why this is even here. Blaze, on the other hand, is probably one of the best playable characters in this game, ironically enough. She handles similarly to Sonic, but she doesn't slow down nearly as much when attacking and jumping. Even when playing the exact same automated sections that Sonic does, it's clear just how much faster Blaze feels to play. It's just a shame that she's only playable in a handful of levels. Now back to the story. As I said before, by the time you finish Silver's story, everything kind of starts to make sense. I say kind of, because this whole plot is still a complete mess, but I'll try to explain it as best as I can can. So in the past, Soliana researchers were trying to find a way to harness the powers of their god, Solaris, but things go wrong and it tries to escape. The Duke of Soliana contains one half, Iblis, by using his daughter Elise as a vessel, and contains the other half, Mephiles, in the Scepter of Darkness. The catch is that if Elise cries, Iblis will be released, and if the Scepter is broken, Mephiles will be released. Years later, Eggman crashes the Soliana Festival in hopes of getting Elise to release the Flames of Disaster, and Rouge drops the Scepter of Darkness, releasing Mephiles. Iblis must also be released at some point in the future, because in Silver's time, the entire world is in ashes. Mephiles, with Silver unaware of his true nature, sends him back in time to kill Sonic, not because he's the cause of releasing Iblis, but because he knows that this will make Elise cry. Throughout this whole thing, characters are going back and forth in time, Eggman's doing random Eggman stuff, and non-essential characters are making cameo appearances, which just serves to confuse a plot that, for all intents and purposes, isn't really that deep. The game just wants you to think that it is. This brings us to the final episode, but before that, I need to briefly go over the bosses. I feel like I haven't done the best job analyzing the bosses in past Sonic videos, so let me quickly recap one last time. In the Genesis games, bosses had a simple yet effective design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can hit the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. This simple approach separates Sonic bosses from other platforming games, and in my opinion is how other Sonic games should approach their boss design. Sonic Adventure got pretty close to this, but made the fatal mistake of only giving the enemy 3 or 4 hit points, making them pretty easy to cheat. 
disease. Sonic Adventure 2 followed suit with this low amount of health, but rebalanced it by taking the route that other platformers do, only allowing the player to hit the boss once while it's vulnerable. Arguably, Sonic Heroes comes the closest to the classics in this regard, but it has the exact opposite problem as the adventure games, giving the enemy way too much health. So how does Sonic 06 compare? Well, when it comes to maintaining the philosophy of the classics, it fails. Most bosses follow Sonic Adventure 2's philosophy. The thing is, at least Sonic Adventure 2's bosses were well designed and fun. Meanwhile, Sonic 06's bosses make me want to pull my hair out. This is due to the lack of polish. Many bosses either don't make it clear what you're supposed to do, or what you are supposed to do takes way too long. Even worse are the character battles, which have always been a sore spot for the series, but Sonic 06 brings them down a whole new level. Everyone has heard about the Silver fight, but I don't think everyone knows just how bad this fight is. Silver has an attack that freezes you in place, then after a few seconds, he throws you, forcing you to take a hit. There is no way to escape this. Once he grabs you, you just have to wait and hope you can pick up your rings in time. That's right, there's no cooldown on this attack. As long as you're in range, Silver will keep doing this over and over again until you're dead, and it is miserable when it happens. I eventually figured out that if you run around the perimeter of the arena, Silver won't be able to catch up with you and will instead do an attack where he throws a bunch of objects at you. During this, he's vulnerable, so you can land a dropkick on him, then rinse and repeat. This is never made clear by the game itself, and I'm honestly not even sure it's the intended strategy. Either way, even when you do do it this way, it's still not very fun. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. Sonic and Elise are walking in GM Flatgrass looking all stupid when Mephilus shows up and stabs Sonic with a giant light sword. This moment right here I feel is symbolic. This is the moment when Sonic died. Not just the character, but the reputation of the franchise as a whole. The melodramatic soap opera-esque music in the background along with the vacant emotionless expressions on everyone's faces just make this scene impossible to take seriously. Like this is Sonic the freaking Hedgehog. This character is beloved to so many people, yet this this game refuses to let me give a single darn about him literally dying. Anyway, this makes Elise cry, releasing Iblis, and Mephilus fuses with him and transports all of Sonic's friends to this weird limbo place. Apparently, the Chaos Emeralds now have the ability to bring people back from the dead, so it's up to everyone to split up and find them. This leads us to the final level, End of the World, which is basically this game's version of Cannon's Core, but now with reused level design and these awful black holes. Once the Emeralds are gathered, Elise uses them to bring Sonic back to life, but not before giving a kiss that I guess was either some unspoken step in this ritual or Elise just really wanted to kiss a dead hedgehog. At this point, I have no idea. I just want to erase my memory of this game and go play Sonic Adventure 2 instead. Unfortunately, I can't do that just yet, because once Sonic is brought back to life, he uses the Chaos Emeralds to turn himself, Shadow, and Silver into super forms to defeat the now reawakened Solaris, leading to the final boss. And despite being in a long lineage of final bosses that were final bits of spectacle to give the player a good lasting impression, Solaris is the epitome of everything that sucks about this game. Like the Silver fight, the game does a poor job of explaining what you need to do to defeat the boss, which is doubly worse here considering that we have never played as any of these super forms until now. Other games in the series made these bosses easy so that the player doesn't have to worry about that, but Sonic 06 is not so merciful. So basically, each hedgehog has a different set of attacks that do different things. Despite you starting as Sonic, you actually have to switch to Silver, which takes forever by the way, to make the boss vulnerable, and only then can you use Sonic and Shadow to do any actual damage. Worse yet, you're not only constantly losing rings during this battle, but despite the super forms having always meant to make you invincible, if you get hit, you will lose a huge chunk of your rings all at once, and if you're low and don't switch in time, that means you have to try the entire fight again. All of these annoyances combined with the blown out bloom effects and the projectile spam made this one of the most stress inducing final bosses in the entire series for me, but I did eventually beat it, and that leads us to the final cutscene. Sonic and Elise are brought to the past, before Solaris was ever released. They have the opportunity then and there to prevent all of this from ever happening, but this will mean that neither of them will have any memory of each other. Elise is hesitant to do this, even going so far as to say she doesn't care about the rest of the world. Okay, wow, that's kind of terrible, but Sonic convinces her to do it, and she blows out Solaris' flames, symbolizing Sonic Team wishing that this whole mess never happened. 
While Project 06 has given plenty of fans a false impression of what Sonic 06 really was, I also want to acknowledge that there are people who exist who actually have played the original game and enjoy it. To all of those people, whether you like the game despite its flaws or because of them, I respect you. If this game is a comfort place to you, then the game did its job for at least a few people in this world. But just because the game is enjoyable to you doesn't mean that you have an obligation to defend its honor. It's okay to enjoy a bad game, even unironically, but to claim that Sonic Sonic 06 was a hidden masterpiece all this time? I'm sorry, but I just can't defend that. This game is every bit of the awful mess that critics say it is. Heck, maybe even more. But the lack of polish is far from the only issue that it has. This game is flawed from a design standpoint too, and I'd argue that the only way to fix Sonic 06 would be to make a different game entirely. But more importantly, this game is the reason that Sonic has had such a bumpy history ever since. Because of its critical failure, Sonic Team learned the wrong lessons, thinking that the adventure formula just wasn't working anymore and has been trying to reinvent the wheel with every game game since 06. While it's an honorable effort to try and right the wrongs of this game, in the end it's important that we never forget what it ultimately did to the franchise. Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 destroyed a beloved icon, and he still has yet to recover, even today. Whatever you do, don't blink. Go! Feel a rush like no other. Choose your path in a race that spans the globe. Well, this is new. But when night falls, <laughs> unleash your powers. Prepare yourself for a new Sonic adventure where the difference is night and day. Go! Sonic Unleashed. Rated E10 for ages 10 and up. Game and system sold separately. Sonic Unleashed released in 2008 for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Nintendo Wii, and PlayStation 2. It was a major turning point in the series when the formula was drastically changed after the damage that Sonic 06 wrought upon the franchise. When the game initially launched, its critical reception was largely poor, with critics lamenting the slow, sluggish Werehog stages while praising the high-octane boost stages. Over the years, though, Sonic Unleashed has developed a sort of cult following, with some fans even claiming that it's the best game in the entire series. So what do I think? Well, spoiler alert, it's complicated. Before we begin though, I need to get a few things straight. Firstly, I will not be reviewing the Wii or PS2 versions in this video. This is strictly about the quote-unquote HD version for the Xbox 360 and PS3. Someday down the line I may cover the SD version, but I'm omitting it for this video due to it being so different and not nearly as impactful on the series as a whole. Secondly, I would apologize for the footage quality, but I won't. Why, you may ask? Well, because Microsoft sucks. Or Sega does. I don't know who exactly to blame, but what I do know is that Sonic Unleashed does not have a resolution boost on the Xbox Series X. I don't know why, but it doesn't. I received some comments on my previous video claiming that you can play it in 4K, but I couldn't find anything online to back that up, and my console doesn't give me any option to do so, either because it really doesn't exist or because I haven't sold my soul just to afford a 4K monitor. Either way, the footage in this video is at the original 720p resolution of the Xbox 360. 360 version, with the 60 FPS boost provided by the Series X. I'd say I'm sorry, but I'm not, because quite frankly, it's not my fault that these companies refuse to provide a good way to play their games at a decent resolution. Alright? Okay. And finally, because I know someone is going to comment about this if I don't mention it, yes, I tried using Xenia, but the game kept doing this, so I opted to go the Series X route. Again, not my fault, so I'm not apologizing deal with it. Now, with all that out of the way, this is my review of Sonic Unleashed. Our story begins on the Egg Carrier, where Dr. Eggman is about to break the planet apart with a giant laser. Sonic arrives, turning super and destroying his fleet, but not before Eggman captures him and drains the Chaos Emeralds of their energy. Eggman fires the laser, releasing an ancient entity, Dark Gaia, which turns Sonic into a hairy monster called the Werehog in the process. He's sent plummeting back down to Earth, where he meets a small creature named Chip, who has amnesia because Sonic fell on top of him. Great job, buddy. Together, they set out to restore Chip's memory, stop Eggman, and hopefully repair the planet in the process. If this plot feels familiar, that's probably because it's largely the same concept as an adventure in 06. Eggman awakens a long dormant god of destruction, and Sonic and friends have to stop it. I suppose you could call it tried and true, but I have to admit the concept was starting to wear a little thin by this point. Sonic Unleashed takes on a much lighter tone than its predecessors, with a heavier emphasis on both verbal and slapstick humor. For the most part, I think this works quite well for the game. While later entries would take this to its logical extreme by forcing a dad joke out of Sonic's mouth every five 
five seconds, Unleashed balances its corny humor with some genuine heart and manages a story that I can mostly get behind. With this said though, I do have one issue with it. Unleashed sidelines a majority of Sonic's established supporting cast, which applies to other areas of the game as well, but I'll get to that later. Right now, I want to talk about Tails, because his character seems to have been altered in order to keep him from getting too involved. His only role in the game is to get Sonic from point A to point B in his plane, and sometimes provide intel. While previous games continued his development established in Sonic Adventure, Tails in Unleashed is notably more cowardly. Early on in the game, Sonic is required to save him from Dark Gaia's minions, even though the old Tails wouldn't need any help in this situation. While it doesn't outright ruin the narrative in this case, this characterization would carry over into future games as well, so I feel it's worth mentioning here. Despite my criticisms though, there is plenty of good here as well. I love the way Sonic is portrayed in this game. Even though the cards he's been dealt aren't exactly favorable, he's always giving his all and encouraging Chip to do the same, all while keeping his confident, snarky attitude. This is a really solid rendition of the character, and it's refreshing to see in retrospect compared to how he would be written in later games. And speaking of good characterization, they also nailed Eggman this time around. Granted, he's rarely had any bad portrayals, but it's nice to see him acting like the goofy, egg-shaped mad scientist he is after the boring, vaguely sinister rendition of him we got in 06. He may be a scientific genius, but a wise man he is not. Even his own robots argue with him in this game, and it's hilarious every time. Finally, there's a twist later on in the game where, when Chip finally gets his memory back, it's revealed that he's actually Light Gaia, the entity that's supposed to seal Dark Gaia every few million years. I'll admit it's a bit of a weird twist, but I kind of like it. It shows that even a small, goofy little thing like Chip can hold great power, and I think that's pretty cool. Overall, while I may have my gripes with the story and Unleashed, I'd easily say this is a major improvement from the overly complex and serious plot of 06 and the barely there plot of Heroes. This is more in line with how I feel Sonic stories should be treated. Lighthearted, but with heart nonetheless. This brings us to the cutscenes, along with the presentation as a whole. The game cold opens with one of the most universally praised cutscenes in the entire series, and that goes a long way in making a great first impression. These CGI cinematics are a major highlight when it comes to the visuals of Sonic Unleashed. However, the in-game aesthetics also stand out and are a significant improvement over Sonic 06. This is due to the culmination of a variety of advancements that Sonic Team made in the years leading up to this game's release. See, Sonic Unleashed was the first of many titles to run on the aptly named Head Hedgehog Engine, a proprietary framework with the goal of making levels look as pretty as possible using a combination of real-time and baked lighting. I won't bore you with all the technical details, but some of the highlights are global illumination, real-time shadows interacting with the pre-baked ones on the environments, and some pretty impressive screen space reflections for 2008. Put simply, this game is downright gorgeous, and still holds up thanks to the art direction that coexists with the advanced rendering technology. That said, this did come at a price, that being the game's performance on 7th generation consoles. The Xbox 360 and PS3 versions of Sonic Unleashed have developed kind of a notoriety over the years for their subpar frame rate, rarely reaching their target of 30 FPS. Thankfully I didn't have to deal with that when replaying the game for this review thanks to the Series X, but I thought it was worth mentioning considering that not everyone can even find the dark thing, much less afford it. <coughs> Despite this, Unleashed is easily one of the best looking games in the series, and if this game ever receives a PC port, I think the effort that Sonic Team put into the graphics all those years ago will finally pay off when we can play it in glorious Ultra HD. Fancy lighting aside, Sonic Unleashed also excels at character animation, which you may recall was a bit of a sore spot at prior entries. All the world rejoice, because the awful mocap from Games Past is finally behind us. There's a clear attention to detail that was put into the in-engine cutscenes, and while they don't compare to the absolute cinema that is the CGI FMVs, it's still a heck of an upgrade, and it carries over into the in-game animation as well. This game also sees the Sonic cast redesign once again, bringing the proportions closer to how they were in Heroes while softening up on the sheen. While I'll certainly miss the Genesis-like shine on Sonic and crew, I do think this design ultimately fits the vibe of Unleashed in some of the future entries. My only major problem with this design, nitpicks aside, is how it looks in still renders. When it's in motion, it looks great, but something about the way these are posed just feels stiff. Well, except for this one.
this one's raw. While visuals are an important aspect of presentation, we should also talk about the audio. As is Sonic tradition, Unleashed has a really solid soundtrack, and the various genres it pulls from are always appropriate for the globetrotting theme of the game. When it comes to the voice acting, I'm a little mixed. To start positive, Jason Griffith has improved drastically as Sonic, giving much more varied inflections than in the previous game. Some people don't seem to enjoy the enthusiastic woo sounds that he makes during gameplay, but personally I think it just adds to the fun. I'm less fond of his voice for the Werehog, though I want to stress that this is clearly not Jason's fault. You can tell that he's straining his throat to deliver every line, and while I respect the hustle, I personally think they should have gotten someone else to voice the Werehog. I understand why they didn't, this is the same character, so you want at least a hint of Sonic's normal voice in there, but this unfortunately just seems to be out of Griffith's range, hindering his ability to comfortably act in the role. Otherwise, I think the voice acting in Unleashed is fine. Mike Pollock kills it once again as Eggman, no surprise there, and I also quite like Professor Pickle's voice, but everyone else I could probably take or leave. Chip kinda started to get grading after a while, and the NPC voice actors were clearly just getting their paycheck. When it's all said and done though, Sonic Unleashed pretty much nails its presentation. The environments are gorgeous, the graphics are above par for 2008, the music slaps, and the voice acting is solid where it matters most. And now comes the part where things get messy. I've been very positive about Sonic Unleashed so far, and there's certainly still some more good things to be said, but I've found that my experience with the actual gameplay was rocky, to say the least. To start, let's go over the general structure of the game. While in previous titles we were blessed with the opportunity to play as several side characters, often seeing their own perspectives on the same story, Sonic Unleashed has stripped things down to just the titular hedgehog himself, along with his new alter ego, the Werehog. This is the first of many changes made in response to the negative reception of Sonic 06. While the difference between these two playstyles could not be more stark, there are a few common elements that they share that I should mention. Firstly, hub worlds are brought back once again, this time representing every area in the game. This is because, unlike previous games, which were limited to a few main areas leading to stages that may or may not have followed the theme, Sonic Unleashed focuses on making every location feel like its own country, with unique climates, locals, etc. The variety of environments on display here is pretty impressive, and often takes inspiration from real-life locations as well. Unfortunately, there's not much to do in these hub worlds, and in fact these might just be the smallest out of any Sonic game. The main things you'll be doing are searching for levels in the entrance stage area, talking to locals every so often, and hunting down sun and moon medals, which is another thing I should talk about. These medals are found everywhere, from the hub worlds to the action stages, and a certain amount of them are required to progress to the next batch of levels. Despite the globetrotting theme, you're going to find yourself going back and forth between the different countries fairly often, because the order in which you unlock lock these stages doesn't seem to follow any rhyme or reason. That's not the main issue here though. The real problem is the sheer amount of these medals you're required to collect. You'll be blasting through levels and bosses, having a grand old time, but then the game will slow to a crawl as you realize that you have to go scrounging around for more of these stupid things before you can continue playing the game. I'll go more in depth about those once we get into the individual playstyles, but there's one more thing to mention, and that's experience points. That's right, this game has experience points, and you'll earn them by defeating enemies in the action stages. These can be used to upgrade Sonic's stats for either his Hedgehog or Werehog form. Once again, we'll get more into that in due time. For now, it's time we once again recap my three staples of Sonic excellence. For those of you who are new, these are the basic principles that I look for in a character's playstyle in a Sonic game. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moves set and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, three, the character's central attribute should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Note that these don't necessarily denote a good playstyle period, but rather a baseline that distincts a Sonic game from any other generic platformer. Now, with these in mind, let's get into it. First we have the day stages, where we play as Sonic the Hedgehog in his normal form. And forget everything you knew about 3D Sonic gameplay because we're starting over from square one here. See, a few years before Unleashed, a little game called Sonic Rush for the DS was released, which shook up 2D Sonic gameplay by adding the boost meter, which allowed Sonic to instantly reach top speed and barrel through enemies for as long as the meter wasn't empty. Sonic Team must have seen potential for this formula because now that same boost is here in Sonic Unleashed. How it works is simple, you have a ring energy meter in the bottom left that fills up the more rings you collect. At any time, you can hold the X button to give Sonic a burst of speed, using up that meter. 
The issue I have with this is that it completely replaces the spin dash and any other rolling moves Sonic may have had in the past. Instead of earning your speed through the environment itself and your own skillful play, as long as you have some juice in the boost tank, you can blast through pretty much any part of the stage. With that said though, the last thing I want to call this gameplay style is easy, because it is most certainly not. The thing about completely changing up an established formula is that your game often suffers from what some fellow YouTubers have dubbed first game syndrome. Basically, since you're starting from scratch, your game will inevitably be outclassed by its sequels. This is very much the case with the day stages in Sonic Unleashed. While the game overall is fairly polished, the design of the levels in Sonic's moveset are anything but. First major issue, the handling. Sonic is way too slippery, and combined with the boost, you'll find yourself flying off the stage quite often. Some levels, such as Windmill Isle and Rooftop Run, are designed with side rails to accommodate this, but many others, such as Empire City and Eggman Land, are not, forcing you to forego the boost and awkwardly jog around curves. The game tries to solve this by introducing another new move, the Drift. This is a nice addition on paper, but once again it's ruined by the level design, which just doesn't feel like it's properly designed for it. Sometimes the arc feels too wide, and other times I end up doing an accidental U-turn. This all is combined with several other miscellaneous issues I have with this playstyle, such as the homing attack now being mapped to X, meaning you can accidentally boost when you're just trying to do an air dash, and these pointless quick time events. It just feels like this moveset needed a lot more testing before moving on to level design. That's not to say everything here is bad though, in fact there's a few things I quite like. While the boost is often an agent of chaos in this game, there are times where it delivers on its promise of exhilarating speed in levels such as Cool Ledge and Dragon Road, allowing you to run on top of the water's surface. As much as I'll always prefer the momentum-based approach, moments like these showcase the potential that this style has. Unleashed also introduces sections that switch to a 2.5D perspective, essentially turning the level into a 2D platformer for a brief moment. While the 3D platforming is a nightmare due to the slippery controls, the 2D platforming doesn't suffer here nearly as much, which I suppose makes sense given the origins of the boost. With all of this said, how did the day stages in Sonic Unleashed perform under the three staples of Sonic Excellence? As usual, the first requirement is met with flying colors, as the elements we've come to expect such as rings, springs, loop-de-loops, and robotic enemies are all here. Additionally, the second staple I feel is also met for the most part. As much as I'll lament the unrefined controls and level design, this is all stuff that you'll inevitably learn to work around when replaying these levels. While I haven't S-ranked every single stage in the game, I've replayed Windmill Isle and Cool Edge so many times that I've definitely warmed up to them, and I'm sure the same could be said for the majority of the day stages. However, it all falls apart at requirement number three. I will almost certainly get a lot of flack for this, but I want to remind everyone that this guy's name is Sonic the Hedgehog, not Sonic the Fast. While speed has always been a staple of the series, how that speed is earned is equally important, and rolling downhill to gain momentum was the series standard up until this point. This isn't me calling the boost bad or whatever. As you'll see in the coming months, I actually quite like it in Sonic Color and Sonic Generations. The point of the three staples was never to judge whether or not a game is strictly good, but rather to hold games within the same series to a reasonable standard. If a Sonic game was a reskin of Elden Ring but with Sonic as the player model, it would be a great game but not a good Sonic sequel. And I hate to break it to you, but Sonic Unleashed, for all of its merits, is not a good Sonic sequel. Alright, now that I've signed my death sentence, let's put the final nail in the coffin. I like the night stages. Yeah, I said it. In these stages you play as Sonic the Werehog, a heavier and hairier version of the Blue Blur with stretchy arms and Herculean strength. He moves much slower, so his levels focus more on combat and puzzle platforming. And when it comes to that puzzle platforming, I think the Werehog pretty much nails it. As weird as the stretchy arms are, they're often used in clever ways such as grabbing onto high platform ledges, swinging from bars, and climbing up poles. This combined with the double jump makes for a surprisingly agile moveset for what's meant to be the slower character here. There's a certain flow that you'll eventually reach within these stages, moving blocks to use as platforms, grabbing flying enemies to get extra air, scrounging around for hidden collectibles. Come to think of it, it's kind of a similar feeling to the one I get when I have the dungeon formula in a Zelda game all figured out. With all this said, these stages certainly still have their issues. For one thing, they are long. Like, upwards of 20 minutes long. I get that the Werehog is slow, but if anything, I feel like they could have cut down on the length for that very reason. And the biggest culprit the of this length is also the biggest issue I have with this playstyle, that being the combat. Well, less so the combat itself, but rather the unnecessary amount of it you're subjected 
subjected to. These levels rarely have time to breathe in between strenuous platforming sections before you're faced with another enemy gauntlet, and these start to turn into a chore after a while. What doesn't help is the obnoxious music that interrupts the normal level theme, which makes me internally groan every time I hear it. So how does the Wear Hug perform under the three Sonic staples? Once again, the first requirement is met, no surprise there. When it comes to the second requirement, though, I wasn't sure at first. I mean, replaying these long, combat-filled levels? How fun could that possibly be? Well, as it turns out, a lot more fun than the first time through. First of all, if you're being diligent about leveling up your strength attribute, you'll easily clear enemies in previous stages, allowing you to quickly get over the enemy gauntlets and focus on the platforming. Not only that, but going back and searching for remaining sun and moon medals is surprisingly fun in these levels. As you could probably imagine, this sucks in the day stages, seeing as they're built around blasting through in a straight line, and Sonic handles about as well as me in any social situation. Here though, Though this isn't an issue, and the Werehog's moveset is much better suited for this kind of scavenger hunt. That brings us to the third staple, and the Werehog certainly passes this one. The puzzle platforming takes full advantage of his stretchy arms, and as much as I'm not huge on the combat, it does showcase his strength. Overall, the night stages thoroughly surprised me, and I actually ended up enjoying them more than the normal Sonic levels. Now comes the part where I have to talk about the bosses, which at this point I should probably make another set of staples for, but for now I'll just briefly sum up what I'm looking for. Like I said in the Sonic 06 retrospective, classic Sonic bosses adhere to a simple design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can hit the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. To balance this, they typically had more hit points than your usual platformer enemy, taking around 8 or so hit points to defeat. 3D Sonic has had a hard time adapting this design, if Sonic Team ever even cared cared about doing so in the first place. Will Sonic Unleashed be the one to break the cycle? Well, actually, yes. Kind of. Let's start with the day bosses. These take place on a constantly moving track where the player needs to collect rings and boost towards the enemy and perform a homing attack to deal damage, all while avoiding their opponent's attacks. Although every homing attack will send you back a ways, requiring you to start over, there's seldom any time where the boss isn't technically vulnerable, so it still sort of counts. As for the night bosses, these also fit the bill. They typically require some kind of puzzle to be solved, after which the enemy is made vulnerable and the werehog can beat it up for as long as it is. Deal enough damage and the game will often throw you into a quick time event. Yeah, this game really likes these, but they do allow the player to deal more damage and make quicker work of the boss. Out of all games, to finally figure out how to adapt the classic boss philosophy into 3D, Unleashed would have been my last guess, but here we are. However, all this isn't to say that these are perfect. When it comes to the day bosses, these are mostly fine, but there are a few that I had a hard time with. With the night bosses, though, I was rarely having any fun. The puzzles you have to solve are either painfully obvious or way too obtuse, and the quick time events will fail you if you even make one errant button press, even if it's not a button that the game ever asks for, such as the way too sensitive triggers. Still, these are better than average for 3D Sonic bosses, so credit where it's due, I suppose. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. Sonic and Chip have made it to Eggman Land, the final stretch before they can defeat Eggman and Dark Gaia once and for all. Good lord, this level sucks. Look, I know this isn't a hot take or anything, but not only is Eggman Land way too long, it's also poorly designed on top of that. Switching between day and night Sonic is a neat idea, but neither of their parts of the level are any fun. The day sections hardly have any guardrails, so boosting is pretty much suicide, and the night sections have awful camera angles on top of an overabundance of enemy encounters even by this game's standards. But anyway, after that slog of a level, the Werehog defeats Eggman's final Final mech. The Egg Dragoon and Chip gathers the Chaos Emerald Temples together to build a mech of his own to help defeat Dark Gaia, leading to the final boss. And I'm sorry, but this boss also sucks. Basically, you have to slowly fly across a long stretch as Devastator over here, being careful to either dodge, block, or punch these oncoming meteors, and do a quick time event to hold Dark Gaia off. Once that's done, you play a short section as Day Sonic, do another quick time event, and rinse and repeat this whole thing three times. And sure, three times may not seem that bad, but that's only assuming you're not like me and keep dying to the awful hitboxes on 
on these meteors, or to the abhorrent level design and sonic sections. In total, I probably ended up doing this song and dance more like seven times before I finally got through it all, and it was a chore. Thankfully, the second phase isn't nearly as frustrating. As is series tradition by this point, you play as Super Sonic here and have to defeat these snake things to destroy Dark Gaia's shield. After that, the game relishes in a final quick time event, and our job is finally over. The game ends with Dark Gaia being sealed back into the Earth, Chip bringing Sonic to safety and leaving a small memento to remember him by, the residents of every country we visited celebrating our victory, and finally, the credits. Sonic Unleashed is not a bad game, but I'd also hesitate to call it a good game. There's plenty to love here, of course. The story and cutscenes are charming, the environments are beautiful, and even the much-debated Werehog shines through its puzzle platforming. But by the end of it, I couldn't help but think more about the things I didn't love. Quick time events rearing their ugly head, obnoxious combat that overstayed its welcome, and of course the complete departure from the iconic Sonic formula. More than ever, I can understand why Unleashed is so divisive. For for every awful design decision it makes, it also does something brilliant. For every death from the slippery controls, there's a breathtaking boost sequence. For every annoying enemy encounter, there's a fun puzzle in between. And for every awful quick time sequence, there's an endearing cutscene that shows a genuine passion from Sonic Team to make an experience that, if nothing else, is memorable. And while I won't say that Sonic Unleashed is a good Sonic game, it certainly is, if nothing else, memorable. Sonic, speed test 47. There's fast. And then there's Sonic fast. The high speed hedgehog is back. Zooming across ceilings, drilling through floors, and rocketing into the sky. Sonic colors, faster than a speeding you know what. Available now, rated E for everyone. Sonic Colors, also known as Sonic Colours in the UK, was the first of three Sonic games to launch exclusively on Nintendo systems, releasing in 2010 for the Nintendo Wii. It was met with generally positive reception at launch, and remains one of the highest rated mainline Sonic games to this day. When it comes to the Sonic fanbase though, Sonic Colors has lately been the subject of heavy retrospective criticism, with many blaming it for the problems that the franchise has been facing in modern times. What didn't help was Sega's failed remaster of the game Sonic Colors Ultimate, which has quickly become infamous for being an even worse port than Sonic Adventure DX, which, if you don't know, is saying a lot. But how does the original game hold up? Well, that's what I hope to find out in this video. Before we get into it, I want to take this moment to CELEBRATE that I don't have to apologize for footage quality this time. Thanks to the Dolphin emulator, I was able to get the original game running in 1080p 60fps for your viewing pleasure, and future Sonic games should be even easier since they all have Steam ports. With that in mind, and without further ado, this is my review of Sonic Colors. Like Sonic Unleashed, Sonic Colors opens with a fun CGI intro that shows the story and some of the gameplay mechanics you're about to get yourself into. Unlike Unleashed though, this one lacks any spoken dialogue, with the only audio being the main theme, Reach for the Stars playing at full blast, and honestly, it's great. Enjoy it while you can though, because the cutscenes only go downhill from here. We might as well get this out of the way before we get into the good stuff. The story is easily the worst part of Sonic Colors. Don't get me wrong, the concept is pretty neat. Eggman has built a massive amusement park in outer space as a front for an operation to harness the energy of these aliens, called Wisps, and use it to brainwash the entire world. Sonic and Tails break into the park and set out to stop them. It's a really creative idea, and we'll get more into what it does well in due time, but right now we need to talk about the writing. While previous Sonic games were written and translated in-house at Sega, Sonic Colors handed the writing over to Ken Pontak and Warren Graff, who are probably best known for Happy Tree Friends. Now, I've never watched Happy Tree Friends, but if the writing in that show is anything like how it is in Sonic Colors, I I think I'm going to keep it that way. The dialogue here is clearly intended to be self-aware, but it falls flat on its face on nearly every turn. The humor boils down to a cluster truck of tired comedic tropes, one of the most common being, character says or does thing, other character points out how silly that thing is or sounds, first character agrees, and joke. But even more often, the dialogue delves into outright corny territory with none of that self-awareness present whatsoever. The Baldy McNose hair scene has become infamous for this very reason. It seems an evil man, and you might know him, who they call Baldy Nose Hair. <laughs> Baldy Nose Hair? That's the best thing I've heard all day. I gotta remember that one. Hey, where are you going? To find Baldy McNose Hair, of course. 
<laughs> I'm totally calling him McNose Hair. Another big problem with the writing in Sonic Colors is how it depicts already established characters. It's pretty well known at this point that Pontek and Graf aren't exactly Sonic fans and hardly did any research on the series before being brought on for Sonic Colors. And oh boy does it show. Sonic, while not outright malicious, is kind of a jerk in this game, often taking credit for things Tails accomplishes and making fun of the Wisps in their time of peril. While he ultimately saves the day at the end like any other game, this depiction of Sonic is just annoying to suffer through. Tails hasn't been hit near nearly as bad, but once again, since Sonic 06 failed, Sonic Team was scared to even touch the idea of other playable characters besides Sonic, so Tails is once again relegated to providing intel and presumably helping Sonic with transportation to the amusement park. I'll at least give the writers credit for giving Tails something to do, but it's still not any better than Unleashed. The only character that's been largely untouched by this flanderization is Dr. Eggman, though the desperate attempts at self-referential comedy still seep into his dialogue and it's pretty painful to watch when it happens. I'll harness their hyper go on power and then nothing will stop me. I know I say that every time, but this time really nothing will stop me. <laughs> Most? What? Sonic! Who you call it nothing? <laughs> So we're off to a pretty bad start. The story and writing don't stack up to the well-balanced story of Sonic Unleashed. But thankfully, things get quite a bit better from here, so next let's talk about presentation. Sonic Colors is an amazing looking game for the Wii, sporting a scaled down version of the Hedgehog engine that still manages some decent models, baked in lighting, and post processing effects such as Bloom. While the game only runs at 30 FPS on original hardware, it's at least a consistent 30 FPS, unlike Unleashed, which makes all the difference in the world when it comes to the enjoyability of these games. Something that Unleashed did right was its environment design, and this carries over into Colors. The story, writing aside, sets up a lot of potential for level ideas, and the designers certainly took advantage of. This. From the breathtaking views in Tropical Resort to the beautiful meadows overrun by Eggman's machinery and Planet Wisp, the environments here are consistently pleasing to the eyes, and that's doubly impressive considering the limitations of the Wii. And once again, we have a magnificent soundtrack to accompany these creative stages. The variety of Unleashed, combined with the contemporary sound that composer Tomoya Otani was beginning to introduce in this era, not only passes the bar for a quality Sonic soundtrack, but also gives Sonic Colors a distinct flavor. With all this said, as always, I have my gripes. My first complaint may seem minor, but it is something that would be carried over into future entries, so I feel it demands at least some attention, and that's the animation. The in-game animations are mostly solid, seeing as they're directly ripped from Unleashed, but the cutscenes are pretty consistently meh. The way the characters move feels much stiffer than Unleashed, which had a good understanding of the 12 principles of animation. Meanwhile, Sonic Colors feels like it's doing the bare minimum, especially with facial animation, where the characters tend to only emote with their mouths and eyelids and not their high brows, sucking a lot of life out of otherwise expressive character designs. Side note, for some reason the cutscenes in this game are pre-rendered video files and I really don't understand why. They still use the in-game models and lighting engine, and storing the raw animation itself would have taken much less space on the disc, so yeah, I don't know, just thought it was weird, and a bit of a bummer when playing the game on Dolphin. And now I have to talk about the voice acting. Sonic Colors replaces Jason Griffith with Roger Craig Smith as the voice of Sonic. As for why, my best guess is they wanted a fresh new direction to take the series, and with that came the idea of replacing the main character's voice. Whatever the actual reason may be, Roger ended up becoming a mainstay, still voicing the character in video games to this day. And listen, I understand many people have warmed up to his take on the character, and if you're one of those people, good on you, I'm glad you enjoy it. I am not one of those people. To get one thing straight first, no, I don't hate Roger Craig Smith. In fact, I actually really like his performances in other media, most notably Regular Show, where he made a lot of cameos and even voiced a main character for a while. He's a talented voice actor, and I have nothing but respect for the guy. But I don't think he was the right choice for Sonic the Hedgehog. If Ryan Drummond was to Sonic what Tom Kenny was for Spyro, Roger is like Carlos Alice Racky. His voice for the character, at least in Sonic Colors, tends to come off as bratty and annoying, talking more through his nose than his mouth. When I was running around trashing robots, I saw a map that had a couple of interesting places. I think I'll go check them out. 
and maybe save some aliens. I honestly don't think he's trying to sound grating. In fact, I'm pretty sure he's attempting to emulate how previous voice actors portrayed the character. The thing is, there's a key difference between those guys and Roger in that vocal range. When I hear Ryan in Sonic Heroes or Jason in Sonic Unleashed, I don't feel like I'm listening to some guy trying to sound like Sonic. I feel like I'm hearing Sonic speak in his own voice. But when I hear Roger as Sonic, that's all I can think of, even in recent games, and this guy's been voicing him for over a decade at this point. Now, with all of this said, I want to make it clear that I don't blame Roger for this rendition of Sonic's voice. I know better than that. However, I also see a lot of people blaming the voice directors for how the character speaks, and I feel like that's just as wrong. It's neither the actor's fault nor the director's. Rather, it's the fault of the casting director for picking Roger in the first place. Yell at me in the comments all you want, but there's a reason Samuel L. Jackson is Nick Fury and not Black Widow, and I feel a similar way about Roger Craig Smith as Sonic the Hedgehog. I I swear I like this game. Mike Pollock is amazing as usual, yada yada yada, let's move on. I had my fair share of grievances with the day stages in Sonic Unleashed. The handling was slippery, the moveset felt unpolished, the level design had a lot of annoying moments, and of course the boost completely replaced Sonic's most iconic move. Despite that, this gameplay style did have potential, and Sonic Colors was the game to prove that. Before we get into it, I'd like to note that I won't be comparing this gameplay style to my three Sonic staples. The reason for this is very simple. It performs exactly the same as Sonic Unleashed did. So if you really want to know my thoughts on how well it fits the criteria of a Sonic gameplay style, go watch my Unleashed review and come back here when you're done. As for the rest of you, let's continue. Sonic Colors is functionally similar to the day stages in Unleashed, but makes various tweaks, big and small, both to polish up the existing formula and to accommodate the Wii Remote, which has significantly less buttons than its 7th generation contemporaries. To start, Sonic Colors massively improves Sonic's handling, and that's made crystal clear from the get-go. While he doesn't have the refined control of the adventure games, i.e. you're more so steering Sonic than controlling him, the turning is much tighter and Sonic doesn't slip around nearly as much as he did in Unleashed. Alongside this are some seemingly minor changes to his moveset that make a huge difference in practice, such as the double jump which makes the platforming much easier. The air dash is still mapped to the boost button, but the homing attack is back to being the same as the jump button, as it rightfully should be, so you're much less likely to accidentally boost this time around. But changes to the moveset will only get you so far, and that's where the level design comes in. Thankfully, this is also drastically improved for the grand majority of stages, albeit with some compromises. Sonic Colors focuses less on 3D platforming and more on straight corridors and 2D platforming. This is something that people often criticize the game for, but personally, I think this was the best decision they could have made for this gameplay style. The thing about Boost Sonic is that he's not very good at 3D platforming, what with his short jump and unruly handling. On the other hand, he excels at 2D platforming, since turning becomes a non-issue. The compromise I speak of here is that Sonic Colors relies more heavily on scripted sequences. While you were in control of Sonic most of the time in Unleashed, Colors reins you in for many sections, essentially playing itself for a short time. While this does provide some neat spectacle with no input required by the player, I will admit it's a bit jarring and even unnecessary at times. Still, when it comes to boost Sonic, I'd take this over Unleashed any day. Of course, we can't forget the colors in Sonic Colors, that being the Wisps, which give Sonic special color powers when collected. There's a few unique Wisps per zone, and when you beat the first level that you encounter one of these, they'll populate previous stages, allowing you to take new paths when you replay them. A lot of these are super cool, such as the Drill Wisp, which allows you to tunnel through the ground, the Cube Wisp, which toggles these blocks, allowing for some interesting puzzles, and the Frenzy Wisp, which turns Sonic into a monster that gets bigger with every enemy or object that it destroys. That said, there's also some not-so-cool wisps, though thankfully they're not used nearly as often. My least favorites are the Hover Wisp, which slows the pacing of the level down to a crawl, and the Spike Wisp, which teases you by giving Sonic a spin dash only to take it away when the color power runs out. Sonic Rush proved that the spin dash can coexist with the boost, so I don't understand why this had to be a color power instead of one of Sonic's base moves, but whatever. Despite these few duds, the Wisps overall are a nice addition and offer plenty of opportunities for creative level design that the game more than takes advantage of. There's one more thing to talk about before we move on to the bosses, and that's the world map. Yep, this is the first mainline Sonic game, handhelds notwithstanding, to feature world maps instead of hub worlds. I suppose this streamlines the gameplay, but I have to admit it's a little disappointing after Unleashed, which had loads of interesting hub worlds. But either way, the main thing I want to talk about is how linear these world maps are. Now, 
Sonic's never been known for non-linear progression, and it's certainly not something I've come to expect from the series, but what this means for Sonic Colors is that you're required to beat every level in the game. This isn't a huge issue, but not all of the levels here are winners, meaning you'll have to sit through at least a few stages that, at best, are on par with those mediocre optional acts in Unleashed. Again, not a huge deal, and most of the worst levels are fairly short, but it just goes to show how much they were struggling to fill this game with substantial content. In fact, Colors is one of the shorter 3D Sonic games being easily finished in about 4 hours. Am I complaining? No, not really, especially after Heroes, 06, and Unleashed, which were way longer than they had any right to be. However, I do find it weird that we've gone from games that had plenty of content already, only to needlessly pad themselves out anyway, to games that can barely reach a decent length despite the padding. But I've rambled long enough, so now let's move on to the bosses. Like I've said in past videos, classic Sonic bosses set themselves apart from other platformers with a simple design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can damage the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. In my eyes, Sonic Unleashed was the first 3D Sonic game to nail this approach, with previous games fumbling in various areas. How does Sonic Colors fare? Well, for the most part, pretty good. Several of these fights take after the day bosses in Unleashed, having you chase after the boss on a spline and hitting it when you get close enough. Colors further improves on this formula by allowing the player to deal multiple homing attacks before being sent back, and sometimes granting color powers to deal even faster damage. However, this isn't the only type of boss you'll encounter in this game, and the other ones don't follow the classic philosophy nearly as well. One of these, being the first kind you're introduced to, puts Sonic in a circular arena with the boss sitting in the middle, requiring you to either platform or use wisps to attack. This is a cool idea, and actually takes advantage of Sonic's momentum unlike the main levels, but it's way too easy, only taking three hits. The the last kind of boss you'll be facing is a bit more complicated, having you platform to a switch that brings you into a large arena where you need to chase after your opponent. This is executed really well, though not under Sonic conventions, seeing as it only allows you to deal hits one at a time. To summarize, Sonic Colors has a few great bosses, a few mediocre bosses, and another few that, while well designed by their own merits, don't meet the criteria of a Sonic boss. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. Thanks to some negligence by his robots early on in the game, Eggman's mind control laser backfires, and now the whole amusement park is set to implode on itself. It's now a race to safety and probably one of the coolest level ideas in the whole series. Terminal Velocity. It's a pretty straightforward level, but the sheer spectacle of Sonic running towards Earth from space is just plain awesome, and a pretty refreshing finale after Unleashed in 06 pretty much just recycled Sonic Adventure's finale with varying degrees of success. Along the way though, Sonic runs into Eggman, who has harnessed the power of the Wisps to build the Nega Wisp Armor, with the sole purpose of destroying Sonic. I guess if he's not gonna conquer the world, destroying his arch nemesis is the next best thing, right? This leads us to the final boss, which is also a step up from the previous few games. Eggman's now harnessing the same color powers that you've been using throughout the game, so it's a pretty clever way to turn the formula on its head. The boss itself also doesn't make me want to bash my skull into my brain, so that's a plus. Anyway, after defeating the Wisp Armor, Sonic's still got to get down to Earth, but before he can, the amusement park finally implodes, sucking Sonic in. Thankfully, the Wisps bring him down to safety, so Sonic finally gives both them and Tails some actual credit for once, and the credits roll. This is normally where I'd end this section of the video, but I want to take a second to appreciate the fact that they made the credits playable in this game. As far as I know, no other game in the main series ever did this again, and it's a really nice touch. Sonic Colors definitely isn't perfect. The writing leaves a lot to be desired, not all of the levels hit the bullseye, and it certainly lacks content when compared to its predecessors. Not only that, but the game also continues the boost mechanic and leaves behind the rolling mechanics that made Sonic so special in the first place. But that only matters so much when the game also manages to do so many things right. The level design is excellent for the most part, the wisps are implemented in clever ways, the environments and soundtrack are gorgeous, and while it may not be a perfect Sonic sequel, it is a fantastic follow-up to Sonic Unleashed, fixing a majority of issues that game had. Overall, while it may not be my preferred kind of Sonic game, it's a great game regardless, and it ultimately proved what the boost formula was capable of. There's only one thing cooler than Sonic. Two Sonics. In a time-bending thriller so big it will take two to take it on. 
Double the Sonics means double the adventure. Two ways to play. Twice the fun. Sonic Generations. Pre-order for bonus content at GameStop. Ready to eat for everyone. Sonic Generations released in 2011 for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC as a celebration of Sonic's 20th anniversary. It was met with critical acclaim, and it's not hard to see why. This is the one Sonic game that pretty much everyone loves, and I am no exception to that fact. From the polished gameplay to the awesome soundtrack to the heaps of fan service, there's a lot here for Sonic fans, both new and old. And while games like Colors and Unleashed may be looked back on less fondly these days, Generations continues to resonate with its audience. So what made this game so special? Well, let's find out. This is my review of Sonic Generations. Unlike most of its predecessors, Sonic Generations throws you immediately into the first level, Green Hill Zone, just like the original game on Genesis. Here we're playing as a much younger Sonic, which the game refers to as Classic Sonic. After we beat this stage, a mysterious entity emerges, after which we immediately cut to the present, where an older Sonic, referred to as Modern Sonic, is having a birthday party with his friends. This doesn't last long though, as that same entity appears in the present and kidnaps everyone. Sonic awakens in an empty white void, and the game begins proper. Along the way, he meets Classic Sonic, and the two set out to collect the Chaos Emeralds and figure out what the heck that monster actually is. It's a decent setup for a time-spanning adventure, not really developing characters or fleshing out established lore, and that's fine with me. The story may not be as present as past games, but after Sonic Colors, I can live with that. Unfortunately, the writing continues to be pretty bad, as Sega has once again brought on Pontac and Grav for the script. The attempts at fourth wall humor are less frequent, but the dialogue is still pretty pathetic, with the bulk of it being characters verbally describing things that are already self-evident. To give some credit, the writing does have its moments. One little touch that I can appreciate is that if you rescue a character as classic Sonic, they'll react in different ways, asking if he's got a haircut or commenting about his younger appearance. It's a small thing, but it's cool nonetheless. While the story and generations may be lacking in most areas, its less demanding presence makes it easy to ignore and instead focus on what truly makes this game so good. That brings us to the presentation. Since it runs on the Hedgehog engine and isn't being limited by Wii hardware, Sonic Generations is one of the prettiest Sonic games to date, and if you're playing on PC, you'll have no trouble running the game in full HD at 60fps. This puts the game a step above Unleashed, which to this day still doesn't have a PC port. The environments are also gorgeous, taking various locations from previous games and transitioning them into an art style that most closely resembles Unleashed, and it works amazingly. The vibrant colors, detailed textures, and strong art direction are what boosts Sonic Generations to new heights in this regard, not just the resolution and frame rate. The audio is also great, to absolutely no one's surprise. Much like the levels themselves, the soundtrack is a greatest hits collection of some of the most iconic songs in Sonic's catalog, and they're all remixed too. I'll get more into this when we talk about gameplay, but I just love the concept for this game. You play as both classic and modern Sonic, with each having their own versions of every zone, and the music and visuals reflect that. It's just so cool blasting through Green Hill as modern Sonic and rolling through Rooftop Run as classic Sonic. I mean, what other game franchise could have possibly pulled this off? This was perfect for a series like Sonic. Now, with all of this said, no game is perfect, and when it comes to presentations, Sonic Generations has one small flaw. Roger Craig Smith. Okay, that sounds mean. I talked more about my thoughts about Roger Craig Smith's rendition of Sonic's voice in my Sonic Colors retrospective, but to put it simply, I never liked it. The voice simply doesn't match the character it's coming out of, at least in my opinion. However, it hits much harder here in Generations, and that's because we actually almost had Ryan Drummond back. No, I'm not kidding. Roger Craig Smith wasn't ever meant to be the long-term voice of the character. He was just a stand-in until Sega could get the original VA back. In fact, Ryan had re-auditioned for the role in 2010, and Sega was about to bring him on for generations. So, what happened? Well, this is the part of the story that makes my blood boil. Sega would let Ryan return if he left his union. And with all the strikes going on right now, I probably don't need to tell you why that was such a slap in the face. And understandably, Ryan declined. It was back to Roger then, and even to this day, he still voices the character in video games. The rest of the voice cast in this game isn't particularly stand out, aside from Eggman being voiced by the legendary Mike Pollock as always. It's only Sonic's voice that really bothers me. Thankfully, Sonic Team opted to not have classic talk. Could you imagine Roger's voice coming out of this guy? I can't believe there's two of me. Introducing Pizza Hut's new ultimate stuffed crust pizza. With tons of toppings and cheese baked right into the crust, it's unlike anything you've ever- SHUT YOUR PIE HOLE!
With story and presentation covered, it's time to talk about gameplay. The progression of Sonic Generations is sort of a hybrid between Unleashed and Colors. There is a hub world, but it's 2D and is used more so as a level select. Progression is largely linear, though occasionally you'll need to complete a few challenge stages before you can continue. Unlike Colors though, which forced you to play every single one of these, Generations mercifully only requires one per zone. One flavor of these is the doppelganger race, which I tended to gravitate towards seeing as it's basically just playing the level again and that fits pretty well with Sonic's get-good design philosophy anyway. That said, I did try some of the other kinds during this playthrough, and while some were pretty mediocre, a lot of them actually surprised me with how competent they were. The real meat of this game though is the main zones, which are all returning stages from previous games with brand new layouts and graphics. These are complete reimaginings and feature two acts, one for classic and one for modern. Before we get into those, I should quickly recap my three staples of Sonic excellence. For those of you who are new, these are the basic basic principles that I look for in a character's playstyle in a Sonic game. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, 3. The character's central attributes should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Note that these don't necessarily denote a good playstyle period, but rather a baseline that distincts a Sonic game from any other generic platformer. Now, with these in mind, let's get into it. Since this is the 3D Sonic Marathon, let's start with Modern Sonic. The boost gameplay from Unleashed in Colors has returned once again, and it has never been better than it is here, before or since. The refined handling from Colors carries over, while the drift and sidestep can now be activated any time like in Unleashed. The drift itself is also much tighter, and the levels have guardrails this time, so you won't find yourself flying off the stage like before. The one thing I can definitively say is worse than Colors is the lack of a double jump, but it's not anything you can't get used to. To. The air dash and homing attack are both mapped to the jump button like in the adventure games, so platforming still feels as natural as can reasonably be when it comes to this gameplay style. That brings us to the level design, and once again, this simply has never been better. You can tell the level designers have mastered their craft during the time developing Unleashed in Colors, as pretty much every gripe I had with those games has been ironed out entirely. Like Colors, Generations focuses more on straight hallways, sidestep sections, and 2D platforming, as opposed to the awkward 3D platforming and quick time events that plague the day stages in Unleashed. These levels more resemble Rooftop Run or Tropical Resort than they do Empire City or Sweet Mountain, if you catch my drift. So, how well does Modern Sonic and Generations stack up against the three staples? Well, the first staple is unsurprisingly met, seeing as rings, loop-de-loops, robotic enemies, and other iconic elements of the Sonic series are present in these levels. The second requirement is also met. These levels are some of the most fun to replay, and they're the reason that I have so many hours in this game despite its relatively short length. The only thing that Hertz replayability is the ranking system, which unfortunately is way too generous with S ranks, but beating your times and scores is still fun despite this. But as is the fatal flaw with the boost, point number three is where modern Sonic stumbles. Despite Sonic Rush proving that rolling and spin dashing can coexist with the boost, Sonic Generations continues the tradition of ignoring the trademark of Sonic species and focusing entirely on raw speed. As we'll see later on, this engine is perfectly capable of good Sonic physics, so it's a bit of a bummer that this element of the series' gameplay has continued to be neglected in 3D. As I've said time and time again though, not meeting these staples doesn't automatically make a playstyle bad from a pure gameplay standpoint, and Modern Sonic is an absolute blast in Generations despite only meeting two of them. If you liked Unleashed in Colors, you will love Modern Sonic in Generations. This is the best the boost formula has ever been, and ever will be. There are so many ways that they could have screwed up classic Sonic. Heck, we've seen them since then. And yet, against all odds, Sonic Team managed to pull through here. Like the Genesis games, classic Sonic's gameplay consists of 2D platforming with an emphasis on building speed by rolling downhill, allowing the player to run up walls, across ceilings, and around loop-de-loops. The parameters of these physics aren't 100% accurate to those games, the jump is a little floatier, the acceleration is a little slower, and the spin dash is way more powerful. However, that doesn't matter a 
whole lot as long as Sonic's still fun to control, and he most certainly is here. Classic Sonic's moveset is fully taken advantage of through the level design, another element that's easy to get wrong. Thankfully, that's not the case, and Classic Sonic's stages are worthy of their legacy, with multiple routes that reward skillful play and offer new experiences for return playthroughs. We also have power-ups in these stages, something we haven't seen since 06. Speed shoes, invincibility, shields… if they are in the classics, they're probably here too, and help further the retro feel of these levels. As you may have already surmised, Classic Sonic aces the Sonic gameplay test with flying colors. The stages feature all the iconic staples we've come to expect, the level design encourages mastery through repeat playthroughs, and at long last, the emphasis on rolling into a ball to build up and maintain momentum has returned to a 3D Sonic game, even if only in a 2D setting. Classic Sonic coming back was a huge deal back when this game came out, and to this day it's still fun to return to these stages, even with games like Mania releasing since. Much like the main stages, the bosses in Sonic Generations are all returning battles from previous entries. We've got character battles with Metal Sonic, Shadow, and Silver, and full-on bosses with the Death Egg Robot, Perfect Chaos, and the Egg Dragoon. All of these battles carry over the same love and polish present in the action stages, especially Perfect Chaos which feels even more epic than his debut in Sonic Adventure. Like I've said in past videos, classic Sonic bosses set themselves apart from other platformers with a simple design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can damage the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. Unleashed and Colors both use this philosophy, but unfortunately, this is where I have to give Generations a little bit of flack. Don't get me wrong, the bosses in Generations are super fun, but virtually all of them are designed in such a way where you can only hit the boss once while it's vulnerable, after which the cycle starts over, much like a Mario boss. This isn't an inherently bad way of designing bosses, but the early Sonic games had a more satisfying way of designing them that I wish the later games would take better advantage of. In a way, this reminds me of Sonic Adventure 2. That game also rarely adhered to the classic boss design philosophy, and yet, despite this, many of them were fun and memorable fights. Ultimately, the appeal of Sonic games doesn't hinge much on their boss design, and 3D Sonic especially has always had a bit of a rough time getting them right, so it's not the end of the world that Generations doesn't have these particular kinds of battles. They're still fun in their own right, and pay homage to previous encounters in other meaningful ways. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. The two Sonics have gathered all of the Chaos Emeralds, allowing them to open a portal to face the Time Eater, the mysterious entity that caused this mess. As it turns out, Eggman has stumbled upon this thing in outer space shortly after the events of Sonic Colors, and harnessed its powers somehow. Yeah, this plot really does seem like an afterthought. But we don't have time to deal with plot holes, because now the Sonics have to go super and destroy the Time Eater once and for all. Unfortunately, Sonic's friends are here to help as well. Yes, I said unfortunately, because they won't shut up. Aside from the annoying dialogue though, the Time Eater is a pretty solid final boss, at least on the PC version. I think the frame rate on the console releases might have some kind of effect on this fight, since I do remember having a much harder time with this on PS3. Let me know if I'm right in the comments. But anyway, this fight has the Time Eater phasing between dimensions, requiring you to switch between Sonics to continue to close the distance. Once you do, simply boost into him, rinse and repeat a few times, and the fight is done so. The game ends with everything returning to how it was, and Sonic saying his goodbyes to his past self before he returns to Blast Processing Land. Hey Sonic! Enjoy your future! It's gonna be great! While the credits are playable, like in Colors, they do once again have a fun twist. The music is a medley of all the stage themes we've heard throughout the game, in the same style as the credits music in Sonic 1, along with a low picture-in-picture -picture featuring footage from previous mainline entries. This truly is a fitting way to end a celebration of Sonic's anniversary. Sonic Generations is a phenomenal Sonic game. It not only perfects the boost gameplay, but also reintroduces the series' iconic original formula in the form of classic Sonic. The levels are brilliantly designed, paying homage to past entries while still offering a fresh experience, and the presentation continues to age gracefully thanks to a strong art direction and a curated selection of the very best music from games past. Certainly, it's not a perfect game. Modern Sonic still lacks any semblance of the rolling mechanics that classic has, and the 
story leaves much to be desired. However, if that's the worst I can say about this game, I think it's safe to say that it's earned its place among the ranks of Sonic 3 and Knuckles and Sonic Adventure 2. This was a wonderful celebration of the past, and it made Sonic fans around the world optimistic about the future. He's always been fast. Very fast. But now Sonic's got some smoking new moves. And he'll need them all to defeat the Deadly Six. Sonic Lost World. Burning up on Wii U and Nintendo 3DS. Ready D10 for ages 10 and up. Game and system sold separately. Sonic Lost World was the second entry in a series of Nintendo-exclusive Sonic games released in 2013 on the Wii U and 3DS, and later ported to PC in 2015. Despite Sonic Colors and Generations having perfected a new winning formula after the adventure style died with 06, Sonic Team decided to go a whole new direction, with the goal of appealing to Nintendo fans. Sonic Lost World is probably one of the least talked about Sonic games these days, being sort of a black sheep, much like Sonic Heroes. However, I'm of the belief that this game was the root cause of many problems that Sonic faces in modern games. How, you may ask? Well, that's what I hope to answer in this video. Before we begin, though, I do want to make one thing clear. This review is based on my experience with the PC version of the game on Steam. I am well aware that there's a lot of significant differences on 3DS, but as is the case with my other videos, I want to focus on the version that most significantly impacted the mainline series as a whole. Now then, without further ado, this is my review of Sonic Lost World. Upon starting a new game, we're already right in the action with a CGI cutscene, much like Sonic Unleashed. Sonic and Tails are chasing after Eggman in the tornado, which ends up leading them to the Lost Hex, an entire planet that apparently just exists in the sky for some reason. Kind of like Little Planet from Sonic CD, I guess. As the game progresses, we meet the Zeddy, more specifically a group of them called the Deadly Six, who Eggman was mind-controlling with a magic seashell. Don't ask us, never explain. Sonic sees Eggman using this and knocks it out of his hand, setting the Zeddy free. This quickly backfires, and now Sonic, Tails, and Eggman have to work together to stop the Zeddy from using Eggman's tech to suck all of the life out of Sonic's world. While having different villains besides Eggman isn't a foreign idea to the Sonic series, Lost World takes a slightly different approach, having the Zeddy be the primary threat for the majority of the experience, as opposed to saving them for the final boss. Unfortunately though, that's about as creative as this game gets when it comes to story. Despite them being proven to have no idea how to make Sonic stories, Pontac and Graf return once again as as the writers for Lost World, meaning the dialogue and characterization is as awful as ever. Tails has been butchered especially hard to make this story work, with him and Sonic getting into forced conflicts that don't end up having any real consequences. I trust you, Tails. It's just that- No you don't. You trust Eggman more. You know how much that bites? I do trust you, Tails, but the whole world's in danger because I did something stupid. Do you know how much that bites? Actually, nothing bites more than having to listen to this dreadful conversation. <laughs> And if there's any characters that got hit the hardest by this awful writing, it's definitely the Deadly Six. All of these are stock characters, two-dimensional planks of wood with personalities that can be narrowed down to singular adjectives. Evil, crazy, old, depressed, fat, vain. What's made even worse is that despite them being hyped up as the main threats, they end up amounting to little by the end, though we'll have to talk about that later. That's what really drives me crazy about the story in Lost World. There's a lot of cutscenes, but there's not a whole lot of story, so the whole thing is kind of a nothing burger. It wants so badly for you to care, and yet puts no effort in creating interesting scenarios or raising the stakes to make you care. Sonic's world is in danger, but it's hard for me to give a shit when it's represented by a generic grassy field as opposed to iconic areas that I've seen in previous games. Sonic and Tails' friendship is suggested to be in jeopardy, but the conflict is clearly forced and I already know it's going to work out in the end. Eggman working with Sonic is played up like it's something that's never happened before despite the fact that it did in Sonic Adventure 2. If there's any game that was hit hardest by Pontac and Graf's ignorance, it's Lost World. But are these cutscenes presented nicely at least? Well, aside from the intro, not really. We once again have the stiff, minimum effort animation that plagued colors and seeped into generations, and it's at full force here. Not only that, but a majority of these cutscenes are still pre-rendered, despite using the in-game engine, leading to loss of quality and a lower frame rate with no benefit. The voice acting has at least maintained the status quo from colors and generations, though that's not really much of a compliment. Sonic still sounds like Roger Craig Smith doing a half-hearted impression 
progression, so there's not much for me to add there that I haven't already said. The Deadly Six are definitely casted well, but since they're so stereotypical, I seriously doubt that was much of a challenge. Mike Pollock is great as Dr. Eggman, as always, though for some reason his mic quality seems to be lower than everyone else's, and it's really distracting. It kind of reminds me of his Xbox Live mic from Adventure 2. What are you doing? Get going! Bring me the Chaos Emeralds! But while the cutscenes aren't anything to write home about, the overall presentation in Lost World is actually pretty solid. The art style is a bit different from Generations, using more solid colors and simple shapes, which I assume was to make it look closer to the Genesis games. I do think it ended up looking less Sonic-y this way, since the environments tend to use more rounded shapes as opposed to the sharp geometry present in the classics, but I can't deny that it looks pleasant nonetheless. The in-game animation is also solid, especially for Sonic himself. In fact, and I can't believe I I'm saying this, this might just be the best that Sonic has ever been animated in a 3D game. The 12 principles of animation are applied excellently, especially when it comes to exaggeration and squash and stretch. Sonic has never felt so bouncy and alive, and it's something that I wish would have carried over into future entries. I've been very positive about the presentation so far, and that's because Lost World genuinely is a good looking game, especially considering it was targeting Wii U hardware. All of this said though, I have a lot of problems with it beyond just the general style. Firstly, while the overall art style is new, the designs of Sonic and company have remained stagnant, using more or less the same models from Unleashed. I'm not trying to say that these are awful or anything, but it would have been nice to have new looks for these characters that complement the change in a aesthetic. I also don't really like the character designs for the Zeddy, they just scream Nickelodeon rejects to me. However, that's far from my biggest complaint, that being the environments. While they look pleasing enough, these are some of the most creatively bankrupt ideas I've ever seen in a Sonic game. Grass World, World, Desert World, Snow World, Volcano World, they're all the same level archetypes you'd see in the new Super Mario Bros. games, which feels weird to pull from, especially considered that this is supposed to be a brand new world, and in a Sonic game no less. Even weirder is that this supposed brand new environment looks much closer to how I'd expect Sonic's world to look, while Sonic's actual world is a unity field with Minecraft trees. What the heck happened with the art direction here? And finally, because I just love making people mad, let's talk about that soundtrack. No, I don't think it's bad. Actually, a grand majority of the music is quite pleasant and well composed. However, it's just as if not more generic than the level aesthetics themselves. A great example of this is the Desert Ruins theme. Now, in a game say like Sonic Unleashed, world instruments were used to fit the inspiration of their environment. The Arid Sands level used sitars and other such instruments to achieve a Middle Eastern feel because that area was inspired by the Middle East. But then you have Desert Ruins in Sonic Lost World. This level Level's theme also uses sitars, not because the level has a Middle Eastern influence that motivates the instrument choice, but because it was the most generic, straightforward, and obvious deserty instrument they could think of. That can be said of most music here. Beach level? Use bongos and steel drums. Snow level? Pull out those sleigh bells and accordions. None of it is awful, but it feels like the composers took the easiest route possible with the soundtrack as opposed to getting creative like they did with past games. Overall, while the presentation in Sonic Lost World is easy on the eye, and ears, it fails to be inventive with its environments and soundtrack. So, now it comes down to gameplay, and as far as playstyles go, we just have the one and only Blue Blur himself, much like in colors. So, let's compare Sonic's gameplay to my three staples of Sonic excellence. For those of you who are new, these are the basic principles that I look for in a character's playstyle in a Sonic game. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, three, the character's essential attribute should be important. By essential attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Note that these don't necessarily denote a good playstyle period, but rather a baseline that distincts a Sonic game from any other generic platformer. Now, with these in mind, let's get into it. Sonic Lost World retains absolutely none of the movement code from Generations, as far as I can tell, using an entirely new player controller with all new rules. That's because Lost World takes a very different approach to its gameplay than any of the previous Sonic games. Let's start with the basic handling. Sonic has no momentum to speak of, and no, I don't just mean the pinball physics from the classics, I mean basic horizontal momentum in general. If I had to compare this to any previous Sonic game, I'd say it most resembles 06. Doing pretty much anything slows Sonic 
down, whether that's jumping, attacking, or any of the other various parkour moves this game introduces. So, if Sonic doesn't have momentum, how do you control his speed? Well, one of the many, many pages that Lost World takes out of Mario's book is the run button. That's right, this is a Sonic game with a run button mapped to the right trigger, and you're probably going to be holding that sucker down for the grand majority of the game, because Sonic's normal walking speed is abysmally slow. All of this is already a bad start, but trust me, we're just getting started. Not only does Sonic lack the basic momentum needed for a smooth gameplay feel, he's also locked to eight directions and moves slower diagonally than he does in the four cardinal directions. I can only assume that this was done to prevent the player from constantly flying off of the atypical level geometry, but I don't think this would have been a problem had Sonic controlled like how he did in the adventure games, or at least how Mario does in a typical game. But anyway, Lost World's main gimmick is the drastically expanded moveset, and this is one area where the trailers weren't wrong. Sonic has never had as many moves as he does in Lost World, for better or worse. Sonic can double jump again, though it barely helps considering how little speed you have to work with by the time you're airborne. He also has two homing attacks, one that charges over time to deal more damage, and one that drops kicks the target, usually reserved for breaking defenses or kicking enemies into each other. While these new applications of the concept are interesting, I feel that having two homing attacks on separate buttons is unnecessarily confusing. They could have just combined these into one homing attack that can do all of these things, and little of value would have been lost. The spin dash of all things also returns, though it functions more so as a wimpy replacement for the boost. You use the left trigger to activate it, and it ended up being my default for basic traversal, since there's not many disadvantages to using it over the basic run, unless you're doing tight platforming. I guess I'll give Sonic Team some credit for bringing this back, but it doesn't even remotely resemble how it should function. But what about new moves? Well, there's a few, but the wall run is easily the most prominent. This is activated whenever you jump into a wall, and will essentially lock you in one direction until Sonic either climbs up or falls off. You can also jump out of it, though for reasons we'll get into later, this ended up being more frustrating than fun. Something that really irritated me throughout the course of this game was the inconsistency when it came to the moveset. If there's one rule that's been consistent through virtually the entire series, it's that if Sonic is in ball form, he will damage enemies. The classics did it this way, the adventure games did it, the boost games did it, heck, even 06 did it. And yet, Lost World is strangely ignorant of this staple. There were many times where I was clearly in a spin dash, hit an enemy, and took damage anyway. Even if the developers were going for something entirely new, basic principles of Sonic design like this need to be upheld if they wanted to appeal to existing Sonic fans, and as we'll see later on, Lost World fails to do this constantly. That brings us to the level design, clearly taking inspiration from Super Mario Galaxy. When the game isn't employing 2D platforming, you'll be running around cylinders, tubes, and of course spheres, all with their own gravity. I reckon this probably motivated the decision to forego the existence of Sonic's physics in this game, however much I may disagree with it. Then again, maybe inspiration is the wrong word to use here. I think a better word would be parroting, because while this game loves to shamelessly copy Mario Galaxy's general concept, it doesn't really retain anything that actually made that game fun. Because there's only so much you can really do with a Sonic that doesn't have Sonic physics, the levels tend to get very gimmicky very often, many of them employing their own gameplay styles that are almost entirely disconnected from the core. Some of my least favorites of these include Monkey Ball But Bad. Flappy Bird but bad, Pinball but it's mandatory and your only prize is not dying, Metal Gear but bad. I'd be lying if I said all of these were bad though. In fact, there's two in particular that I actually quite like. One is the Honeycomb Highway level, which aside from a few short sections and other levels, is the only part of the game that really feels fast. It essentially plays like the mock speed sections in 06, but much more fair. I wish the game explored this concept more. Speaking of missed potential, there's also the rail grinding levels, of which we only have two. These are genuinely a blast, thanks in part to slight changes made to the mechanics. I've neglected to talk about how rail grinding changed after Sonic Adventure 2, but it essentially became a tool for automation in the boost games, automatically moving Sonic along the rail and only requiring you to press either left or right to switch rails. While Lost World doesn't bring back the balancing from Adventure 2, you do have to actually jump from rail to rail this time, and I honestly think it makes these sections a lot more fun. It's more satisfying to do this kind of thing yourself, and the level design actually takes advantage of this, requiring you to dodge things in the air and even jump across multiple rails at once. These were a surprisingly nice highlight in an otherwise dull selection of levels. Finally, I should briefly mention the Wisps. 
Yeah, for some reason they exist on the Lost Hex too, and it's never really explained. While the Wisps and Sonic Colors were used for creative puzzles though, in Lost World they seem to be more of an afterthought, only really being used for a handful of very short sections. With all this said, how does Sonic Lost World perform under the three staples? Well, number one is meant seeing as rings, springs, loop-de-loops, and even classic badniks all return here. You'd be forgiven for thinking this is a typical Sonic affair just by looking at it, if a typical Sonic affair is even something that exists at this point. Number two is where things get complicated though. Something I haven't mentioned yet is the return of Flickies, which you rescue by defeating enemies and finding capsules throughout the levels. Certain stages won't unlock until you rescue a certain amount of these, so theoretically this should encourage replaying levels and exploring them, right? Well, unfortunately, Sonic Lost World makes a big mistake with the Flickies. They respawn. That's right, these aren't a permanent collectible, so you can grind the first level to your heart's content to get however many you may need. The perfect setup for encouraging player mastery completely squandered. Honestly, I'm more impressed than anything. Finally, number three. Is Sonic's ability to roll into a ball important to the gameplay? Well, while I'll concede that the spin dash can be helpful, not only do I think you could easily go the entire game without using it, it also doesn't really take advantage of Sonic's spherical nature in any meaningful way. What really separates this spin dash from the boost in any of the previous games. Aside from lacking momentum even more than before, not much. It's just a few seconds of invincibility when it works while Sonic goes a bit faster. That's all. So that's only one out of the three staples, meaning that this game fails the Sonic gameplay test by a wide margin. You know, I can't help but wonder how much better Sonic Lost World could have been had it not opted out of the 360 degree momentum that wants to find the series' mechanical identity. I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but indulge me for a moment. What if, instead of these planet toys having their own gravity, the entire level had universal gravity, and you had to take advantage of Sonic's speed to keep yourself from falling off? As the level progress, they could gradually rely more and more on walls and ceilings, keeping the player on edge and rewarding skillful play. If I could play that version of Lost World, I would probably hail it as one of the greatest Sonic games ever made, even if it retained the same awful story and the same boring level archetypes. Of course, that's not the version of Lost World we got, and even still, I have yet to talk about what is by far the biggest problem with this game. Sonic Lost World sucks at tutorials. This is apparent from the very start of the game. The game has loads of hints telling you how to play, but not how to actually view them. So I go into the controls menu to figure out what I need to press. Apparently it's the select button. So I press the select button. And it doesn't work. Oh, wait, never mind, it does! Just only when it feels like it. Now, on the original Wii U release, this hint icon appeared on the Wii U gamepad, and all you needed to do was tap on it. But on PC, not only do you have to press a button that the game doesn't tell you about, but it just straight up won't work most of the time, at least from my experience. Either way, this is still a bad way of doing hints. All the previous Sonic games had the hints as physical objects in the world that you can simply run into, and the game will tell you what to do. It's simple, and it's elegant. Meanwhile, in Sonic Lost World, you have to pay attention attention to the hint icon that pops up with no sound effect, and somehow already know that you need to either press select or tap on your Nintendo issued baby tablet. Now with all of that said, I did manage to figure out most of the moveset myself. However, that leads into the other big problem that makes this game so bad at teaching the mechanics, and that's the game's design itself. Remember how I mentioned that you can jump out of a wall run? Well, there's actually two kinds of jumps you can do that, as far as I know, aren't explained even if you do look at the hints. The first kind happens if if you simply press the jump button and will make Sonic jump in place, halting all momentum. I have no idea why this even exists, since it seems pretty useless, but whatever. The second kind has Sonic jump perpendicular from the wall, sort of like the triangle jump in Sonic Heroes. How do you do this? Well, you have to hold the stick in the opposite direction of the wall, then press the jump button. Aside from the fact that this is a clunky way of implementing this mechanic in the first place, I also just straight up didn't know about it until the final level. Why? because you're never required to use it until then. If you've ever played any other video game, you probably had a good grasp on the basic mechanics within the first few levels, but Sonic Lost World is so unfocused with its level design that it can't be bothered to make sure that it's actually making the player learn before they progress. Again, I went the entire game without understanding a major element of Sonic's moveset, and it wasn't until the final level that I actually had to use it. This is bad game design, plain and simple, and the entire game 
game is riddled with things like this. But you know what's worse than failing because you don't realize you're doing something wrong? Failing when you do something right, but the game decides to break on you. One of the most egregious examples of this is in Frozen Factory Zone Act 1. In order to progress, you have to use this laser whisk to activate an automated sequence that leads you to this spring that bounces you to the end of the level. It seems pretty obvious that this is what you need to do, judging by the way the camera is framed in the obvious trail of rings. So, of course, that's the first thing I try, but it doesn't work. I go through the automated sequence, only for the game to drop Sonic right through the spring. So, of course, I think I must have done something wrong, so I climb all the way back up to that part of the level and try all kinds of crap to try and get to that spring a different way. Nothing works. As a last resort, I try using the Laser Wisp again, and it works. The whole time I was doing what the game wanted, but it somehow managed to screw up a scripted sequence. The whole game is like this. Dying rarely ever felt like my fault, whether it was due to the awful controls, the poor tutorialization, or the game just deciding that I didn't do something right, even if I did. Sonic Lost World may be a mostly polished game, but no amount of polish can make gold out of a turd. The bosses are the perfect encapsulation of this overarching problem with Sonic Lost World. Before I get into that though, let's quickly go over what I'm looking for in a Sonic boss. Like I've said in past videos, classic Sonic bosses set themselves apart from other platformers with a simple design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can damage the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. Now forget all of that, because Lost World doesn't even try. Virtually every fight in this game is set up like a Mario boss, where there's a scripted cycle that only allows to hit the boss once or twice before repeating it or moving on. But I've said it myself, right? Just because a boss fight doesn't adhere to the classic philosophy doesn't mean it can't stand on its own. After all, I've praised the bosses in Sonic Adventure 2 and Sonic Generations, and neither of those games use that kind of design. Well, that only applies if they're actually good. At best, the bosses in Sonic Lost World are pitifully easy, running aimlessly around a sphere waiting for you to hit them. At worst though, some of these are the most horrifically designed bosses I have ever seen in a video game, and that is no exaggeration. As you might be able to guess, this is largely due to the overarching problems this game already has, and there's no better example of this than the second Zavik fight. This boss seems pretty straightforward at first. You wait for Zavik to do this animation, do a flying kick, then do a normal homing attack. Rinse and repeat. However, this inexplicably changes at the final phase. Now, your homing attack doesn't do jack against him, and you'll end up taking damage or even instantly dying if you don't know this. I was stuck here for a very long time, thinking maybe I just wasn't doing it fast enough. Eventually, when I was on my very last life, I caved and looked it up online. According to Sonic Retro, all I had to do was perform a fully charged homing attack. That's pretty straightforward, right? I learned throughout this game that if you wait for the reticle to beep three times, that means it's fully charged, so that's what I do. I jump, let it beep three times, do the attack, and I die, and since boss fights always take place at the very end of a level, that meant I had to retread the entire thing before I could try again. Having no intention of getting yet another game over, I finally decided to watch a walkthrough, and my jaw actually dropped when I saw what you had to do. You have to stand there, doing nothing, before the homing attack fully charges. Okay, so let's break down why this is such terrible design. First of all, there hasn't been a single time in the game where the homing attack beeps any more than three times before it fully charges. Second, this game gives you the wrong negative feedback if you don't charge it all the way in this fight, having the same result as not doing it fast enough in the previous phases of the boss. And third, who would ever think to just stand still during a boss fight? <sighs> This is the part of Sonic Lost World that broke me. I was ready to call this game not bad, but not great either. But this one moment put into perspective just how awfully designed this entire experience is, not just as a Sonic game, but as a video game in general. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. After another Zavik fight that isn't quite as horrendous as the previous, the Deadly Six are unceremoniously defeated. I say unceremoniously because there's not even a cutscene or anything, they're just inexplicably gone as soon as you defeat Zavik. 
Alright then. Anyway, since Eggman has no reason to continue working with Sonic now, he finally turns on him, leading to the final boss. This fight once again suffers from Lost World's lack of communication, but that didn't surprise me. The game makes it look like you're supposed to homing attack each segment of the mech's arm separately, but you actually have to hold it down to do a chain attack, something that the game only did sparingly before. Not a big deal though, and once I had that figured out, this boss was shockingly easy. Sonic and Tails do some vague science malarkey to Eggman's machine and restore life to Sonic's world. Sonic lies down to relax under the Minecraft tree after a long, tedious adventure, and the credits roll. Sonic Lost World was disappointing on nearly all accounts, and even worse, it was for no good reason. Sonic Team now had two winning formulas for 3D Sonic under their belts that they could have expanded upon, but instead they pulled another Sonic Heroes and started from square one. Sonic Lost World is not just a terrible Sonic game, but an awful video game that encapsulates Sega's baffling tendency to reinvent the wheel, even if it means jeopardizing the entire franchise in the process. And even today, its awful design continues to ripple into the modern games. Why live here when you could live here? You're probably asking yourself, but don't I need clean air to live? <coughs> Why, of course you don't. Not with Dr. Eggman's all-inclusive robotomy treatment, that is. <coughs> Perks include never having to eat, sleep, or think ever again. That's what we call living the good life. Come live in Dr. Eggman's empire and begin your new life where the possibilities are infinite. You love it. Love mandatory. Sonic Forces released in 2017 for the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and PC. It was meant to be a return to form after Sonic Lost World and Sonic Boom turned the franchise into even more of a laughingstock than it was back when 06 hit the shelves. A return to the successful boost formula only made sense, and after Sonic Mania breathed new life into the 2D games, everyone was beyond excited to play Forces. It seemed like it would be the best Sonic game in years, not only returning to the established 3D gameplay that fans were familiar with, but also bringing back classic Sonic, returning to a darker tone, and even introducing an avatar creator. It looks like this game was going to do the impossible task of pleasing the entire spectrum of Sonic fans. And then it came out. Sonic Forces has become one of the most hated games in the entire series, with people from all sides of the fandom lamenting its overuse of scripted sequences, half-baked story, and woefully short length. But were we too hard on Forces? Have we been overlooking a hidden gem all this time? <laughs> Buckle up everyone, because this is going to be a rocky ride. This is my review of Sonic Forces. Sonic gets a transmission from Tails that some city is under attack by the evil forces of Eggman, so he zooms over there to stop him. There, he not only finds Eggman, but also Metal Sonic, Chaos, Shadow, and Zavok all seemingly working for him again, and a mysterious new character named Infinite. He, along with the returning baddies, kicks Sonic's butt, allowing Eggman to successfully take over the world for the first time in the entire series. We then cut to six months later, where a few familiar Sonic characters have teamed up to form a resistance, and wait! Is that Chaz the Nuclear Cheetah from Nuclear Cheetah, the game that I'm working on that currently has a demo out on itch.io that you can try right now, link in the description? <laughs> Well, technically yes, but more specifically, this is the Avatar character, which we'll talk about later. Anyway, our Avatar rescues Sonic, who did not die, and now they have to work together with the Resistance to overthrow the Eggman Empire. As the game progresses, we learn more about Infinite and a mysterious gem called the Phantom Ruby that allows him to shift reality. This has various effects throughout the story, the two most notable ones being the ability to make clones, which is why characters like Shadow and Chaos are working with Eggman again, and the ability to affect other dimensions, inadvertently bringing back classic Sonic. There's a lot of details I glossed over, but that's the gist of the story in Sonic Forces. It's certainly more ambitious than it was in Lost World, justifying the amount of cutscenes this time. Credit where it's due, this concept has a lot of potential. Unfortunately though, there's even more problems here than in the previous game, so let's talk about them. Pontac and Graf return one final time for Sonic Forces, though from my understanding they were only in charge of writing for the English localization and not the actual plot 
itself, which was handled in-house as Sega this time. Pontaf's influence must have rubbed off on Sonic Team though, because the characterization and dialogue here is as awful as ever. For the fifth freaking game in a row, they've massacred my boy Tails. Ever since Unleashed, he's been a complete coward, relegated to providing exposition instead of actually being involved in the action. In fact, it's for this very reason that Sonic is even defeated in the first place, because instead of helping him fight, he just sits here behind a rock and watches his best friend presumably die. The bad characterization doesn't end with the pre-existing cast, extending also to Infinite. I swear I thought Zavik was the most square, boring, generically evil villain I had ever seen in a Sonic game, but no, Infinite easily takes the cake. He's edgy for edginess's sake, and all of his dialogue can be boiled down to, you're pathetic and I'm not. The characters aren't the only thing that were butchered here though, we also have retcons, a lot of them being completely pointless. The most infamous of these is when Tails refers to classic Sonic as being from another dimension. What? Why? In generations, he was from the past, and it's not like that would've been incompatible with the story they were trying to tell here. It's explained that the Phantom Ruby affects other dimensions, but they could've just as easily said that it affected the flow of time instead. Another big problem with the story is how it's paced. Minor exposition that could've been delivered through offhand dialogue gets full-on cutscenes, while major story events like Eggman taking over are explained through simple text crawls. You'd think the Resistance discovering that Sonic is alive after six months of hopelessness would be a big deal worthy of a full-on cutscene, but instead this is how the game presents it. I've just received some incredible news! Sonic is alive! No way! Not only is this a bizarre and anticlimactic way of revealing what should be a major turning point for the story, but the characters also react to it as if they just heard the ice cream truck outside. It reminds me of how Sonic reacted to Shadow being alive in Heroes. This inconsistent pacing and presentation of story events affects the entire game in a really weird and unsatisfying way. When you beat a batch of levels, this meter will pop up showing what percent of the world is left to take back from Eggman. This by itself is a great idea, giving tangible and measurable feedback that reinforces forces the amount of progress you've made, but then later on, the game completely ruins it by making it go up by like 40% every time. Towards the beginning, it went up by much less than that, making it seem like you're in for a grand adventure, but then the pace starts going a million miles an hour in the second half and the whole thing's done before you can even process it. There's a lot of other miscellaneous gripes I have with the story and forces, such as modern Sonic being completely fine despite supposedly being tortured for six months straight, but if I talked about all of them, this video would end up being 10 hours long. There's just so many problems that add up to way more than the sum of their parts, completely ruining what should have been a great return to form for Sonic stories. Unlike the story itself, the cutscenes are somewhat improved from Lost World, sporting better lighting and shot composition. The animation itself hasn't changed a bit though, with the characters still moving stiffly, emoting exclusively with their mouths and eyelids, and lacking any dynamic poses. The voice acting has seen some improvement though. While I'll never understand Sega's insistence on keeping Roger Craig Smith around, this is easily his best performance as Sonic for a mainline game in my opinion. While I still think this casting choice was the voice acting equivalent of shoving a square peg into a round hole, I do appreciate how much energy he gives the character this time. Out of all the Sonic games I've played that have Roger as Sonic, this is the one where I was least distracted by it. The rest of the cast do an okay job too, and while I don't have much to say about most of their performances, it wouldn't be a Spotman video if I didn't shout out Mike Pollock, so good job Mike Pollock, you're awesome at your job. The presentation in Sonic Forces is really solid when it comes to the visuals. The environments do retain some of the simple geometry from Lost World, but they're rendered with much better lighting and materials this time. This was the first Sonic game to use Hedgehog Engine 2, and it certainly makes a good first impression. Unfortunately, Sonic Forces doesn't have much in terms of variety when it comes to the environments, and many of them are recycled from previous games. Green Hill, Chemical Plant, Death Egg, I mean come on, out of all the established locales from the series, they really win with the ones that we've already seen in both Generations and Mania? I get that they wanted to cash in on nostalgia, but even then there's loads of interesting zones in the Genesis games that they could have pulled from instead. What about Marble Zone, or Aquatic Ruin, or Hydrocity, or Hydro City? Even if they absolutely had to reuse these overdone areas we've seen a million times, they still could have done more to make them visually unique in this game. Eggman has taken over after all, so why not give these the Sonic CD bad future treatment? Instead of Green Hill having sand waterfalls or whatever, why not have it be on fire like Angel Island in Sonic 3? Instead of retreading the same parts of Chemical Plant we've been time and time again, why not have 
have us explore those mysterious buildings that were always in the background. As it is, the way these are implemented is just so boring. That's not to say Forces is completely devoid of interesting environments though. Unlike Lost World, it has at least a few of its own. My favorite one is easily a Metropolitan Highway. While the whole futuristic city thing had been done before in Sonic Heroes, Forces does its own take on the idea and it looks really cool. I wish the devs focused more on designing fresh and new areas like this instead of remaking ones we've already seen for the fifth time. The character designs are another thing that's continued to stagnate, though they did update Sonic's model to have shorter quills and a lighter blue than before. I really hate how this looks. Classic Sonic wasn't light blue originally either, but it made sense to give him a different color in generations to make it easier to differentiate him from modern Sonic, but now they're both light blue, so what's the point? It's not even a flattering color for him if you ask me, it just looks wrong. That's the visuals covered, but there's also a bit to talk about in the sound department. To start with the negatives this time, I do think the sound design has seen a bit of a downgrade. I haven't really talked about the sound design in these games for a while now, but the early boost games had really punchy metallic sound effects whenever you defeated enemies, followed by some super satisfying explosions. Forces, on the other hand, suffers the same problem as Adventure 1 in Heroes. The explosions are so quiet that defeating enemies doesn't give you the feedback that it should. I know this probably sounds like a minor nitpick, but boosting into enemies and doing homing attack chains is something you do pretty frequently in this game, so it's virtually impossible to ignore, at least for me. The soundtrack, though? I might be in the minority here, but I think Sonic Forces as one of the best OSTs in the whole series. Modern Sonic's levels combine the established rock vibe with some cool sounding synths, the avatar stages feature vocal tracks with EDM and dubstep influences, the cutscenes have an outstanding orchestral score, and while Faded Hills is, uh... Faded Hills, the rest of Classic Sonic's tracks are also solid, using a sound font that sounds like it could realistically be produced by an actual Sega Genesis. I hear a lot of people criticize the soundtrack in this game for being too synthy, but I never really understood that complaint. Sonic games have always had a pop influence, especially the classic games, which pretty much all use synths for their soundtracks. Maybe it's just me, but the way Forces marries that idea with contemporary genres all while maintaining the rock style that has persisted ever since the adventure game just continues to resonate with me. This is one of those soundtracks like Sonic Adventure 2 or Sonic Colors that just has such a distinct sound to it. When you hear a song from Sonic Forces, you immediately know it's from Sonic Forces, and I always appreciate when a game has a unique musical identity like this. I'd say the presentation in Sonic Forces is pretty darn solid. I wish there were more original environments, and I think the animation and sound design is a bit of a downgrade, but with that aside, this is both a nice looking and nice sounding game. This all brings us to, of course, the gameplay, and there is a lot to unpack here. The world map returns once again from colors in Lost World, and progression is still perfectly linear. You beat a level, maybe watch a cutscene or fight a boss, then move on to the next one. Unlike those games though, Sonic Forces marks the return of multiple playable characters. We have Modern Sonic, Classic Sonic, and the Avatar, all with their own separate playstyles, along with the occasional levels that have the Avatar team up with Modern Sonic. The way the game sets this up is similar to how a single campaign plays out in Sonic Adventure 2. Instead of going through the story multiple times as separate characters, Forces simply bounces between each character's perspective throughout and makes you play all of the levels in a set order. And in one of the few genuine improvements this game makes over its predecessors, you won't find yourself going through several levels in a row as the same character. Most of the time you'll play a modern Sonic level, then an Avatar level, then classic Sonic, then back to modern. So you know what time it is, it's time once again to bust out the three staples of Sonic excellence. For those of you who are new, these are the basic principles that I look for in a character's playstyle in a Sonic game. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, 3. The character's central attribute should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so it's gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Note that these don't necessarily denote a good playstyle period, but rather a baseline that distincts a Sonic game from any other generic platformer. Now, with these in mind, let's get into it. 
The game starts us out with modern Sonic, so let's do the same here. One of the reasons that Sonic Forces was so anticipated was the return of the boost formula from Unleashed, Colors, and Generations. While that formula never perfectly met my three staples, it was still a blast, especially in Colors and Generations. So how does modern Sonic and Forces stack up against those games? Well, not great. You'll recall that Sonic Lost World completely overhauled Sonic's moveset, replacing the movement engine from the original Hedgehog Engine games in favor of something entirely new. You may also recall that I absolutely despise the way Sonic controlled in that game due to the complete absence of the physics and momentum that had persisted throughout the series up to that point, Sonic 06 notwithstanding, of course. Well, in a completely baffling decision that I will never understand, Sonic Team decided that this was the movement engine from which they would build their glorious renaissance of Boost Sonic upon. And it's awful. Let's start with the positives, though. Sonic can now retain a boost when he jumps, allowing him to do these long dives, which is pretty fun to do in certain levels. And that's it. Modern Sonic feels just as clunky to control as he did in Lost World, if not even more. They did at least try to make him feel a little closer to how the boost games did, with his movement no longer being locked to eight directions, nor moving slower sideways and diagonally, but it's their attempt at trying to simulate momentum that completely destroys the game feel. Now, when I say momentum here, I'm not referring to the 360 degree pinball physics from games past. I'm talking basic horizontal acceleration and deceleration like a Mario game. Forces tries to simulate this, but it does it in a really unnatural way, having you start slow and then suddenly jerking you into a full sprint after a few seconds. It reminds me most of Super Mario World, which also had weird sudden acceleration like this, but it's not nearly as bad in that game as it is here. This, combined with the lack of air control, makes platforming feel needlessly janky, even ruining the 2D sections, which I've never had any complaints with any of the previous boost games. With that said though, you're not going to be doing a whole lot of actual platforming as modern Sonic, and that leads me to my other big complaint. Sonic Forces abuses automation. Sure, nearly every previous 3D Sonic game occasionally used scripted sequences for spectacle's sake, but the modern Sonic levels and forces take this several steps too far. Virtually the entire level automatically steers you onto a spline that you can't break out of unless you come to a complete stop. I imagine this was done in an attempt to disguise how bad the controls really are, but this removes so much agency on the player's part that it turns the boost formula from a reaction-based platformer to a glorified walking simulator, or running simulator, I guess. The game hands out boost wisps like candy and constantly expects you to hold square for the entire level, plowing through everything with no effort whatsoever. The level length, or lack thereof, exacerbates this issue. There's nothing inherently wrong with having bite-sized levels, but it becomes a huge problem when a majority of that is just holding a single button and watching Sonic go. Playing a 1-2 to two minute stage isn't so bad if I'm actually playing the game, but if I'm only controlling the character for a third of it at most, then I'm inevitably going to feel underwhelmed. It makes these stages feel much shorter than they actually are. So how does modern Sonic perform under the three Sonic staples? Number one is met, if it even needs to be said at this point. Rings, springs, loop-de-loops, badniks, they're all here. Requirement number two, on the other hand, is where this gameplay style quickly begins to fall apart. I've said before that the ranks in Sonic Generations are way too easy, but in Sonic Forces you don't even have to try. The entire level's already automated, so there's not much of a skill ceiling to reach this time around. And number three, take a guess, take a wild guess. No not one single bit. Sonic's ability to roll into a ball was already neglected in the previous boost games, and Forces is no exception to this rule. Even then, those games at least retained the 360 degree momentum from the adventure games. Sure, it wasn't utilized as much, but at least it was still there. But Sonic Forces is built on an engine made for magnetizing Sonic to whatever floor triangle he's closest to, and no amount of automation can disguise that fact. That's only one out of three staples then, just like Lost World. So. Who do we have next? Wait. Oh no. Classic Sonic really sucks, or at least the Sonic forces he does. He was just fine in Mania. 
What happened here? Well, you can probably guess. Using an engine with no momentum to recreate a gameplay style that relies almost entirely on momentum was, shall we say, a bold choice, and it doesn't take an astrophysicist to figure out why this doesn't work. Like modern Sonic, classic Sonic's levels have a lot of automation, and you can tell it's the only thing that's propelling him through these half-pipes and loop-de-loops. The best part is that rolling, you know, classic's whole shtick, completely breaks some of these sections, and not in a good way. The drop dash from Sonic Mania returns here, and like the spin dash in Lost World, it seems that most of these levels were designed with spamming it in mind. When you're not drop dashing, you're partaking in the most boring, blocky, and tedious 2D platforming I've ever seen in a Sonic game. And again, like modern Sonic, the wonky physics make it way more annoying than it should be. So how does classic Sonic perform under the three statements? Of course he's here for nostalgia's sake, so all of the essentials you'd expect in a Sonic game are here once once more, including iconic power-ups such as the speed shoes, invincibility, and the shield. Yet again though, he completely fails at number 2. At best, these levels pretty much play themselves and hand you the S rank without much effort. At worst, they're simply so boring that you won't find yourself eager to replay them even if you somehow didn't get the S rank the first time. Number 3 gets a half pass from me. Yes, rolling is technically important. You need the drop dash and or the spin dash to get through certain automated segments that have have several enemies lined up in a row to roll into. However, the lack of any actual sonic physics turns rolling into a ball from a fun way of maintaining speed, to a lackluster attack that only exists to try and gaslight you into believing that this really is classic Sonic and not Santiago. 1.5 out of 3. If there's any reason to bother with Sonic Forces, it's probably the Avatar. The customization seems pretty bare bones at first, only allowing you to choose from a handful of species and a few colors. As you progress though, the game absolutely showers you with new cosmetics, and by the end you might even end up with something you're pretty happy with. Or you'll end up with whatever this thing's supposed to be. Give him a name in the comments if you want. This customization carries over into the gameplay as well, in the form of Wisps. Again, it's not really explained in-game why they're even here, but but whatever, Lost World didn't do that either. Unlike previous games where you can use any wisp when you encounter it in a level, Sonic Forces requires you to have a specific gun, or wispin as they're called, that's only compatible with a particular kind. It sort of rubs me the wrong way that we're using these poor aliens as ammo since the whole point of them in colors was to save them from being used as that very thing, but again, whatever, I guess. This is by far the best part of these stages, though like a lot of things in this game, it reeks of mispotential. Potential. Some wisps, especially lightning and burst, are helpful for finding quicker routes through levels, but most of the others are only really helpful for defeating enemies, something you're probably not going to have a hard time with either way. When it comes to the general gameplay itself, the Avatar suffers from the same pitfalls as the two Sonics, and of course I mean that literally. Unlike those playstyles though, the Avatar doesn't have a boost or drop dash to help pick up speed, so if there's platforming to be done, chances are you're not going to be able to brute force your way past it. I would say that this this is a good thing, since it means there's less automation, but since the physics are still borked, I'd almost rather the gameplay itself. A few levels see the Avatar teaming up with Sonic in a similar fashion to Sonic Heroes, and these are debatably the best stages in the entire game. You now have access to Sonic's double jump and boost, while still being able to use the Wisps to take shortcuts. These also feature the Double Boost, one of the most heavily marketed and memed on parts of this game. Unfortunately, this is a nothing mechanic. All you do is spam the square button for a few seconds, then watch Sonic in your OC blast through a large chunk of the stage with no further input required. This might have been more interesting if it functioned like the special moves in Shadow the Hedgehog, where you could save it and strategically use it anywhere in the stage, but as it's implemented here, you can only do it when the game makes you, so it's not much more than a glorified quick time event. Despite these shortcomings though, the Avatar surprisingly performs the best under the three staples out of any other playstyle in this game. As always, essential elements of the series are present, so there's not much to say there. When it comes to the second staple, I'm giving this one a half point. While the S ranks are still far too easy for a grand majority of these levels, revisiting them with different wispins does add at least some variety in terms of alternate routes, though it definitely could have been fleshed out a lot more. The Avatar aces the third staple though. This character's whole identity is shaped by the player, which is expressed yet again through the wispins. While these don't encourage replayability as much as I would have liked, they do allow players to pick and choose what 
kind of attacks they want their original character to have, whether that's a lightning whip, flamethrower, drill, etc. 2.5 out of 3 staples is a good score, and while it certainly doesn't ace it, the Avatar is the one place out in this game that passes the Sonic gameplay test. Like I've said in past videos, classic Sonic bosses set themselves apart from other platformers with a simple design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can damage the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. The past couple of games have completely ignored this approach with vastly different degrees of success. So how does Sonic Forces fare? It actually fares really well. Like really well. Aside from a few outliers, such as the one you do as Classic Sonic or the Zavik fight at the beginning that makes a bad first impression, a majority of the boss fights in Sonic Forces not only follow the classic philosophy to some degree, they're also genuinely fun for the most part. The best of these are easily the few battles you'll have with Infinite. The first one is reminiscent of a lot of the fights in the previous boost games, but this time taking place on a snake, allowing you to run on all sides of it. As long as you're fast enough, you can attack Infinite at any time, and it's really satisfying this way. The one you do as the Avatar also follows this approach, though in a very different setting. This one takes place in 2D, requiring you to dodge obstacles while waiting for Infinite to become vulnerable, and wailing on him as much as possible, as fast as possible. Aside from the inherent problems with the character physics making it difficult to avoid his projectiles, this is a well-designed fight. Most of the boss fights and forces are designed this way, aside from the outliers I mentioned before, which use a Mario-like approach in a frankly boring fashion. Overall though, these were a surprising breath of fresh air in an otherwise horribly designed game. What I don't like about these bosses is who you're actually fighting. While the game makes it look like it has a solid rogues gallery in the first cutscene, in reality you only get to fight two of the returning baddies. One fight with Zavok and one fight with Metal Sonic. We don't get a battle with Shadow or Chaos in this game. And sure, we already fought them in generations, but what's the point of bringing them back a third time if you're not even going to actually use them? With all of that said, let's talk about the final boss. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. After a final fight with him, Infinite is unceremoniously vaporized, which for all I know is what happened to the Deadly Six too. Unfortunately for the Resistance though, Eggman has one last trick up his sleeve, that being the newest iteration of the Death Egg robot. Modern, Classic, and the Avatar now have to team up to overcome this one last challenge. This is a three-phase fight, each phase having you play as a different character. Classics is probably the weakest, only requiring you to hit these rocks back, much like his only other boss. The Avatars is a bit more interesting, having you wait for a specific attack and then strike the boss as many times as you can, similar to the infinite fight from before. This phase does have a really annoying attack that's impossible to see coming if you don't know about it, but it only killed me once in this playthrough. The final phase is when things start to get interesting. For the first and only time, we get to play as Modern Sonic, Classic Sonic, and the Avatar all at the same time, in a sequence that's reminiscent of the Wisp armor from Colors. I'll admit that I do wish they got a little more creative with the actual gameplay of this fight, but between the awesome spectacle and the epic soundtrack, it's a pretty solid climax. What's not a solid climax is this game's ending. After the Death Egg robot is defeated, Classic Sonic goes home, Sonic talks about how the Resistance is going to repair the world, but the game doesn't actually show them doing that, Tails preaches about friendship, and Sonic and Chaz part ways. Credits. Sonic Forces is one of those games that I hate to hate. The concept of exploring a world that Eggman managed to successfully take over was a great idea, and to its credit, there is a bit of charm here that occasionally manages to seep through the cracks. But this game is too often stifled by a myriad of baffling design decisions, whether it's the insistence on keeping terrible writers, the unwillingness to design interesting new environments, or most egregiously, the awful decision to try and salvage an inherently flawed game engine. The developers clearly lacked good time management, focusing on polishing superficial things like the graphics instead of making the actual game fun to play. And ultimately, we ended up with something that not only lacked content, but also spoiled what could have been a genuinely good experience.
Sonic Frontiers released in 2022 for 8th gen and 9th gen consoles as well as PC, and man was it hyped up. While the marketing had a bit of a rocky start with that bizarre IGN first gameplay, it wouldn't take long for people's hopes to return, as more and more information about the game was published leading up to release. After the series reached an all-time low with forces, it was high time for a revitalization, and for many people, Frontiers seems to have scratched that itch. Critics and fans alike have been praising the game for its bold new direction, calling it a return to form for 3D Sonic, and more controversially, the true Sonic Adventure 2. So what about little old me? Well, I'll admit that despite my skepticism early on, I did eventually get swept up by the hype train for Frontiers. In fact, I even had a relatively positive impression of it after my first playthrough at launch. However, the more time I've had to reminisce, the less positive that outlook has become. With that in mind, I've decided to give the game a second go as part of my 3D Sonic marathon. Was Sonic Frontiers really all was cracked up to be, or did we let our confirmation bias get the better of us? Well, let's find out. This is my review of Sonic Frontiers. The game sets a mysterious mood immediately upon starting a new save, with Eggman doing some strange science-y stuff with these ruins before a mysterious force sucks him in. We then cut to Sonic, Tails, and Amy, who are traveling to a new location known as the Starfall Islands. We learn through an as-you-know-Bob moment that Tails detected the Chaos Emeralds here, so the Rainbow Rat team has decided to see what's up. It doesn't take long for things to go horribly wrong, though, and the gang is sucked into a digital dimension, creatively named Cyberspace. Sonic manages to escape, while his friend remain in a digital limbo. Oh, and Knuckles is here too, which only makes sense if you watched a YouTube video before playing. Nice. Anyway, a mysterious voice in the sky tells Sonic to defeat these giant robots called Titans in order to save his friends. So that's what he does. Along the way, Sonic comes across Sage, Eggman's new cyber daughter, who serves as cryptic exposition while also getting a character arc later on. This is all a gross oversimplification, but that's the gist of the story in Frontiers. It's once again pretty ambitious, but unlike Forces, it's actually somewhat cohesive and respects what little consistency the canon had up to this point. This is, at least in part, thanks to a change in writers. That's right, Pontac and Graf are finally out of the picture, being replaced by Ian Flynn, who has previous experience writing for the Sonic comics. Now, to be fully honest, I haven't read very many of those, so I can't speak to their quality, but judging from people's reactions to the news that Ian was writing for Frontiers, it seems that he's generally well-liked. So good on Sega for hiring someone that the fans actually prove for once. But it's one thing to have a good writer, and another for that writer to actually produce a good story. So what do I think about the story? Y'all are gonna hate me. Before I rip into Frontiers right out of the gate though, let's talk positives. Thankfully, there's a decent amount of them this time. First of all, the characterization is leagues better than it has been for the past several games. Sonic is less of a jerk, Tails actually does things despite still not being playable in the base game. Knuckles and Amy are... okay, these guys are still kinda weird here, but otherwise everyone is more or less themselves again. On top of that, Frontiers finally returns to having more focus on character development, which hasn't really been a thing since Sonic Adventure 2. Every single one of Sonic's friends has an epiphany of some sort in each chapter, and while I can feel a little heavy-handed, we'll talk about that in a bit, I do appreciate the effort here. And finally, as I alluded to before, Sonic Frontiers acknowledges previous Sonic media as canon, even making an effort to mend plot and character inconsistencies that have been introduced over the years. With that said, this is done in a very haphazard way. Yeah, it's time to talk about the negatives now, and unfortunately, there's quite a few. First, let's talk about those references. They are obnoxious. It feels like every other sentence out of any given character's mouth has to be some kind of callback, lore connection, or tongue-in-cheek acknowledgement of previous game's mistakes. Hey, who was it who stopped Eggman from blowing up Station Square, huh? And who broke me out of prison, or saved me from the Deadly Six's trap? I... then I'm wildly inconsistent. I don't mind fan service if it's done in a natural way, but Frontiers is way too heavy-handed with its references to the point where it's downright laughable sometimes. Sometimes there are entire paragraphs worth of dialogue that exists solely for the purpose of connecting established lore from games past, not for furthering the actual plot itself. Take these egg memos, for example. They're a cool little bonus you can buy in the fishing minigame, and a decent amount of them do a good job of building upon the game's narrative. However, there are nearly just as many of them where it feels like Eggman is writing his own Sonic fanfiction. She's come a long way since being an easy pawn in my schemes to ensnare Sonic. 
It seems like she had some trouble finding herself. Like, what prompted him to record this? These are all supposed to have been recorded during the events of the game, so why does Eggman go from using them as a journal to writing completely unprompted character bios of Sonic's friends? I also have a few bones to pick with the story itself. I mentioned before that this game does focus more on character development, but I think it tries a little too hard at times. It feels like every single character here is being forced to go through some sort of life-changing Great Awakening, even even if it doesn't feel earned or even make any sense. Some of these are fine, such as Tails' arc about becoming more independent from Sonic. I do kind of wish they would just retcon the past few games' renditions of Tails and bring him back to how he was by the end of Adventure 2, but I guess if they're going to treat all games as canon, this is probably the best way they could have gone about it. But there are a couple arcs here that just feel poorly thought out, a prime example being Amy's. Towards the end of the first island, Amy suddenly makes this proclamation that she's going to share her love with the world. What? That's so vague. What does that even mean? Is she going to give the Pope a copy of Undertale or something? Well, Sonic's nodding along, so maybe it's Hedgehog's secret code that we just can't comprehend. Sage's arc is another one that I found pretty underwhelming. It's not necessarily a bad idea in and of itself, but it's pretty blatantly ripped straight from Gamma's story in Sonic Adventure. Eggman creates a sentient AI, the AI develops feelings, and... Well, I guess we'll have to save that for the spoiler section. The bottom line is, while Sonic Frontiers takes a lot of decent strides in the right direction with its narrative, it's unfortunately still just as much of a mess as the previous few games' stories. Forced references plague the dialogue, half of the character arcs don't feel earned, the cutscene presentation is downright bizarre at times, and while the mysterious vibe is a breath of fresh air, the build-up doesn't really have much payoff by the end. Again, we'll have to save that for the spoiler section. With all that said, though, don't take this as a dig against Ian Flynn. This is his first time writing for a main series game after all, and the last thing I want to do is write off the potential of someone that could bring the series' storytelling to a better place. I'd like to see him brought back for at least one more game, just to see if he improves. Next, let's talk presentations, starting with the cutscenes. These are all over the place in terms of quality, ranging from well-choreographed action shots to dialogue exchanges that feel like they're straight out of a PS1 Spyro game. It seems that Sonic Team had to spread their budget pretty thin for these, which you'll see is going to become a theme. To their credit, the animators definitely tried a lot harder to get some decent expressions out of the characters this time, but I don't think these models are very well equipped for that. Anytime they try to give Sonic an exaggerated expression, it usually ends up looking creepy. This makes a lot of cutscenes more awkward than they were probably going for, especially the scenes with Knuckles. And for the millionth time in a row, these cutscenes are still locked to a low resolution and frame rate, and I frankly have no idea why. All of Frontier's cutscenes are rendered in real time to reflect the time of day when you activate them, so why are these bottlenecked? I get it if you need to do that to maintain consistent performance on consoles, but I'm playing on a PC that's more than up to the task, so the option for cutscenes that reflect my graphics settings would have been appreciated. With all of that aside, what about the in-game graphics? Well, like everything else in this game so far, I'm pretty mixed. They are technically superior to forces, using more modern rasterized lighting techniques and screen filters, but I don't know man, it just doesn't look as clean as forces did. There's a lot of post-processing effects being used here, which give the image a noisy, undefined appearance, and that's even with the nauseating motion blur turned off. This is 1080p footage, believe it or not. What doesn't help is the art style, or or lack thereof. When it comes to the main open zones, Sonic Frontiers goes for a photorealistic approach that somewhat resembles 06, though obviously with more modern rendering tech and less uncanny humans. Now I don't mean to say that Sonic Team didn't do a good job making these environments realistic, or even that they look bad. Nature is an inherently beautiful thing, so the game looks good in the same way that real life looks good, if that makes any sense. I think the real problem here is the environment design itself. The Starfall Islands are some of the most bland and boring areas I have ever seen in a Sonic game. They somehow combine the worst traits of every previous entry, the dreary colors of 06, the uninspired theming of Lost World, and well, we'll get to gameplay soon. They clearly took a page from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild with the abandoned ruins and subdued soundtrack, but much like Sonic Lost World with Mario Galaxy, Frontiers fails to realize what made its inspiration so captivating. Of all the ancient temples I've been in, this one might be the coolest. 
But Sonic, that's the seventh time we've seen that exact temple. Breath of the Wild's world was intriguing because every landmark was unique, but Sonic Frontier's world consists of barren plains and mountains dotted with the same ten or so generic ruins assets copied and pasted ad nauseum. The one exception is when you encounter an abandoned Death Egg robot from Sonic Forces. That's about it. There's very little here that captures my attention because everything feels exactly the same. <sighs> but that's not my only complaint with the environments in Frontiers. See, scattered throughout the game's open areas are cyberspace stages, which are meant to function as more traditional Sonic levels. And guess what zones they brought back for the fourth time in a row? That's right, it's Green Hill and Chemical Plant. Oh, and Sky Sanctuary for good measure. The only original zone here is the city theme, and while the background looks kind of cool, the foreground elements are the most generic city assets I have ever seen. These would be right at home in Speed Highway, City Escape, Skyscraper, Scamper, or literally any other city level, so does it really count as an original aesthetic? Other aspects of Frontier's visual design don't fare much better. The existing cast members have the exact same models from Forces, but with marginally more realistic textures. I'm really not a fan of how the characters look here. The fur materials look very flat, and of course the models themselves are ones that I've grown quite tired of seeing over the years. And yes, yeah, Sonic's quills are still too short. Sonic Frontiers fares a bit better when it comes to audio. While the sound design still isn't quite on par with Unleashed colors or generations, it still leaps and bounds better than Forces. Of course, we can't talk about a Sonic game without mentioning the soundtrack, and Frontiers certainly maintains the level of quality I've come to expect from this series. However, I did find a large majority of the tracks to be pretty forgettable. Don't get me wrong, vocal tracks like Undefeatable and Vandalize are stand out, but the rest of the music just isn't very catchy. That makes sense enough for the ambient music in the overworld, but the cyberspace stages also suffer from this, surprisingly enough. That's not to say they're bad. Actually, I quite like the cyberspace music. Since this is a digital dimension, the music pulls from a wide spectrum of genres that fall under the electronic umbrella. Trance, dubstep, EDM, drum and bass, you name it. I could definitely see this style not being for everyone, and I'll be the first to admit that it seldom matches the levels it plays in, but since I'm early Gen Z trash, I enjoy the sound of it regardless. We also can't talk about the audio without talking about the voice acting, and okay, I'm going to get torn to shreds for saying this, but... It kinda sucks. A lot of people leading up to Frontier's release were saying that Roger Craig Smith's voice not fitting Sonic was the result of poor direction and not poor casting. I guess that feedback reached Sega and they decided to just not give any voice direction at all? In all of my life, I have never heard a hedgehog sound so constipated. And it's not just Sonic either, a lot of the other actors sound like they're just reading the script in their normal voices. Even Mike Pollock is lacking the energy that Eggman usually has. I guess they wanted to reflect the serious tone of the story by having the characters sound more lifelike, but the result just feels so bizarre. There's a glaring juxtaposition between these colorful characters and the bland way they deliver their dialogue. I'm not even against Sonic games raising the stakes every once in a while, but Sonic Adventure 2 and even 06 pulled it off without making Sonic sound like he's high on sedatives. Sonic Frontiers is a very mixed bag when it comes to presentation. While the graphics are technically the best the series has seen yet, games like Unleashed, Generations, and even Forces still manage to look far better thanks to their stronger art direction. I do like the music here, even if I wish that more of it was hummable like previous game soundtracks, but the voice acting and its direction makes an already mixed cast sound even more glaringly unfitting for the characters. With the story and presentation covered, it's time now for everyone's favorite subject, gameplay. While Sonic Forces brought back the idea of having other playable characters, Frontiers trims it back down to just the titular hedgehog himself, at least in the base game. Progression is also very different, throwing Sonic into a series of open worlds, complete with objective markers and Ubisoft towers. So it's time once again to dust off the good old three staples of Sonic excellence. For those of you who are new, these are the basic principles that I look for in a character's playstyle in the Sonic game. 1. Essential Sonic elements should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, 3. The character's central attribute should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Note that these don't necessarily denote a good play style period, but rather a baseline that this a Sonic game from any other generic platformer. Now, with these in mind, let's get into it. 
When it came to how Sonic would control in Frontiers, I really wasn't sure what to expect on my first playthrough. I of course knew it was still using the boost formula, but it was hard to definitively tell from the trailer footage if this would bring back the better physics from Generations, or if they would pull a Forces again and try to salvage Lost World's movement engine. Unfortunately, it turned out to be the latter. Sonic's movement is very close to how it was in Forces, though they made various tweaks to make it at least a little more playable. The handling is much tighter than before, though only on ground turning in the air is still painfully slow. Funnily enough, you can actually customize certain parameters of Sonic's handling in the settings, but it really doesn't affect the game as much as you'd expect. Aside from obvious things like maximum speed, the overall feel of steering Sonic around is still going to feel more or less the same. Returning yet again is the boost, though it functions far differently than any of its previous iterations. While past games awarded boost for doing tricks, collecting rings, defeating enemies, etc., Frontiers assigns it to a stamina meter that refills after a few seconds, once again borrowing from Breath of the Wild. And while this boost is still fast, it doesn't damage enemies, so it functions more as a run button. In fact, it's even mapped to the right trigger like in Lost World. I really feel like this implementation of the boost fundamentally misunderstands its original purpose. In Unleashed Generations, and especially Colors, the boost was a consumable resource that you had to ration throughout the level. And when the right moment came, slamming that button was immensely satisfying because it empowered you, allowing you to barrel through any enemy in your way. Frontier's boost completely destroys that balance. While it seems like the stamina meter would serve a similar function, the cooldown after it runs out is so fast that there's no good reason not to keep that button held. And since it doesn't damage enemies, what follows is a boost that feels unsatisfying on both accounts. Now, you may be wondering if they improve Sonic's physics in this game, seeing as having open environments was the perfect opportunity to take advantage of a fully realized 3D Sonic. Unfortunately, they didn't. Whether it's in the open zones or cyber space, gravity just kind of depends on what floor triangle Sonic is on. To try and disguise this, the devs created three types of level geometry. Surfaces that Sonic walks on, surfaces that Sonic slides on, and surfaces that Sonic wall climbs on. And yes, it's actually as rigid and binary as it sounds. Navigating these environments feels so bizarre compared to any other boost game. One minute you'll be effortlessly running over hills and mountains, the next minute you'll enter a slide animation the nanosecond you come into contact with a surface that that looks exactly like the one you were just running on. The transition between these two types of surfaces is only made clear when you physically touch it, and it just feels plain bad. The climbable surfaces are the only ones that are clearly marked, and boy are they clearly marked! Remember when running up walls and across ceilings was just a default attribute of Sonic's skill set? Well, corporate wants us to get our money's worth out of a movement engine that was only meant for a one-off Wii U title, so we kinda had to improvise. Sorry. But Spawn Man, I hear you politely scream into your monitor, Sonic Frontiers does have traditional Sonic physics. Just use the drop dash. Alright, let's use the drop dash. I rest my case. Sonic Frontiers also introduces an all-new combat system that has its own skill tree, combo moves, the whole nine yards. The platforming physics may suck, but does this help make up for them? Yeah. Well, to start on a positive note, I don't think it's awful. The fact that you initiate every combat encounter with a homing attack helps connect it to Sonic's overall moveset, which I thought was pretty clever. And the combo moves serve as some pretty nice spectacle, even using Sonic's ballness for some super slick animations. Said combo moves are also where the problems begin, though. The skills tree is decently large, and there's a wealth of various attacks to choose from, but a grand majority of them do the exact same thing. Damage the enemy. The only difference is how much damage. But they still could have made this work by incentivizing or even forcing the player to vary their moves. Maybe break the combo chain if you use the same attack twice in a row, or even have a cooldown on each attack like in Xenoblade. Well, I guess balance wasn't on Sonic Team's mind here, because there is absolutely zero consequence for using the same overpowered move over and over again. There's also dodging and parrying involved in this system. Dodging works fine, but the parry is so broken that I have to wonder what Sonic Team were thinking. In any other game, parry Carrying is something that you have to time correctly, but in Sonic Frontiers, you can block for as long as you want, which trivializes many scenarios that would have otherwise been fun and challenging. The biggest shame of all though is that other than these two problems, the combat in Frontiers is actually solid. And I say it's a shame because these issues could have very easily been fixed, and I find it baffling that they weren't. If they simply reduced the parry window and added some incentive for varying your moves, this could have been a solid spectacle combat system that would have easily trumped the Werehog and unleashed. As it is though,
though it's just a decent distraction that gets repetitive after a while. And finally, we have the Psy Loop, the big new move in Frontiers. When you hold down Triangle, Sonic will leave a blue trail as he runs. If you make a circle around various objects in the world, they'll react in different ways. This is most often used for puzzles, but it can also be used to stun enemies. This move also has a seemingly minor function that majorly impacts the overall progression structure of the game, which means that we first need to talk about the open zones. Each of the open zones takes place on one of the five Starfall Islands. Scattered throughout these are puzzles, cyberspace stages, enemies, bosses, and some bite-sized platforming challenges. I alluded to this when talking about the A aesthetic, but these zones are so boring to traverse. Sonic doesn't have any 360 degree momentum to speak of, which means that the level geometry has to either be relatively flat or automated in one way or another. Most of your time spent here will be holding boost and whatever direction you need to go in, there's not much else involved. That is, unless you encounter an automated section, whether intentionally or not. There were a lot of times where I was just trying to get to the objective marker when the game suddenly forced me into a 2D platforming section. Yes, they tried to implement 2.5D platforming into an open world, and it's as jarring as it sounds. These open zones also have a map, which you need to fill by doing these so-called challenges. These suck. Pretty much all of them solve themselves, and only require doing some mindless action like side-looping stuff, running in place, abusing the pair, I mean jumping, etc. The best ones have you run from point A to point B, or skydiving through a bunch of hoops, but those are the exception and not the rule. Progression on these islands follows a pretty open-ended structure, as one would expect. Your main objectives are to collect the Chaos Emeralds to fight the Titan at the end, and to talk to Sonic's friends to progress the story. So, how does one accomplish this? For the Chaos Emeralds, Sonic Team came up with a pretty solid game loop, at least in theory. The Emeralds are stored in vaults scattered throughout the island, and to unlock them, you'll need a certain amount of vault keys. The primary method of obtaining these keys is to complete various objectives in the cyberspace stages, which you unlock by collecting portal gears. To get portal gears, you're expected to fight boss enemies that you'll find around the island. On paper, this is a pretty solid progression system, but unfortunately it's brought down by one tiny little problem. You don't have to do any of that. In what I can only assume was an attempt to give players more freedom, every island has a fishing spot where you can spend purple coins to go fishing with Big the Cat. Now hearing that might give you PTSD from Sonic Adventure, but they actually went the opposite direction this time around. Instead of being a frustrating crapshoot with clunky controls, the fishing in Frontiers is a complete joke. Seriously, this minigame practically plays itself. All you do is cast your line, wait for a bite, then time an A-press within an extremely generous window. Window. It is actually that easy, and as long as you have purple coins, you can do this as much as you want. But how do you get these purple coins? Well, you're supposed to look for them throughout the open zones, but why do that when you can do this slot machine that randomly appears throughout the game? This thing absolutely showers you with purple coins even when you're not trying, and as a result, it completely destroys the economy they were trying to set up with Big. And when you catch these fish, you'll earn tokens that you can use to buy literally any progression item. I am not joking. When I say as soon as you find one of these fishing spots, that island is as good as done. There is a limit on how many of these items you can buy, but it's so lenient that you can still unlock a grand majority of the emerald vaults with no effort whatsoever. The only reason I have footage of me actually playing the game as intended was because I purposefully avoided big for the majority of the game. For kicks, and because I needed footage, I played the fishing minigame for about half an hour on the last island, and I couldn't help but laugh a little when I exited the portal and saw that the sky I had turned into a laser light show from all the objective markers I had just activated. With the main progression trivialized then, how about the part where you need to talk to Sonic's friends? Well, since they're in an unstable state, you have to collect memory tokens scattered throughout the islands before you can talk to them. These are typically found at the end of many platforming sections, which in theory should help introduce some variety in how you explore the open zones. But remember how I said the Psy Loop had a function that majorly impacted the progression? Oh, hi Amy. What's that? You need six memory tokens? Okay. Now you might say that this is my fault. I don't have to use the side loop to collect memory tokens when I could go out and do platforming challenges instead. The problem with this logic is that compared to actively looking for memory tokens, running in circles is the easiest, fastest, and most efficient method of obtaining them. If the player finds a method to efficiently complete a task but that method isn't the fun way, is that the player's fault for optimizing their strategy or the developer's fault for designing the game poorly? Look, I get that they wanted to give the players free 
freedom, and making some things optional is the right way of doing that. But if you make everything optional, then nothing is going to feel necessary. Look at a game like, say, Super Mario 64 and how it handles its progression structure. There's 120 stars in that game, but you only need 70 of them to beat it. That gives the player a lot of wiggle room to skip missions they're struggling with or otherwise don't like, but it still requires them to experience a decent chunk of the content. Now imagine if Mario 64 also had a button you could press at any time to instantly give Mario a star on command. That's Sonic Frontiers with one notable exception. The fourth open zone, Rhea Island, seems to be pretty controversial among fans, but this was actually a big highlight of the game for me. You have to activate these towers, which requires you to do mandatory platforming, and I am not kidding when I say that this was the most fun I had throughout the entire game. Why? Because I felt like I was accomplishing something. What exactly are you doing on the other four islands? Yeah, you're talking to Sonic's friends, yeah, you're collecting Chaos Emeralds, but what happens during the literal hours of gameplay in between. Well, at best, you're partaking in some mildly decent, but completely optional, platforming and combat. But far more often, the game feels aimless, like you're just doing mindless busy work until the next objective marker pops up. Rhea Island spits in the face of this monotony. There's never any point during this section where you're aimlessly running about looking for collectibles or even filling up the map. You are simply required to get to the top of every tower in order to proceed, and it somehow manages to be more fun than all four of the other islands combined. It's almost like the core appeal of video games stems from their sense of accomplishment. Weird. But Rhea Island isn't home to the only mandatory content in Frontiers. Instead of towers though, this other mandatory content includes crappy laser puzzles, crappy pinball, crappy claw game, and my personal favorite, crappy Galaga. Let's move on to the cyberspace stages. These stages are such a strange specimen of Sonic level design, being home to both some of the worst and best design decisions that have ever been made in the series. Let's get the big thing out of the way first. By and large, these are Sonic Forces levels. They reuse environments from past games, most of them are pitifully short, and of course, there's automation galore. These levels don't just reuse aesthetics either, they also reuse entire level designs from Adventure 2, Unleashed, Generations, and probably more, but those are the ones that I noticed. It's pretty obvious too, since these levels were not designed with this movement engine in mind. Sonic's controls are also different in these stages, irrespective of however you may have customized them in the settings. The turning speed is even worse than in the open zones, both in the air and on the ground, and you lose access to all of your combat moves, including the side loop. What's weird about this is that despite the controls being different, they still retain a lot of quirks that only make sense in the open zones. The most obvious of these is the homing attack, which is very slow and heavy. This is fine in the game's main overworld combat, but when trying to quickly defeat enemies in a linear stage, it's just downright cumbersome. With all this said though, I do also want to touch on what I think these stages do well. First of all, while a majority of these level designs are either reused or just downright bad, later on in the game they actually start to feel like they're properly designed with the way Sonic controls in this game. Obviously Sonic handles like crap, so instead of focusing on tight turns or difficult jumping puzzles, these later levels play to the strengths of the movesets, such as the air boost and the lights speed dash, which are decent fun to take shortcuts with. I'm glad they expanded on the air boost especially, since that was one of the very few things about Sonic Forces that I actually liked. You'll recall that these cyberspace levels also reward the player with vault keys, and this is another aspect that I thought was handled pretty well. There's five per stage that you obtain by completing a set of objectives, beating the level, finishing with a certain amount of rings, collecting all the red star rings, getting an S rank, and an extra for completing all four of those. Aside from the fact that you can also obtain these keys by a playing an extremely easy fishing minigame or even just running in circles, this is a solid foundation for what could be an excellent open-ended progression system for Sonic games. In fact, I'm actually taking inspiration from this system for a game that I'm working on, link in the description. Unfortunately, these few positives amount to little when stacked up to all of the problems with these cyberspace stages, and that's a shame because there are some fleeting sparks of brilliance here, but they're outweighed by a lack of originality and a horrible game feel. Whew, that was a lot to take in, but at long last, it's time to loop back around to the three staples of Sonic Excellence. How well does Sonic and Frontiers accomplish these three requirements? For number one, this is pretty much a pass. I do think the Starfall Islands lack a general sonic e vibe, but the important elements such as rings, robotic enemies, etc. are still present, especially in the cyberspace levels. The second staple is where I have to give this game a little bit of flack though. When it comes to the cyberspace stages, while replaying them is encouraged, the skill ceiling just 
isn't very high, and the bloated nature of the open world means that this game will take you many hours to beat even if you know what you're doing, so it's not as easy to pick back up as other Sonic games. How about number 3 then? Is Sonic's ability to roll into a ball important to the gameplay? No. Look, I know the drop dash exists in this game, but 1. It sucks, and 2. Just because it exists doesn't mean that it's important. The fact that you have access to the boost at all times renders this move completely useless. The only time I found it helpful was to climb up certain surfaces that would normally make Sonic slip, but I'm 90% sure that was an oversight on the developer's part. Sonic Frontiers really drops the ball <laughs> Literally. when it comes to the three staples. The game is too bloated with mindless busy work to encourage replays, the cyberspace Space levels don't get good until late into the game, and despite the open world being a perfect opportunity to bring back Sonic's signature 360 degree momentum in a big way, there is no such thing here. However, there is one more thing we need to talk about, and that's the bosses. As I've said in past videos, classic Sonic bosses set themselves apart from other platformers with a simple design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can damage the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. There are two main types of boss fights in Frontiers, the open zone bosses and the Titan battles. So how well do these fit the classic Sonic boss philosophy? First let's talk about the open zone battles. These range wildly in quality. Many of them, like Ninja, Asura, and Tower, apply the classic philosophy well, being vulnerable pretty much at all times and simply requiring the player to work around their attack cycles. However, there's several of these that are downright bad, not just as Sonic bosses, but as bosses in general. I'm talking enemies like Squid, Shark, and Strider. Yeah, those guys. The ones that make you wait through an agonizingly long attack cycle before allowing you to get a few hits in. I hate them. But whether it's the good bosses or the bad ones, there are a couple design philosophies that remain consistent throughout, and like the battles themselves, there are good and bad ones. On the good side, Sonic's attack and defense stats can be upgraded throughout the game like an Unleashed, which means that you can return to battles earlier in the game and absolutely decimate them. This turns even the worst bosses into a decently fun way to obtain portal gears, though it does require some work on the player's part. On the bad side, these battles are repeated way too much. Not only will you find multiple copies of the exact same boss on the exact same island, but these guys will also respawn periodically. For most of them, this isn't a big deal since you can just avoid them, but some of them will force Sonic into an arena if he gets too close, which can sometimes lead to cheap deaths if you aren't prepared. So what about the Titans? The first Titan, Giganto, makes a heck of a good first impression. You're thrown into an arena with this massive behemoth as Super Sonic, and you can just go ham on this guy. The amazing spectacle combined with the incredible music makes this battle worthy of the series' best final bosses, let alone first ones. Unfortunately, it all goes downhill from here. While the music is still great and you still get to play as Super Sonic, the other three Titan battles fumble the landing in one way or another. Wyvern forces you onto an awkward spline with weird camera angles, Knight has this stupid part where you have to launch his Beyblade back at him, and Supreme ends before it even gets started. Not only that, but even the best of these Titans consistently share the same egregious problems. For one thing, Super Sonic's combo moves have a tendency to just not work most of the time, and for seemingly no reason. Not only that, the Titans themselves also seem to have a bit of trouble working sometimes. By far the most annoying part of these battles, though, is the quick time events. My gosh, can we please stop shoving these into Sonic games? Games. They don't add anything of value, they're just annoying. What really sucks about these is that if you even lightly breathe on any other button besides the one shown on screen, the game will instantly fail you. And since there's no checkpoints in these battles... Like many things in Frontiers, the Titans take a genuinely amazing idea and ruin it with a combination of poor design decisions and a general lack of polish, and that's even after all of the updates. This is post-update 3 footage, people. With all of that in mind, let's move on to the final boss. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. So it turns out that the mysterious sky voice from before is actually the end, an evil moon thing that destroyed the ancient inhabitants of the Starfall Islands who now want to destroy Sonic's world, or something like that. Eggman teams up with Sonic, playing it up a lot less than in Lost World thankfully, and Sage takes control of Supreme. This leads us to the final boss fight, which is... Crappy Galaga, Crappy Galaga. Crappy Galaga, 
is back. I know it's been said a million times at this point, but man, this final boss sucks. Not just for the fact that it's the lame hacking minigame from before, but also because it's really, really long, with sudden difficulty spikes that plow through your lives making you start over. Anyway, after that ordeal, Sonic does one last quick time event, and Sage sacrifices herself to defeat the end. Sonic comes back down to Earth, where his now rescued friends are waiting for him. Sonic makes a sarcastic comment about the quality of the game, and all of his friends talk about what they're going to do when they get home. I wonder if cream and sticks are free. Make a road trip out of it. Wait, is that what Amy meant by that vague statement early in the game? Her entire life-changing character arc is that she wants to visit Mount Rushmore? Whatever it is, Sonic and crew head back home, and Eggman looks sadly in the distance, reflecting over what happened to Sage. Credits. Sonic Frontiers is... wait, hold on. I feel like I'm missing something. Oh, yeah, that. After Sonic Frontier's initial release, Sega released three free updates over the course of 2023, some with substantial new content. Do any of these updates make meaningful improvements upon the base game? Well, that's what I hope to find out in this video. Before we begin, though, I need to make one quick disclaimer. I won't be covering every single edition these updates bring. I'll largely be focusing on content that is relevant to the core game experience, so optional modes like Cyberspace Challenge and Battle Rush won't be getting much analysis. Sorry. With that out of the way, let's get into it, starting with update 1. The Sights, Sounds, and Speed update released in March of 2023 doesn't add a whole lot of note, but there are a couple new features I'd like to touch on. Sonic Frontiers is one of the few modern open world games I know of that didn't come with a photo mode at launch. Update 1 seeks to rectify that, and it's… okay, I guess. You don't have a lot of freedom to control the camera, the selection of filters is pretty bare, and you can't change Sonic's pose, despite the rather deceptive marketing suggesting otherwise. You also can't take photos in-game, which is a bit annoying if you're playing without the Steam overlay. That said, if you're playing on console, you won't have this problem. Update 1 also introduces a music player, another addition that I'm surprised wasn't in the base game. They actually gamified this feature a bit by making you find the songs around the open zones, which is a nice incentive to fill up the map if you haven't already. I'm not entirely huge on the sound selection, though. Sonic has had a legacy of consistently putting out banger soundtracks, so I can't blame the devs too much for including some iconic tracks from past games. However, these take up a vast majority of the playlist, and and songs from the actual game itself are shockingly underrepresented. Moreover, you can't use the music player in cyberspace stages, which is a huge letdown. There was this amazing feature in Generations that allowed you to assign specific tracks to specific levels, and it's a shame that Frontiers doesn't have an equivalent. Finally, Update 1 also introduced challenge modes, and I really don't have anything to say about these. They're just a marathon time attack and a boss rush, nothing worth playing unless you're a completionist, which I personally am not. Overall, the note of features in Update 1 are welcome additions, but I think Super Mario Odyssey outshined these nearly six years prior, and that game had them at launch. Frontiers does get bonus points for making you have to search for the music tracks, but I would have preferred if they had made the song selection more comprehensive instead of focusing on fan service. Next up is the Sonic's Birthday Bash update, released in June of 2023. This added the option for tacky birthday-themed cosmetics, but more importantly introduced a heap of gameplay features that have much more impact than anything in the first update. First off, we have the Action Chain Challenges. These are scattered around the islands and are activated when you silent these signs. What are these challenges, you may ask? Basically, you just gotta do stuff. It doesn't really matter what it is, boosting, combat, collecting rings, as long as you're doing something and you're collecting enough glowing balls to increase your multiplier, you'll get points. The amount of points you get will determine your rank at the end. These are surprisingly fun at times, and provide incentive to actually interact with the platforming sections and combat encounters, something the base game failed to do. However, I do have one gripe. While there's a lot of these challenges on each island, they all populate the map with the exact same arrangement of glowing balls, so they start to feel mindless and samey after a while. I think it would have been better to have one or two of these per island in more spread out places, and maybe increase the time time limit and score requirement. But what do you get for completing these action chain challenges? Well, after S ranking every single one, you are rewarded with the spin dash. They did it guys! They added momentum to Sonic Frontiers! It's so amazing! Oh my gosh guys, I'm literally going to cry. Yeah, so this is clearly just a modified spin dash from Sonic Lost World, which makes sense given that Frontiers is still using its movement code. Or is it? 
I got a few comments on part 1 challenging my claim that this game reuses Sonic's player controller from Lost World of Forces. They pointed out the fact that Frontiers uses the Bullet Physics library, while previous games used Havoc. Because of this, supposedly Frontiers' movement code was remade from the ground up and shares no similarities with Forces whatsoever. Alright, that's a bit bold, but it was enough to make me question my own understanding of the matter and look deeper. Let's get one important thing out of the way first. Neither Havoc nor Bullet are game engines, they are physics libraries. Their websites don't ever use the word engine to describe their software, instead opting for words like middleware. Other games also use middleware like this, such as Half-Life 2 or Gary's Mod. Those games use Havoc to simulate physics for different objects, but those physics are operating alongside the game's actual engine, Source. Now, when a Sonic fan hears the word physics, their minds will likely, and understandably, jump to Sonic's momentum. As far as I know though, that's not what Havoc and Bullet are used for, nor should they be. Physics libraries like this are typically used for physics simulations, such as debris. If this middleware was used for Sonic's movement, he would probably control pretty unpredictably, which obviously isn't desirable for a platformer. In other words, this is Havoc, this is not Havoc, this is Bullet, this is not Bullet. However, that doesn't necessarily disprove the idea that the transition to Bullet necessitated a ground-up rewrite of Sonic's movement. After all, even if Sonic doesn't abide by physics himself, he can still interact with physics objects. The only way this would carry over between the two libraries is if the movement code was modified to play nicely with Bullet. If it wasn't, he'd probably just face through the objects or the game would crash. But to what extent did this actually affect the movement code? Did Sonic Team rebuild everything from the ground up? I realized quickly that there there was only one way to find out, and that was to directly compare Sonic Forces to Sonic Frontiers. I promise we'll get back to the spin dash, just bear with me here. Test number one! Alright, so here I am in Sonic Forces. Chaz is here too, but don't worry, he's just observing. I also have Sonic Frontiers open, with the movement parameters adjusted to be as close to Forces as I reasonably could. I tried to find as flat and open of an area as possible in each game, but Frontiers is surprisingly devoid of any perfectly flat surfaces, so I'm having to work around some bumps here. Anyway, one obvious thing that both games share is the animations. They're pretty much identical, and seem to be interpolated the same, though the jump is lacking squash and stretch in Frontiers. As far as the movement itself goes, there are also some similarities. The jump and double jump are more or less the exact same when it comes to speed and gravity, and the slide is virtually identical. However, there are some important differences here as well. As I mentioned in part 1, the handling is much tighter. In Forces, it's hard to even make a full circle without Sonic trying to do a 180 in the middle of it, while in Frontiers, you can do that no problem, even with the steering sensitivity reduced. This also affects the jump, something I didn't realize in part 1. In Forces, you can barely steer with the jump at all, while in Frontiers, you can. Kinda. That said, none of this so far is proof of a new movement engine. Tweaks like this are to be expected in a new game. After all, Colors did the exact same thing with Unleashed's movement code. So let's move on to test number two. This time we're in a 2D section because I want to see how each game handles their momentum in a vacuum. Here I have a similar curve in both games, and they're both in Green Hill too, which has nothing to do with the test, but I thought it was funny. Anyway, as you can see, when running at full speed, both Sonics handle this ramp pretty similarly. Now, let's Let's see what happens when they approach it at a low speed. Oh, they're completely different. Okay, so this definitely casts some doubt on the whole same engine theory. However, I have one more test up my sleeve. Test number three. <laughs> All right, now we're on some rails. As you can see, the rail switching is pretty identical, but what I really want to test is what happens when you jump off. Frontiers is pretty well known for its rail launch trick, and I was curious to find out if this shared any of its DNA with forces. And it does. At least it really seems to. Obviously, the boost was changed a bit between games, so you can't maintain one when jumping off a rail in Forces, but both games appeared to function identically otherwise, even down to the turning speed in the air. Now, obviously these tests aren't exhaustive. I don't have access to source code or test rooms or anything like that. And of course, these games do have some differences. However, my point isn't to say that absolutely zero code was changed. Frontiers released five years later. Of course there's going to be changes. However, I got several comments telling me that I was crazy to even suggest the mere possibility of any similarity between the two games. No ill will towards those people, of course, they're just defending a game they like, but if you still insist that's the case after watching this, then I really don't know what to tell you. The footage speaks for itself. But here's the thing. Even if we get access to the source code someday, and it turns out that the games really do have completely different code under the hood, that won't change the fact that both games share the same fundamental problem. 
they don't have proper sonic physics. And that brings us back to the spin dash. The spin dash is pretty much what the boost should have been. It damages enemies and you get more airtime with it when going off ramps. Again, it's similar to Lost World's spin dash, but it's much faster and gives you a lot more control. It completely lacks the momentum that I keep hearing people claim it has though. It does build up speed over time, but it's completely agnostic to the slope of the ground, accelerating at a constant rate. Compared to the spin dash in the adventure games, and it's not hard to see the difference. But man is this thing fun to abuse. In the cyberspace stages especially, you can get some serious air and completely blow past the majority of the level. Is it a broken mechanic? Yes. But does that really matter when the rest of the game is already broken? The spin dash makes traversal in Frontiers decently fun compared to the base game, and considering this is part of a free update, I can't in my right mind call it a bad addition. However, this is not what I want to see in future 3D Sonic games. For a post-launch free update, this is a fine addition to Frontiers in particular, but if future 3D Sonic games are going to have a Spin Dash 2, I'd like to see it more closely follow the mechanical identity that the game's pre-heroes had. More on that later. For now, let's move on to Update 3. The Final Horizon update, released in September of 2023, introduces a brand new alternate story to the Final Island that you can access through this out-of-place giant ring. Sage explains to Sonic that he can channel his cyber corruption into a new power if he completes a bunch of trials, so that's what he does. Meanwhile, Sonic's friends all search the island for the Chaos Emeralds. So yeah, for the first time since 06, Tails, Amy, and Knuckles are finally playable again. Before I criticize anything about this update, I want to make it clear how happy I am that these guys are finally getting some time in the spotlight in a 3D game, and I can only hope that this will continue into future entries. These characters play fairly similar to Sonic when it comes to their base moveset, even being able to boost, which I was kinda surprised by. It does make sense though, these islands are pretty big, so it would probably be a chore to have to traverse them without it. All of these characters have a strange input delay on their moves though, and I'm not sure why. Sonic didn't have this problem, but all three of his friends will refuse to perform certain actions such as homing attacks until you release the button, which feels really bad. Tails and Knuckles also retain Sonic's double jump, and again, I'm not sure why, it just adds an annoying extra step before they start flying or gliding, which itself also has an irritating delay. They fix this with Knuckles in a patch, but not with Tails for some reason. That said, you can upgrade Tails' skill tree with his mech from Adventure 2, and this renders his base flight completely obsolete in the best way possible. So what are you actually doing as these characters? Well, this is unfortunately where my major criticisms start coming in. For the majority of this campaign, all you really do as Sonic's friends is travel from waypoint to waypoint. You can still do challenges to fill up the map, but while these were a complete joke in the base game, in the Final Horizon, these have graduated to stupidly hard. Talk about overcorrection. It's not like you really need to fill up the map anyway though. In fact, as soon as I realized how stupid these were, I didn't even bother, and I finished the campaign just fine. Again, all you have to do is travel between objective markers on a map you probably already know pretty well, and it's really dull and monotonous. What about Sonic's portions then? Thankfully these fare a bit better. The Final Horizon has Sonic climbing mandatory towers once again, and as one of the five people who actually liked Rhea Island, I appreciated them expanding on the concept. This is where you start to get a taste of level design that takes advantage of the spin dash, and it's decent fun. How you unlock these towers is unfortunately just as bad as the parts with Sonic's friends. Yep, you can't just go to each tower like before, you first have to unlock them by collecting these special Coco. Where do you get these Coco? Well, I think the game wants you to play the new cyberspace stages. Now, the few of these I've played are actually incredibly well designed for the most part, so credit where it's due. Like the towers, these take advantage of the spin dash, but they also introduce their own special gimmicks, which helps bring some variety into these otherwise stagnant level themes. However, I quickly realized there was zero point in bothering with these stages. First of all, you don't get any Coco for beating them or even S-ranking them. Instead, all of the missions revolve around collecting things. Oh no. Immediately I was getting flashbacks to Team Chaotix and Sonic Heroes. Why would they do this? The vault key system in the base game was perfect, save for the fishing minigame rendering it pointless. And that's the other big problem with this system. Despite the fishing minigame being a major economy breaking mechanic in the base game, Sonic Team decided to double down on this idea in Update 3. Except this time, you don't even have to fish. These Coco can literally be found by just silooping random signs on the overworld. Yeah, I'm not kidding. So why bother 
bother with the cyberspace stages at all if 1. the missions aren't fun, and 2. it's more time efficient anyway to just run around the overworld and find these signs. Come on, Sonic Team! Ugh, anyway, once you unlock a tower and scale it, you're met with a trial that Sonic has to complete to get one step closer to unlocking his cyber powers. These are kind of boring. They just pit you against a bunch of damage sponges while limiting your moveset in one way or another, so these end up being repetitive snore fests at best and frustrating death loops at worst. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. The final trial is a boss rush against the first three titans, and that's all there is to it. Apparently, before the latest patch, this trial put you at base stats and required you to do frame-perfect parries, which certainly sounds more interesting, but I can't imagine it was anything but frustrating. So, unoriginal or unfair, pick your poison. After that, it's time for Sonic to face Supreme, and it's once again the exact same boss as before. But after that, the end shows up and takes control of Supreme. Supreme, leading us to the final boss, which is thankfully not crappy Galaga this time. Wait. However, this might arguably be a worse final boss than before, not in terms of spectacle, but rather in terms of design. Remember that one Zavik fight in Sonic Lost World? Well, this is that on steroids. This boss does not give you any direction on what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to dodge, which for some reason locks onto the tube thing, then beat up the tube thing, then beat up the guy, then you have to loop a completely different part of the guy. Never in any other part of the game have I ever had to dodge in order to switch to a target that's direct directly in front of me, and how was I even supposed to tell that the tube was my target in the first place? But here's what really adds insult to injury. After I was getting nowhere in this boss for an obscenely long amount of time, I decided to look up a tutorial. However, since I did this so late in the fight, I ended up losing all my rings and dying. Okay, whatever, I at least know what to do now, so this shouldn't take- wait, what? It tells you what to do after you die? Okay, let me tell you why this is so stupid. Giving the player hints after they die in a normal boss fight with a normal health system makes perfect sense, but Super Sonic doesn't take damage. He loses health over time, and if you're at max rings, which you probably are at this point, it takes forever to die. So why didn't they have these hints show up after the player was struggling for a certain amount of time during the boss? Why do you have to wait for Sonic to completely run out of rings before the game tells you what you're supposed to be doing? But whatever, I've finally gone past this phase, and now Sonic is transforming into Cyber Sonic. Yo, this is sick, a new super form, and it looks really cool. I can't wait to play as him. This is going to be so awesome. So, okay, wait. Huh? No. Wait. You can't play as Cybersonic. Not even a f***ing quick time event. The ending is pretty much the same as the base game, but Sage is still alive and gets to watch the stars fall with Eggman, which is a nice touch. Otherwise, it's identical. Sonic and friends are still pretty unfazed by everything that just transpired, and Amy still wants to go to Mount Rushmore. Credits. Sonic Frontiers is not the worst Sonic game ever. It's better than 06, and it's certainly better than Forces, but I also feel like it's a prime example of how much Sonic's core identity has degraded over time. This game was hyped up as a return to form, and at launch, that hype managed to take me over. But as my thoughts settled in, and especially after this recent playthrough, I've begun to realize that this game retains absolutely nothing I enjoyed about the series in the first place. The colorful and creative environments? Gone. The replayability? Gone. The physics and momentum that shaped Sonic's best games? For the third time in a row, they're still absent. The general consensus on Sonic Frontiers seems to be that it's a good game, and even I'll admit it's not all bad. The story is better than it has been for a while, the music is pleasant if a bit forgettable, and there are some small hints of a rock-solid open-ended progression system buried somewhere in here, but while I obviously can't speak for everybody, I can't help but wonder how much of that consensus was shaped by confirmation bias on the fanbase's part. How many people went in skeptically and came out sincerely believing the game is great, and how many people simply convince themselves the game is great because it has to be great and we can't have another forces. For the first time in ages, people like Sonic again, and that is good. But at what cost? Frontiers abandoned so much of what was appealing about the series in the first place while doubling down on design decisions that have been loathed by the fanbase for years now. The boost, the automated levels, the lack of original environments, now all forgiven because why? Because it's open world now? 
Does that suddenly fix everything? I don't want to suggest that anyone is wrong for liking Sonic Frontiers, and I hope none of this comes across that way. If you genuinely enjoyed this game, that is awesome. I am happy that there are people out there who can find enjoyment out of something I cannot. And again, there is fun to be had with this game, especially after the updates. But personally, this is not what I want from 3D Sonic going forward. So what do I want? First and foremost, Sonic's movement code needs a complete overhaul. If any previous game should be used as reference, it's Sonic Adventure. While that game hasn't aged well in terms of polish, it translates classic Sonic's fundamentals brilliantly into 3D and should be the basis of future games. If a small team could do it in the 1990s, a large team can do it in the 2020s. If it takes time, that's fine, but spend that time on perfecting Sonic's movement and everything else will fall into place. Second, focus on quality over quantity. Freedom is not a replacement for substantial content. Keep the open-ended progression structure, but throw out all the alternate methods of obtaining collectibles and focus all in on action stages and bosses. Make sure the levels take advantage of the fully fleshed out Sonic physics, allowing the player to run on walls and ceilings like any blue hedgehog should. Third, keep Sonic's friends playable, but give them more variety like in the adventure games. Don't stray from the core platforming concept, but make the characters feel distinct from Sonic in meaningful ways. Spyro Year of the Dragon serves as a great example of how to do this right. Also, maybe add a new playable character or two. Trip was a nice surprise in Sonic Superstars, and more original characters would really spice things up. Fourth, keep making ambitious stories, but keep the tone balanced. The adventure games, as well as Unleashed, were excellent at balancing high stakes with cartoon hijinks and endearing dialogue, so use those as reference. Also, both renditions of Frontier's ending ended up feeling pretty underwhelming, so for the next game, come up with an awesome ending first, then build the rest of the story around that. And finally, get more creative with the environments. Not even the most ravenous Frontiers defenders can get behind this obsessive reuse of Green Hill and chemical plants, so come up with more outlandish and surreal locations. Sonic Dream Team seems to be doing this well, so take a page from that game's book. Now, will Sonic Team ever hear any of this? Probably not. But on the off chance that they do, this should be their one takeaway. Don't let the Sonic series be afraid of itself. Running from the past is a losing game. It never brings you glory. It's time to face your fear. It's